Chapter 18 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 18 It was the most natural thing in the world that the daily view of the snow-covered mountains, Popocatepetl and Eastex Seawattle, roused in the youths a desire to ascend to the top of the former. Dr. Bronson was not ambitious to undertake the expedition, but he encouraged the youths in their desire and arranged to accompany them as far as the foot of the cone where the saddle-horses are left frank was appointed the historian of the affair and performed his work in a manner that secured the hearty commendation of the doctor our readers may judge for themselves of the young man's literary abilities we have not changed a line or a word of his account which was as follows popocatepetl means the mountain that smokes and Eastac Seawattle is La Mujer Blanca, or the White Woman. The name of the great volcano is generally shortened to Popo or Old Popo, and for the sake of saving time and space, I shall follow the fashion occasionally and not give the name in full. The name of the White Woman comes from the resemblance of the top of the ridge to the body of a woman lying upon a bier and covered with a shroud the face is quite perfect but the rest of the figure requires considerable aid from the imagination old popo is not altogether a smoking mountain as there are times when no smoke comes from it though it constantly throws out fumes of sulphur. In one sense it may be called an active volcano, while in another it should not be so designated. According to the historians, it was quite lively during the first years of the conquest, but for a very long time it has been peaceful enough and only at rare intervals shows any signs of a return to business activity. Geographically, it is 45 miles from the city of Mexico in a south-southeasterly direction. It is in latitude 19 degrees north and longitude 98 degrees 30 minutes west, and according to the measurements of Humboldt and others, it is 17,540 feet high. The latest Mexican atlas makes it 17,884 feet. General Ochoa, the owner of the crater, says it is 19,673 feet, and still another measurement gives the height of the summit at 21,373 feet you may take your choice of these figures. Popocatepetl was first ascended in 1522 by Francisco Montano, who was lowered 450 feet into one of the craters by means of ropes. He did not succeed in reaching the summit, nor did several other explorers who made the attempt during the time of Cortez. It used to be a much more tedious journey to the summit of Popo, as it was necessary to go on horseback about 60 miles from the city of Mexico, and the expedition required a large outlay for horses, guides, and escort, and consumed from 10 to 15 days. Now the railway is a great help in the matter, and we utilized it to the utmost. Before the railway was opened, the journey to Amecameca was made by diligence. Two American gentlemen, Colonel Watson and Mr. Arms, both of New York, were stopping at the hotel with us, and on learning that we wished to visit Popocatepetl, 
they invited us to join them. Of course we accepted at once, and Colonel Watson offered to make all the arrangements about horses and guides. His first step was to obtain a letter of introduction from General Ochoa, who owns the crater of the volcano and carries on an extensive business of mining for sulfur. The letter was addressed to his agent and major domo at a Mecca Mecca, Don Domingo Zela, and asked him to facilitate the movements of the party in any way in his power and allow us to sleep in his rancho at Plamacus. Colonel Watson went to a Mecca Mecca one morning accompanied by Fred, who was to act as interpreter as the colonel was a little rusty in his spanish dr bronson mr arms and i followed the next day and the colonel had everything ready for us on our arrival we went by the morelos railway starting from the station of san lazaro at seven thirty in the morning and reaching a mecca mecca in about two hours the distance is 58 kilometers or 36 miles the town is of goodly size and has a prosperous appearance it was once the resort of robbers who occasionally dashed out upon the roads in the direction of the city and after plundering everybody who came in their way they retired as speedily as they came the people of the town screened them whenever they were pursued by the military and some very vigorous action was necessary before the business was broken up most of the three thousand inhabitants are indians and since the advent of the railway and the consequent increase in the number of visitors they show a laudable ambition to make the most that they can out of the strangers who come within their reach through the aid of don domingo zela colonel watson had secured a sufficient number of horses and mules to give everybody a good mount and also for the transportation of the baggage he had engaged some volcaneros or mountaineers men whose ordinary occupation is the transportation of sulphur from the mines in the crater they know every inch of the way and are accustomed to all the peculiarities of the mountain nobody should attempt to ascend popocatepetl without a sufficient number of volcaneros one to each traveller is none too many then there were several peons or general servants and there were arrieros to look after the animals and see that none of them were lost altogether we made quite a cavalcade and must have presented an imposing appearance to the crowd that assembled to see us off it did not take long to pack our baggage on the mules we did not have a large quantity and moreover it was in bags or bundles suitable for the pack saddle it included heavy blankets for keeping us warm at Plamacus, where we were to spend two nights close to the snow line heavy overcoats canned meats and other provisions and our travelling bags containing the little odds and ends that one wishes for his own use we were told that we could get most of the things we needed at a mecca mecca but it might happen that the usual supply shop would be out just then and we had better make sure by procuring in the city the things that we wanted then we had goggles to protect our eyes from the glare of the sun on the snow thick mittens and mufflers to keep out the cold from hands and faces and heavy woolen stockings to put over our boots to prevent slipping on the ice the boots that we wore were not our ordinary ones but heavy affairs specially made for the purpose and having sharp nails in the soles to give us a good grip on the ice 
we did not put them on until reaching the snow line and when we came back we gave them to the volcaneros as souvenirs of our visit if the fellows were sharp they probably sold the boots at a good price to the first party of tourists who happened along without this sort of an equipment there was some difficulty in getting away as colonel watson's horse insisted upon having a private dance just to show off his ability and as the dance took place in the midst of the other horses it made a disturbance until we could get out of the way the example became contagious and very soon some of the other horses joined in the dance but we managed to quiet them all down without accident we had been warned in the city that robbers occasionally interfered with visitors between Amecameca and Flamacus, and if we could procure an escort it would be a wise precaution and possibly save us from plunder or a fight colonel watson brought a letter to the commander of the rurales or rural guards at Amecameca and that gentleman kindly gave us an escort of four men to accompany us to Tlamacus and back waiting there while we were making the ascent of the mountain quite possibly these fellows had been brigands and may have carried on business in this very place but this was no affair of ours they served us faithfully and we were not interfered with in any way that robberies have been committed and murder too was evident from the great number of crosses along the road there is said to have been a time when a man known to have five dollars or even one dollar in his pocket was not safe along this route there were men who were ready to commit murder for a trifling amount anybody who wanted to be rid of the presence of another had only to mention it to one of this gentry and accompany the mention with a suggestion that it would be worth five or ten dollars to have the obnoxious individual disappear in a day or two he would be found dead by the wayside a slight stir would be made by the police but if no reward was offered for the murderer the affair was soon forgotten at any rate that is what the chief volcanero who acted as our guide told us when we asked him about the crosses but before we go out of a mecca or a mecca as it is often called let me say that it is a very pretty place and reminded us of interlaken or meiringen in switzerland it is eight thousand feet above the level of the sea lies in a sort of valley and has an abundant supply of water which rolls down from the mountain and sparkles in numerous rivulets that flow through every street the water serves to keep the streets clean and the clean streets seem to have impelled the inhabitants to keep their houses in presentable condition the walls are white or in bright colors and altogether a mecca mecca is one of the most attractive little towns we have seen since we crossed the rio grande there was a crowd of people in the plaza mayor and in the marketplace and the people seemed to move around more actively than in the capital perhaps it was the greater purity of the air though one might think that its increased rarity would have an enervating effect anyhow it was cooler at a mecca than in the city and that may have been the cause of it many persons predict that this little town at the foot of the great mountain will be a fashionable resort at no distant day as it certainly has many attractive features we had a ride of fifteen miles to the rancho of Tlamacus, where we were to spend the night the pack-mules went off in advance 
while we sat down to a good breakfast which the colonel had ordered in the hotel ferro Carie. then we mounted our horses and after the dance i have mentioned we got away our road led among fields of barley the lines between them being shown by hedges of magae or other members of the cactus family and now and then by rows of poplar and willow trees the way ascended with more or less steadiness and after a time we passed from the cultivated ground into forests of pine and other mountain trees some parts of the lower hills were devoted to pastures and the cattle in them were in good condition they are nourished upon a rich bunch grass that grows here and scattered about here and there we saw a good many thistles together with beds of mountain flowers we passed a few haciendas the last being that of tomacoco where there is a church very much in ruins the pine forest begins after we leave the plain and as we go up among the hills the pines are reduced in size as they always are on the sides of high mountains our horses have hard work to scramble up the steep path but they are evidently accustomed to it and toil on bravely the guide warns us to be very careful in case we dismount as the horses have a trick of snatching their bridles out of one's hands and starting down the mountain at the best speed they can make fred's horse tried this and succeeded but he didn't go far as he was caught by one of the soldiers who happened to be in the rear where the path was narrow do not suppose that the trees were small some of them were two feet and more in diameter and seventy or eighty feet high and the air was full of the sweet resinous odor for which a pine forest is famous and that is so welcome to most nostrils for one i do not know a more charming perfume than that of a forest of pines and fred agrees with me in this it was difficult to realize that we were in mexico had i been brought here blindfolded and then asked to guess where we were i should have named new england wisconsin or california long before thinking of the land of the aztecs we passed several sawmills of the most primitive character they were operated by two men one standing above the log and the other below it and alternately pushing and pulling the saw the cutting was done by the downward stroke of the saw as in the ordinary sawmills of the eastern states higher and higher seemed the great mountain as we slowly zigzagged in his direction sometimes he was hidden from our view by the trees or the shape of the hills and again he came suddenly before us and seemed to signal us to persevere up and up we went and when we reached lamachus we were thirteen thousand feet above the sea or more than four thousand feet above the town whence we set out in the forenoon our guide told us that there is a tradition among the indians that old popo and the white woman were once living beings they were a giant and giantess and for some disobedience of the gods they were changed into mountains the giantess was struck dead and that is why she lies stretched out on her bier and covered with a white robe old popo was the giant and he was merely rooted to the spot where he stood he shows his grief by occasionally shedding tears of lava which rolls down in great floods and in the sobbing and sighing that form a part of his weeping he breathes huge volumes of smoke 
sometimes his grief is so great that he shakes in agony and then the whole earth is moved evidently he doesn't feel as badly now as he used to as he has behaved very well for three centuries and more it was lucky we brought a supply of bedding and provisions for there was absolutely nothing at Clamacus except some huts of rough boards and stone the rancho stands in a valley and we descended quite a little distance before reaching it this descent seemed to us a waste of labor as we would be obliged to make up for it by another ascent several times during the day we met donkeys and mules laden with ice and sulphur the two commodities which are produced by the great mountain ice is cut from the places where it accumulates the city of mexico has long been supplied from here just as the cities at the base of mount etna are supplied from that famous volcano it is packed upon mules or donkeys and carried to the railway or to the canal at chalco whence it is brought to its destination the sulphur is taken from the crater as we shall presently see brought as far as the snow line on the backs of men or slid down the steep side of the mountain and from there it goes to the railway on the backs of beasts of burden ice machines in the city have somewhat interfered with the business of the indians who bring ice from the mountain and may possibly break it up altogether the ice is like that from glaciers all the world over and resembles snow more than it does the product of the new england lakes and rivers in the winter season it is sold in the city as nieve snow and the boys who peddle ice cream in the capital call out nieve tome nieve as they go about with their wares we managed to sleep fairly well in the huts at Lamacus, and were tired enough to go to rest very early from our supply of canned provisions we made up an excellent supper and there was a material addition to it in the shape of some fresh chickens which one of our muleteers had brought along just as a speculation he argued to himself that we would be glad to buy chickens in addition to the stock of food we had on hand and so we were we gladly paid him double what the chickens would have cost at a mecca mecca mr arm suggested that possibly the chickens had cost the man nothing as they were probably taken from a chicken house during the night while the legitimate owner was slumbering the thermometer went down to forty two degrees during the night and when we started in the morning it was forty seven degrees the volcanero was to call us at five o'clock and for fear he would not be around at that hour colonel watson set an alarm clock which he had stowed away in his handbag the clock fired itself off at five and waked everybody the volcanero included we shivered in the sharp air of the morning while taking coffee and biscuits for an early breakfast and were mounted and off before six o'clock between us and the volcano there was a strip of pines and then a stretch of black volcanic sand up to the snow line it was a hard struggle for our poor horses and fred and i wished to dismount and spare them the exertion but the guide warned us to save all our strength for the climb that we would be compelled to make on foot so we stuck to our saddles in spite of our sympathy for the suffering brutes we had a magnificent view as we ascended and dr bronson who went no farther than the snow line 
said he was amply paid for his fatigue even though he was obliged to forego the view from the top we looked down into the valley of puebla we studied the landscape as though it were an outspread map and we watched the sunlight playing on the hills and on the great cone that dazzled before us many times fred and i were reminded of our ascent of fusiyama but we found the scene far more grand and extensive the summit of fusiyama is nearly four thousand feet lower than that of old popo and it can be readily understood that the monarch of mexico far surpasses that of japan in grandeur fusiyama too does not exhibit any valleys like those of mexico and puebla deep set in the encircling mountains and gemmed with lakes that flash in the clear sunlight and furthermore it has no towering peak like that of orizaba to pierce the horizon and no masses of mountains at nearly all the points of compass to suggest that the earth was once a raging sea that had suddenly become petrified we reached the side of a deep barranca and descended to where a stream dashed along a rocky bed then we slowly climbed the other side of the barranca and a little way above it we came to the limit of the trees they did not dwindle to tiny dwarfs a foot or so in height as we often find them on mountains but stopped all at once while yet of respectable size though much smaller than when we first entered the pine forest beyond the barranca we entered the worst of the volcanic sand and our horses stopped repeatedly to take breath as they waded through it in about two hours after leaving Clamacus, we came to a rocky ridge on which was a cross this is la cruz said our guide and here you must leave your horses they can go no farther we dismounted according to humboldt's figures we were fifteen thousand feet above the level of the sea and twenty five hundred below the summit of the volcano we were one thousand feet higher than the summit of fusiyama nearly as high as that of mont blanc and nine thousand feet above that of mount washington and yet we still had almost half a mile of perpendicular height to make before reaching our destination there was a wide strip of sand between us and the snow line and through this we walked painfully slipping and sliding backward almost as fast as we went on our progress was very slow and the effort required was great fred and i were glad that dr bronson did not try it as he would have been sure to break down long before the snow line was reached mr arms is spare and tall and a fine walker and colonel watson is a small man full of youthful vigor it was fortunate that they were and it was also fortunate that fred and i had had experience in hill climbing and then too we were younger than either of the others when we reached the edge of the snow we sat down and rested some of the peons had fallen behind and we prided ourselves that we had shown the mexicans that americans know how to climb high mountains without turning back for want of breath we ate some of the solid food and drank some of the cold tea we had bottled expressly for the occasion before leaving Clamacus. when we had thoroughly rested and refreshed ourselves we put on our spiked shoes covered them with the woolen stockings and armed with alpenstocks and aided each by a volcanero 
we attacked the great icy cone of the giant Popocatepetl. The Vulcaneros carried our overcoats and had them ready to wrap around us whenever we stopped. Fortunately for us, the snow was in the best condition for ascending. It was like a very hard drift, softened by the sun just enough to give a good foothold, but not sufficiently to let our feet sink more than an inch or so below the surface. Our principal guide went ahead, and we followed in his tracks. Every few minutes we paused to rest and breathe, and long before we reached the crater, the lightness of the air was such that our halts were longer than our periods of ascent. The blood rose to our faces, our veins throbbed, and for a time our heads seemed on the verge of bursting. We appreciated the advice of a gentleman in the capital that no one with the least tendency to heart trouble or one with weak lungs or a tendency to corpulence should undertake the ascent of the volcano and if we were to add anything to the advice it would be that everybody else should refrain from making the attempt it is the hardest venture we ever made in mountain climbing and we certainly would not again undertake it or urge a friend to do so. We left to one side the Pico del Fraile, a pinnacle of porphyry that shoots up into the air like the spire of a church. There was a deep chasm like an enormous moat at the side of the Pico, and we asked our guide if anybody had ever passed the chasm and climbed to the dizzy top. His face wore a smile of incredulity as he pronounced the feat impossible, and furthermore said there was nothing there to pay for the effort. Colonel Watson asked him, in sheer bravado, if he would undertake to escort us there, but he shook his head without making any audible reply it is quite possible that he suspected the colonel of chaffing. Suddenly we were enveloped in a cloud so dense that we could see only a few yards in any direction. The guide ordered us to keep close together, and if by any accident we should become separated, we were to call out immediately and also keep our faces and feet directed to the ascent of the mountain. We obeyed his instructions, but it was our good fortune that the cloud did not long remain to trouble us. It disappeared as suddenly as it had come, and we had a fine view of the valley of Puebla and of the great mountain, the White Woman. As we rose to and above its level, it lost all resemblance to the recumbent figure that gives its name, and became nothing but a broken mass of rocks and snowdrifts. End of chapter 18chapter 19 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 19 The snow hardened a good deal as we neared the summit, continued Frank, in fact, it was much more like ice than snow, and the walking became more difficult every minute. In some places it was as smooth as glass, and, but for our outside stockings and the spikes in our shoes, we would have been constantly slipping. Even as it was, we had a good many falls, but nobody was seriously hurt by them. 
there was no danger of a long slide down the mountain as the guide took us along a route where there were many hummocks or pillars of ice so that we brought up against them whenever we had the misfortune to fall down our woolen mittens were a great protection to our hands which often came in contact with these pillars and would have been cut by them as their tops and edges were sharp we are told that persons who have made the ascent without gloves or mittens have had their hands so badly lacerated that they could not be used for days afterwards we had no serious accidents which is not always the case with parties making the ascent of old popo sometimes the snow slides down in the form of avalanches and occasionally the sand does the same thing to be caught by one of these avalanches is almost certain death but happily the guides know the mountain and its peculiarities so well that such accidents are rare parties have been overwhelmed by storms of hail in the same way that a party on mont blanc lost their lives several years ago considerable areas of sand and snow are sometimes set in motion by the tread of one's feet upon them and the unfortunate climber who has caused it is carried down and dashed to death on the rocks below one story that we heard was of three indians who were descending the volcano one of them saw a depression in the snow like a furrow and thought it offered an easy footing he went to it and suddenly disappeared from the sight of his companions as they moved towards the place to ascertain what had happened they felt the crust sinking beneath them and had barely time to scramble back before a considerable area disappeared in a crevasse no trace of the missing indian was ever found it seemed as though our toil would never end when suddenly fred who was in advance gave a shout and sat down he swung his hat in the air and i wondered what he meant by it here we are shouted fred we're at the crater i hurried up as fast as i could and sure enough there it was a great chasm a thousand or more feet deep and fully half a mile across the sides narrow somewhat so that a little way down you can make out pretty nearly all of the outline the bottom of the crater can be called flat in a general way though it is the farthest possible from the ideal of a ballroom floor steam and the vapors of sulphur rise from sulphaterras scattered over the bottom and from these sulphaterras the sulphur is constantly forming the supply is inexhaustible as the formation goes on a great deal faster than the miners can remove the product we scrambled down perhaps two hundred feet to where the edge of the crater hung over like a precipice here there is a malacate or apparatus for hoisting out the sulphur the men working in the sulphur mines descend and ascend by this apparatus in fact there is no other way of getting in or out of the crater our guide told us that the men run great risks as stones are constantly falling from the sides of the crater whence they are dislodged by the frost and by the action of the steam and sulphur jets rumblings like the premonitions of an earthquake are frequently heard and sometimes the ground trembles so much as to make one's footing unsteady in addition to this is the effect of the sulphur which rots the clothes of the men and causes their teeth to fall out they sleep in caves in the sides of the crater 
and on two or three occasions a cave full of men has been overwhelmed and killed by the stony avalanche altogether the place did not appear attractive as a residence and i was not surprised to learn that the men receive high wages and even at the rate of pay they are not easily obtained they remain a month at a time in the crater without leaving it and are then replaced by new men and allowed a vacation among their friends in the country at the base of the mountain we could have been lowered down by the malacate but concluded not to make the attempt we could not do so without spending the night in the crater and this we were not prepared for dr bronson would be waiting for us and would fear some accident had happened though as for that matter we could have sent one of the peons to tell him and furthermore we thought we should run more risk than we would be compensated for by the experience a party of three gentlemen went down there a few weeks before we did and one of them became exhausted and his life was saved with great difficulty our guide said whether truthfully or not we don't know that a german gentleman died there a few years ago and since then the miners do not desire visitors among them the crater is not at the top of the mountain the highest point of popocatepetl being to the west of this great chasm and about one thousand feet more elevated it is a sharp cone and so difficult of ascent that few have succeeded in reaching the summit there is some dispute as to whether it has actually been ascended as the government offers a reward of five hundred dollars to any one who proves that he has been to its top some american gentlemen in the capital city say it has been done but the difficulty of officially proving the accomplishment of the feat would be more than the value of the reward hence it is not claimed at all and consequently the negative testimony favors the assumption that no one has yet scaled the height of popocatepetl we remained nearly two hours on the summit shivering in the cold air in spite of our thick overcoats while at the same time the heat of the sun scorched our faces while we were there a borasca or storm came on and the air was suddenly darkened we sought shelter beneath a projecting rock and watched the cloud of snow as it eddied and whirled around the crater at such times it becomes so dark in the crater that the men cannot work they retire to their caves and wait till the storm is over at the same time the fires of the solfateras become very distinct and recall the description of dante's inferno the storm lasted about twenty minutes and then cleared away the sun coming out as brightly as ever and the air growing comparatively still these storms are rarely of long duration but they are to be dreaded whenever they come the temperature falls far below the freezing point and the wind blows a gale but down in the crater it is warm enough in consequence of the steam and heat from the solfateras the snow melts as soon as it strikes the bottom and renders walking a matter of difficulty the story of our descent of the mountain is quickly told the workmen had dug a straight trench in the volcanic sand and it is down this trench that they send the sulphur by the simple force of gravity it is placed in sacks the sacks are piled on a petate or mat of bulrush and when once started 
the mat and its cargo slide down with great velocity for two reals each of us hired a petate of one of the men at the hoisting works and with our vulcan arrows to guide the impromptu toboggans we went down with great rapidity and ease and without accident it reminded us of the descent of vesuvius the sand is much like that of the famous volcano of naples and we were very glad to be able to make use of it i said we came without accident for the sake of exactness i must add that colonel watson was pitched out of his vehicle at the end of his ride and stopped with his head and shoulders buried in the sand fred had a similar experience with the difference that he went in feet foremost as neither suffered any injury and was ready to laugh over the mishap my original statement holds good the doctor had gone back to the sulphur rancho at climacus and thither we followed him as soon as we found our horses it was too late to get to a mecca mecca that evening and so we had another night among the sulphur refiners the sulphur is brought here just as it is dug from the crater of the volcano it is refined at Lamacus and made ready for market and is sent thence to a mecca mecca on the backs of donkeys or mules general ochoa says that in spite of its abundance he cannot compete at the coast towns with the sulphur from mediterranean ports and his only market is in the interior of mexico he intends to place some improved machinery at the edge of the crater so as to reduce the expense of hoisting out the crude material and in this way he hopes to lower his price his plan is to run his machinery by means of the jet of air from one of the large sulfateras which he estimates at twenty horsepower while we were absent on the mountain general ochoa's agent told dr bronson the following story about how the general came to own the mountain serious attention to the richness and abundance of sulphur in the crater of popocatepetl was first called by baron von humboldt the existence of sulphur in the crater was known long before as the spaniards seem to have made use of it in the time of the conquest in one of his letters to the emperor cortez says as for sulphur i have already made mention to your majesty of a mountain in this province from which smoke issues out of it sulphur has been taken by a spaniard who descended seventy or eighty fathoms by means of a rope attached to his body below his arms from which source we have been enabled to obtain sufficient supplies although it is attended with danger there is other evidence that the conquerors obtained sulphur from the mountain but their methods were of the most primitive character about the year eighteen fifty an enterprising mexican named corchado visited the crater and brought away samples of the sulphur which he carried to puebla a company was formed and a considerable amount of sulphur was taken out but owing to lawsuits and political troubles the enterprise was soon abandoned when general ochoa was a student in the mining section of the military college his tutor was a gentleman who had known baron humboldt and was greatly impressed with his remarks about the value of the sulphur deposits in the volcano through this gentleman's advice the general applied to the government for permission to work the deposits and he obtained a concession 
that gave him control of the mountain down to the limit of vegetation afterwards he purchased the rancho of Plumacus and established a refinery there he has spent a great deal of time in the crater and as he is an able geologist he has much to say about it that is interesting according to his theory which is based on the lignite formed at the bottom of the crater there has not been an eruption of popo for seven thousand years by that he means an eruption on a scale corresponding to the size of the mountain and not an occasional disturbance in which the crater throws up a few discharges of stones and an unusual quantity of steam and sulphur vapors in prescott's history of the conquest of mexico there is an account of an eruption in fifteen twenty one taken from a letter of diego ordaz one of the captains under cortez but modern writers think that ordaz mistook a violent thunderstorm on the summit of the volcano for an eruption from what we saw at the crater we can readily believe that he made such a mistake the view from the top of the mountain was the grandest we have ever taken and one we will never forget while we live the air is so clear that distance is strangely diminished towns and villages that seem to lie at our feet are really many many miles away and as we look to the eastward our guide told us that the streak of silver bordering the horizon was the gulf of mexico mountain valley tableland lakes plain forest all were spread before us and in the range of vision from the top of popocatepetl an area of twenty thousand square miles is said to be included on one side of the mountain you can look down into the tierra caliente of the coast region while on the other the eye is lost among the mountains and tablelands that stretch away until lost in the limitless distance so ends frank's account of their visit to the great mountain of mexico the party returned to amecameca and determined to remain there a day or two to make some explorations in the vicinity and also to rest from their fatigues during their stay fred found the following description of a visit to the crater of popocatepetl by an artist mr frank kellott which he carefully copied into his notebook we have obtained the youth's permission to copy the account and it is certain to interest our readers we followed a narrow footpath said mr kellott until we reached a shelf where we were seated in a skid and let down by a windlass five hundred feet or so to a landing place from this we clambered down to a second windlass and a second skid which was the most fearful of all because we were dangling about without anything to steady ourselves as we descended before the mouth of one of those yawning caverns which are called respiraderos or breathing holes of the crater they are so called from the fresh air and horrid sounds that continually issue from them but we shut our eyes and clung to the rope as we whirled round and round in mid-air until we reached another landing place about five hundred feet lower from this point we clambered down as best we could until we came among the men digging up cinders from which sulphur in the form of brimstone is made we took no measurements while in the crater and heights and distances can only be given approximately we only know that all things are on a scale so vast 
that old pluto might here have forged new thunderbolts and milton satan might have here found the material for his sulphurous bed all was strange and wild and frightful we crawled into several of the breathing holes but nothing was there except darkness visible the sides and bottom were for the most part polished by the molten mass which had passed through them and if it had not been for the ropes around our waists we should have slipped and fallen we knew not whither the stones we threw in were lost to sound unless they hit upon a projecting rock and fell from shelf to shelf the deep darkness was fearful to contemplate what must have been the effect when each one of these breathing holes was vomiting up liquid fire and sulphur into the basin where we stood how immeasurable must be the lake whose overflowings fill such a cavity as this the region around the base of popocatepetl seems to have been densely peopled at some remote period if we may judge by the ruins that lie scattered about by the numerous tombs on the hills and in the valleys and by the great quantity of pottery brought to light by excavations some antiquarians who have made researches here think that the cradle of the human race is to be found in mexico and that the people of this region gave the arts and sciences to egypt and the rest of the old world this conundrum was a perplexing one for our young friends they did not try to solve it but contented themselves with investigations on their own account the first object of their attention was monte sacro which is in the town of Amecameca. mecca it is a volcanic hill about three hundred feet high and contains a grotto that was turned into a hermitage at the time of the conquest a church was built there and a cemetery laid out and as the traditions of the old time became mingled with those of later days the place acquired great sanctity it abounds in tombs some of them very old and there were strange figures upon many of these resting places of the dead which none of the party could decipher at tlalmanalco a few miles from a mecca mecca there are the ruins of a convent which was begun in the time of cortez but was never finished there are the fragments of walls with a portico formed by five arches these arches are supported by slender columns which are covered with delicate carvings and suggest an oriental character they reminded our friends of what they had seen in temples in india and fred was so interested in them that he made a sketch of the ruins according to monsieur charnay the carvings were executed by indian artists after designs furnished by the spaniards that the arches have stood so long is proof of the excellence of their construction all around this place great quantities of pottery have been unearthed the story goes that thousands of vases and other precious things were found during the construction of the railway they were divided among the contractors and are widely scattered few if any of them ever having reached the national museum quantities of so-called antiquities were offered to our friends but they had been warned long before and did not purchase any the antiquities are modern and so great is the demand for them that a considerable number of people is employed in their manufacture the dealers heightened the imposition by enjoining great caution on the part of the purchaser 
lest the government shall ascertain that he is in possession of the precious relic and despoil him of it a few years ago an enterprising antiquarian spent several days in the neighborhood of Plamachus on the very foot of Popocatepetl. Among other places, he examined the cemetery of Tenene Panko, which seems to have been of considerable extent. He opened a great many tombs and found that the bodies had mostly been buried in a sitting posture after the manner of many ancient people. A curious circumstance which he discovered was that while the bones were so decayed that they crumbled to dust on being touched the brain was very often intact and well preserved he attributed this condition to the high elevation and the peculiar salts in the soil one brain in particular was in perfect condition while all the skull was mouldered away he was in some doubt at first but an examination showed that there was no mistake the two lobes were there and the lines of the blood vessels were distinctly traceable the same chemical combination that destroyed the bones preserved the soft tissues of the body he took out a great number of vases cups marbles necklaces toy chariots kitchen utensils beads caricatures of warriors and many other things illustrating the life of the people who made them some of the cups were beautifully decorated but unfortunately their exposure to the air caused the colors to fade ordinary utensils of earthenware were very soft when brought to light and had to be handled with the greatest care but they hardened by exposure and were solid enough after a few hours the youths learned that one tribe of indians was accustomed to worship the great volcano as a deity at the time of the conquest and the practice is still maintained they have caves in the forest on the easterly side of the mountain and once a year they go there to perform their worship no stranger is allowed to accompany them and any one who persists in following them runs the risk of his life some years ago so the story runs an inquisitive white man followed a party of these indians into the forest and was never seen again what became of him is a mystery the indians claimed that they knew nothing of his fate and there is no positive proof to the contrary frank had an experience of the skill of the mexican thief during his stay at a mecca mecca he had dismounted from his horse in front of the hotel ferro Carril, and while he was busy arranging the stirrup on one side of the saddle a thief crept up and stole the other one he not only stole the stirrup but the strap that held it and the youth was obliged to invest in another i'm surprised you've had nothing of the kind before said the proprietor of the hotel when he heard of the occurrence that was the work of a rotero what is a rotero frank asked he's a thief peculiar to this part of mexico was the reply or rather i should say he belongs to the whole country and the finest quality of him is produced around here he will open and rob a trunk while carrying it on his back between the hotel and the railway station he will cut off the lining of a railway carriage in less than two minutes steal railway ties and anything else that he can lift and as for ordinary thefts his superior cannot be found anywhere several years ago the authorities of this town decided to light it with petroleum lamps but the very first night they did so the lamps were stolen by the rateros 
and the town was in darkness as it had been before. Frank was able to add a few notes to what he and Fred had already ascertained about Mexican thieves. The youths discussed the subject and came to the conclusion that the tropics produced more adroit pilferers than the temperate zones. At least such had been their experience. It is no wonder, said Fred, that these people have become experts in stealing. Think how they have been despoiled by the Spaniards, who stole their country and all it contained, and reduced the people to the condition of a subject race. No wonder they have sought to revenge themselves on their conquerors, and their mildness of conduct is to be greatly admired in view of what they have suffered. The condition of a Mexican peon is such that, if I may be permitted the paradoxical statement, he is obliged to steal in order to make an honest living. Thus musing, they returned to the city with the doctor and their late companions in the ascent of Popocatepetl. End of chapter 19《Chapter Twenty of the Boy Travellers in Mexico》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by a fine voice. The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Once a souvenir. The train by which our friends returned to the capital left Amacamica at one twenty in the afternoon, and reached the San Lazaro station at four o'clock. A crowd of carcadores swooped down on the baggage, and for a time threatened to disappear with it in as many directions as there were single pieces, but by dint of watchfulness and energy it was rescued. The Morelos, or Inter-Oceanic Railway, the one by which the party had travelled, is distinctively a Mexican line. It was built by Mexican capital, or capital borrowed by Mexicans, and the management is Mexican throughout. When finished, it will be literally what its name implies, as it will connect the Atlantic Ocean at Veracruz with the Pacific at Acapulco. At the time our friends were in Mexico, work was being pushed on the eastern division of the line, between Veracruz and the capital, and its managers were confident of completing it by the end of 1890 or 1891. At last accounts, the completion of the Western Division, from the capital to Acapulco, was very much in the future. It seemed to Frank and Fred that they had been away from the city for a month or two, when in reality they had been gone less than a week. The next morning they were out early to ascertain if any changes had taken place during their absence, whether any new buildings had been erected, or old ones demolished, new streets opened, or new avenues laid out. They strolled through the portales and stopped at the little shops established between the arches of the covered way that shelters the sidewalks from sun and rain to bargain for old books and odds and ends of curiosities. Fred had received a letter from a friend at home asking him to pick up certain old books if they were to be found, and he made many inquiries for the volumes. One after another he found them, and the search roused in him a fever for book-buying, which did not abate until he had invested several dollars in antique specimens of the printer's art. "'How does it happen that so many old books are sold at these stalls in the Portales?' he said to Dr. Bronson, on his return to the hotel. Ruins of San Lazaro "'It comes from the confiscation of the church property,' was the reply. "'For three centuries, churches and monasteries had been gathering a fine collection of books for their libraries, "'and the confiscation of ecclesiastical buildings under the laws of the Reform "'threw the most of these libraries into the market. "'Some of them were bought for speculation, and others for private use. "'In either case, they were pretty sure to drift sooner or later into the hands of the dealers. "'Gentlemen familiar with the subject say that Mexico is today the best place in the world for a book collector to find what he is looking for. 
From the portales, the youths extended their walk through several of the principal streets and reached the hotel just in time for breakfast. On their way, they passed a school, just as the pupils were going in, and this circumstance gave a hint on which they acted at once. On the way to church. They proceeded to collect information concerning the public schools, in addition to what they had already learned. They found that there were in the capital 101 free secular schools, with an aggregate attendance of 7,400 pupils. Then there were 37 Protestant and 24 Catholic schools, all free. The former with 1,300 pupils, and the latter with 4,000. The Catholic schools are held in large buildings, as will be readily seen from the number of pupils in the 24 schools, while the Protestant establishments are on a smaller scale. There are something more than 100 private schools for primary instruction, with an average of 30 pupils to each school. All the wealthy families have their children taught by private tutors or governesses, but the grade of their education is not high. The whole number of educational establishments in the city is a little short of 300, with an attendance in the aggregate of about 16,000. Monks at their musical exercise. Mention has already been made of the San Carlos Academy of Fine Arts, the Conservatory of Music, the Military Academy and the Medical College. To these should be added the law school and the preparatory schools and colleges of architecture, theology, commerce and astronomy. Some of these have been founded by the government in recent times, while others are descended from those established by the Catholic Church in its days of prosperity. Of some twenty hospitals and asylums of different names and kinds, fully two-thirds of the successors of benevolent institutions founded by the Church. The oldest is the Hospital of Jesus Nazareno, and was founded by Cortes. He left a large endowment for it, and the hospital is still supported by it, in spite of many attempts by governments and individuals to break his will. The last effort in this direction was in 1885, when the will was sustained by the Mexican courts. The bad management of the hospital in its early days led to the founding of the San Hippolito Hospital by Bernardo Alvarez in 1567. The pious people that joined him became a regular monastic order under the name of Brothers of Charity. The order was suppressed in 1820. The hospital fund passed into the hands of the municipality and afterwards went to the general government. Since that time the city has managed the hospital and provided the necessary funds for it. A Bell of the Opera One of the theatres in the city, the Teatro Principal, owes its beginning to the necessity of a money to support the Hospital Real, which was in the hands of the Brothers of Charity during the 17th century. The first theatre was in the hospital building, and the players were hired by the brothers. Tradition says that the noise made by the performers and audiences seriously disturbed the sick, while the management of a theatre by a religious order caused a great scandal among pious people. The brothers argued that no matter what the origin of the money was, it was used for a good purpose, and they continued to enjoy the revenues of the theatre until the hospital was discontinued. The theatre, and with it part of the hospital, was burned one night in 1722 after the performance of The Ruin and Burning of Jerusalem. The common people regarded the conflagration as a sign of heavenly disapproval, but the brothers rebuilt immediately. A few years later they rebuilt again, and in 1752 they laid the foundation of the present theatre and finished it in the following year. It has been changed so much since that time that very little now remains of the original edifice. A stage brigand. The theatre is one of the institutions of Mexico and liberally patronised. On this subject Frank wrote the following. The Teatro Principal is not what its name implies, as it is not the principal theatre at all. It may have been so when it was the only one, but it certainly has not been of much account in late years. The most fashionable theatre is the Nacional. Italian and French opera are given there, 
and the place is open for one thing or another pretty much the whole year. It is the fashion to have the commencement exercises of the military and other colleges in the Teatro Nacional, and since we came here, there has been a grand concert in the building. We went to the opera one night. The performance was fairly good, nothing remarkable, and we came away with the impression that the Mexicans go there more to see and be seen than to listen to the performance. The ladies were in full evening costume, and the men seemed to be about equally divided between dress coats and double-breasted ones. There are boxes on two balconies, and also around part of the parquet. The prices for seats and boxes vary according to the attraction, and the house is said to be generally well filled. Most of the men left their seats between the acts, some of them to smoke cigarettes in the lobby, and others to call on their lady friends in the boxes, or send packages of dulces, sweetmeats, to them. The pretty women in the boxes seem to enjoy being stared at, if we could judge by the way they smiled when opera glasses were aimed at them. Many of the men paid no attention to the performance, but constantly eyed the beauties, and eyed them with their lorgnettes instead of their natural organs of sight. They came back just before the curtain rose on each act, and then each man stood up and made a survey of the horizon of boxes, reminding us of the quartermaster of a ship at sea looking for a sail. They tell us that the Mexican bells feel slighted if they are not thus stared at, and there is a keen rivalry among them as to who shall be the recipient of the greatest amount of attention. We have been accustomed in other parts of the world, continued the youth, to hear the voice of the prompter at the opera, but we were not prepared for it in an ordinary theatre, where the performance was a play in dialogue, and not a musical one. We went one night to the Hidalgo Theatre to see and hear a Mexican play. The prompter pronounced every sentence before the actor did, and it was heard all through the house. It completely spoiled the play for us, and we left before it was over. What we liked a good deal better was the arrangement of the office, where there were five or six ticket sellers seated in a row behind a grating, so that there was no delay in getting places. They showed us a plan of the theatre in which the seats were marked by pegs in holes. We selected three places, paid our money, and then the ticket seller drew out the pegs and handed them to us. The pegs were numbered to correspond with the places, and we handed them to the usher as checks for our seats. We found that we could buy seats for a single act or for two acts or three, just as we liked, on the same plan as in some of the cities of Europe. In addition to the theatre and opera, the Mexicans inherit the Spanish love for the bullfight. This form of sport has had its ups and downs in the capital. It was abolished in the federal district for some time, but was recently re-established or permitted, and now there are bullrings at the northern end of the Paseo and in San Cosme. There is always a large attendance, but it is chiefly of the lower classes of the population. Tivoli Garden, San Cosme We have seen a bullfight, but it was not a real one. It was given at a marionette theatre and was said to be an excellent representation of the actual performance. The figures were about four inches high and operated by cords invisible to the audience. It was interesting and funny, and we had a good laugh while looking at it. During Lent, this marionette theatre has exhibitions called Los Procesiones, in which long processions of various church dignitaries and characters are drawn slowly along a stage or walk, extending the whole length of the room. At the time we saw the miniature bullfight, the walk had been removed and the stage was at the end of the hall. The audience was of the lower class of natives and we kept a good watch over our pockets. The real bullfight was something we did not want to see and we refused several invitations to witness it. It is a brutal, degrading sport from our point of consideration, but probably the Spaniards and Mexicans would not agree with us. Teasing the bull. Mr Brocklehurst, the author of Mexican Today, says the bullfight here is almost as attractive as in Spain, and the sporting men of Mexico have their preferences in regard to the ganderias. The farms on which bulls are raised just as the same class in England have their favourite stables for horses. The bulls are a proper age for fighting at, from three to five years. They are reared as carefully as racehorses in other countries and brought to the plaza 
during the night before the day on which they are to do battle. On their arrival they are shut in a dark pen. When wanted for the fight, they are driven from this pen, one by one, to the toril, which opens into the arena. The ring is in a great amphitheatre without a roof, and the seats, al sol, on the sunny side, are only half the price of those al sombre on the shady side. To the discredit of the people, be it said, the seats are generally well filled to witness this cruel sport, and the great mass of the people seem to be more interested in it than in the choice of a president or the opening of a new railway. The performance begins with a procession of the fighters, and then the master of ceremonies asks the judge for the key of the toril, which is thrown to him. He then goes to the toril and lets in the bull, the band and all other persons not concerned in the fight having judiciously retired from the ring. Picadores The picadores, or mounted men, are on miserable horses, whose eyes are bandaged so that they cannot see the bull. As the animal enters, he looks around in astonishment at the horses and their riders, at the capiadores with their scarlet cloaks to attract the bull's attention, and at the banda rileros, whose duty it is to stick darts in the animal to enrage him. Sometimes the darts have firecrackers attached in addition to the long ribbons with which they are always ornamented. The Matador's Triumph The most cruel part of the performance, and one which generally sickens the foreign spectator, is when the poor, broken-down and blindfolded horses are gored by the maddened animal, which has been brought into the ring, only to be killed. The most interesting part of it is, when after killing several horses, and being worried for half an hour by his tormentors, the bull is turned over to the Matador, who, after several feints and skilfully avoiding the charges of the animal, plants his sword up to the hilt between the bull's shoulders. The matador is a hero who is worshipped by the populace as much as is the champion baseball player in the United States or the jockey in England who wins the derby. Once in a while a matador is killed by his four-footed adversary. An occurrence of this kind adds interest to the sport, though it may plunge the whole country into grief. The final blow. Next to the matador, the men who run the greatest risk are the picadores, the fellows who fight on horseback. They are protected by leather armour, which impedes their movements, and when a horse is thrown down by the bull, they often fall with him and are unable to extricate themselves. When this occurs, the capiadores, who are also called chulos, endeavour to draw away the bull's attention by waving their cloaks in front of him. The ruse generally succeeds, and the unfortunate picador is assisted out of his dangerous position as quickly as possible. Sometimes the bull will not be diverted from his attack on horse and rider, and it is in such cases that the picador may be gored, perhaps to death. If he is hurt but not killed, the spectators show their appreciation of his bravery by tossing silver dollars into the ring, and a wounded picador has been known to gather up a hatful of these welcome coins before retiring. Scenes at a bullfight A priest is always waiting in a room near the toril in order to offer the last sacrament to any luckless combatant who may be fatally injured. When a bull is killed, his body is dragged off by a team of richly ornamented mules. These mules form part of the procession that opens the performance, but they never seem to manifest any special pride in their work. We are told that the spectators are often wild with excitement over the incidents of a bullfight, they smash the furniture and railings and have been known to wreck a considerable portion of the woodwork of the ring in their fury. Sombreros by the dozen of all kinds and values are thrown into the arena and a gentleman tells us he has seen hundreds of spectators leaving the place bareheaded at the end of an exciting day. From four to six bulls are killed at a performance, four being the usual number, and ten or twelve horses. A bull ring of the highest class that will do for the national sport of Mexico, concluded the youth. It is only given because a description of the country would be incomplete without it. Dr. Bronson says that bullfighting was originally a compromise with the Roman custom of gladiatorial combats and furnished a substitute that met the desire of the populace to witness bloodshed. It was brought to Mexico by the Spaniards, partly as a reminiscence of their home country 
and partly to take the place of the human sacrifices of the Aztecs. It has become a part of the life of the people, and the government that endeavours to suppress it would run the risk of being overturned. A school on the old model. From theatres and bullfights, the conversation naturally turned to the other amusements of the Mexicans. That the people are fond of gambling, the youths had already learned. Also that one of their sports was cockfighting. Gamecocks are carefully trained for the work they are expected to perform, and fights between them are of frequent occurrence. A traveller in Mexico tells how he once visited a school where each of the pupils had a gamecock, which he carried constantly with him, and during school hours the birds were supposed to be tied up so that they could not get at each other. The noonday recess was generally devoted to a battle between two of the feathered champions, and sometimes the teacher, who possessed several game birds, joined in the sport with his pupils. Cockpits are more numerous than bullrings for the reason that their construction is inexpensive. Only a few posts and a thatched roof are necessary. The birds are placed in the centre of a ring and the excited spectators crowd as closely as possible to the ropes in order to witness the sport. Pretty nearly all the money in their possession changes hands during or at the end of the performance and sometimes the peons are so warmed up to the business that they wager their hats, coats and nearly all their garments together with everything else they possess. The religious observances of the country are closely mixed up with amusements as the festivities established by the church are almost invariably combined with entertainments in greater or less variety. In this respect, they have their counterpart in the Christmas festivities of most Protestant countries. We can't have Christmas here as we do, Frank remarked to Fred while they were discussing the subject. Why so? Fred asked. Because, was the reply, they have no chimneys and consequently no way for Santa Claus to get into the house after the time-honoured fashion. That's so, answered Fred, but you may be sure they have their fun, and quite as much as we do. We'll look into that subject and find out about it. Fred investigated, and here is the result of his inquiries. The Mexicans have a longer Christmas than we do, as it begins on the 17th of December and lasts until New Year's Day. During their Christmas they have an amusement called the Posada, or Inn, it is based upon occurrences of the time when Caesar Augustus ordered the whole world to be taxed and Joseph and Mary came to Judea from Galilee to be enrolled. Bethlehem was so filled with strangers that they wandered from inn to inn for nine days without finding accommodations and then sought shelter in the stable in which Christ was born. The figure of Joseph, procession of the Posada. In commemoration of the nine days of wandering, Mexican posadas last nine days. In many houses, processions are formed, and the people of a family join in it, carrying tapers and singing litanies. Figures of Joseph and Mary are carried in front of each procession, and every door that is passed on the round is knocked upon in the effort to obtain shelter. The sound of the litanies is to be heard all over the city. Courtyards and windows are hung with numerous lanterns, and all the public places are richly ornamented and abound with pleasure-seekers. The principal sport of the Posada is breaking the pinate, an earthen jar filled with dilthas. The jar is richly decorated on the outside and ornamented with ribbons of paper. The pinates are made in the shape of all known and many unknown birds and beasts, and also in the shape of dolls, some of them being of great size. Peddlers go about the streets with these things suspended from a pole, and the number sold at Christmas time is very large. When the ceremonial procession is over, the party goes to the patio, or to a large room of the house, and there the fun begins. A pinata is suspended from the ceiling, or from a cord stretched across the patio, and then one of the party, blindfolded and armed with a stick, sets about breaking the pinati. Sometimes half a dozen are blindfolded at once, and then the fun is lively. When the pinati is broken, the dolthas fall to the floor, and everybody scrambles for them. Altogether, the game reminds us of blind man's buff and some of our other home sports. A good many people omit the religious part of the posada and come at once to the jug-breaking. In wealthy families, posadas often cost many hundreds, 
or even thousands of dollars. The ladies receive handsome and valuable presents, and the broken Pinatis have been known to yield showers of rings and gold coins instead of the regulation sweetmeats. The affair concludes with a grand dance, and the participants do not reach home until a very late or early hour. All through the Christmas and New Year festivities there are grand balls, dinners, theatre parties and the like. Everybody indulges in festivity according to his means, and not infrequently beyond them. And when the affair is over and the realities of life come again, the tradesmen who seek to collect their bills make the time doubly serious. In some parts of the country, the pastorella, or pastoral, takes the place of the posada. The amusements are pretty much the same, the principal difference being that another instance of the nativity is taken as the groundwork of the ceremonial. The Railway Judas Another popular festival is on the last day of Holy Week, which is devoted to the death of Judas. Effigies of Judas abound everywhere. They are hung on trees and from windows, on lampposts, balconies in fact, everywhere they can be made to hang. You see them on the front of every locomotive on that day, and on many another vehicle. In fact, it would be easier to say where Judas is not than where he is. The figures are of all dimensions, but usually of life size. They are filled with fireworks of various sorts, so that they explode when a match is touched to them. If for many cause they do not explode, they are torn in pieces when they fall to the ground. In thus destroying them, the people indicate their detestation of the betrayer of his master. Not infrequently, the figures that are hung from private houses have thirty silver dollars pasted upon them, as a reminder of the thirty pieces of silver which were the traitor's price. Of course, there is a lively scramble for these coins when the Judas falls to the ground. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mario Pineda The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallach Knox Chapter 21 one of the volumes in which our young friends were interested during their stay in Mexico was The Ancient Cities of the New World by Monsieur Charney. The perusal of this book led them to wish to visit Tula, which is famous for having been a city of the Toltecs and a flourishing place at the time of the conquest. Leaving the city of Mexico at half past seven o'clock one morning by the Central Railway, they reached Tula at 9.40 a.m. The distance is about 50 miles and the route is the same as already described through the Nochistongo cut. The returning train at 4.40 p.m. brought them back to the city at 7 o'clock, and the trio unanimously voted that they had passed a most agreeable and instructive day. The heads of the Jews were filled with archaeology, and they felt themselves almost competent to write a history of the Toltecs and their migrations in spite of the obscurity of many of the traditions about this remarkable people. Instead of history, they acted upon Dr. Bronson's suggestion and contented themselves with an account of what they had seen with a few supplementary notes by way of explanation. From this account, we will make a few selections. Tula now has a population of less than 2,000, said Frank in his notebook, but according to the histories, it was a rival to the Nochtitlan, the ancient name of the city of Mexico at the time of the conquest. The inhabitants were firm supporters of Cortés and among the first people to accept the new religion and become his allies. Its ancient name was Toyán, which is said to mean the place of reeds and also the place of many people. Cortés built a church there very soon after he conquered the place. There is a church now standing which was begun in 1553 and completed eight years later. It is one of the best built churches in Mexico at any rate, one of the best that we have seen. Dr. Brunson thought it must have been intended as a fortress as well as a church, as the walls in some places are seven feet thick and built in the most substantial manner. And it wasn't a small building either, 
as it is 192 feet long by 41 wide. The body of the church is more than 80 feet high, and it has a tower whose top is 125 feet from the ground. The architects that came with Cortés evidently understood how to erect substantial buildings. Exactly how many inhabitants there were in Tula when Cortés came, nobody seems to know, but it is certain, from the extent of the ruins, that the city covered a wide area. There is a small and not particularly clean river that winds through a plain around the base of Mount Coatepetl, and the city stretched over this plain and was dominated by the mountain. Great quantities of sculpture have been found here in ploughing the fields or clearing the bed of the river, and explorers and antiquarians have done a great deal of work with profitable results. Some of the finds have been taken to the museum in Mexico, some have gone out of the country, and a good many large pillars and pieces of statues remain in Tula to interest and instruct the visitor. According to the historians, the Toltecs founded Tula, or Toyan, in the year 648. We have told elsewhere how the discovery of Pulque brought about the ruin of the nation, but whether this is really so or not, the historians cannot say positively. At any rate, the ruins of Tula are of great antiquity, as we have walked and stood among them, we tried to make a mental picture of what was to be seen here a thousand years ago. We imagined that we saw a long line of soldiers armed with spears, like javelins, bows and arrows, and also with clubs studded with copper or silver nails. They were protected by cotton tunics thickly quilted that must have been very warm when the wearers were marching, but evidently made an excellent armor. They had leggings of the same material, and they had weighted capes over their shoulders, but kept their arms bare for greater facility in handling their weapons. We pictured their king wrapped in a thick mantle knotted across his breast, with his hands bare and his feet protected by sandals. These sandals were held in place by a thong passing between the first and second toes, exactly after the style of the footgear worn by the Japanese at the present time. His head was covered with a conical cap resembling that of the Persians, and his ears were ornamented with heavy rings that glistened through his long hair. At one side of the field where the soldiers are standing in battle array, we see some buildings which they tell us are storehouses where grain is laid away in times of abundance as a provision against the period of famine. This was a custom of the Toltecs, and on several occasions saved them from great suffering. One building which we cannot clearly make out is a tennis court, so Mr. Chanet says, and if we have any doubt about it now, we can be convinced as one of the tennis rings is still in place. Then there is a temple on the top of a hill, and the procession that is going towards the temple is in honor of a warrior who is receiving the honor of knighthood. You will be interested in learning that they had a regular system of knighthood here centuries before Columbus discovered America. When a candidate was to be presented, the knights accompanied him to the temple in a solemn procession. At the temple, a priest pierced the cartilage of his nose with an eagle's claw, and then twigs were inserted in the wound to keep the flesh from uniting as the sore healed. He was clad in a coarse tunic, and then they painted him black all over, gave him one tortilla and a little water once a day to save him from starvation, and compelled him to lie on a mat on the cold ground. They allowed him to sleep only a few minutes at a time, and wake him by a prod with a thorn. Several times a day, they sat down and feasted in front of him, called him every mean name their language contained, and heaped all sorts of insults upon him. They kept this up for sixty days. If he lost his temper at any time and talked back at their insults or asked for any of their food, the ceremony stopped and he wasn't made a knight. If he held up bravely and patiently to the end of the sixty days, he was then taken to the temple again, and the whole order of the knights received him with high honors. His mean garments were removed from him by the oldest knight in the assemblage, and he was decorated with the insignia of the order and dressed in fine clothes. The juice of the hole in his nose was now apparent, as the jewel that indicated his rank was hung there. The Apache and other southwestern Indians occupied the country dwelt in by the Toltecs before their migration to Mexico. 
These Indians wear ornaments in their noses and are supposed to have derived the custom from the ancient inhabitants. So much for the past. Let us see what there is here now. Here are the ruins of the Temple of the Sun, where the people worshipped the great luminary. They made offerings of fruits and flowers, and sometimes of birds, and, unlike the Aztecs, they did not indulge in human sacrifices. The temple is now only a heap of stones partly overgrown with trees, and it is said that a great deal of material was taken from it for building the houses of the Tula of today. We went from this temple to the ruins of the palace. These ruins were unearthed by Monsieur Chernet and covered a considerable area of ground. The guide who accompanied us was the same that aided the author of ancient cities of the New World, and he pointed out the different rooms in the palace and their probable uses. One room, he said, was supposed to have been devoted to a sort of happy family of wild and domestic animals, as it was the fashion of those times for every palace to have a menagerie attached to it. Then they had coops and cages for turkeys, ducks, and other fowls destined for the table, yards for goats and other domestic quadruples, tanks for the fish, and chambers for reptiles and birds of prey. Servants' quarters were arranged very much as in modern palaces, and altogether the Toltec kings had a good deal of comfort about their residences. In the plaza we saw some broken columns, which appeared to have been wrought with a great deal of skill and carefully mortised together. There was also the lower portion of a caryatid. Fred made a sketch of it, with the guide standing at one side, so that you can see the proportions of the figure. Only the legs and feet remain, and they are more than seven feet high. Taking this height for a calculation, the head of the complete figure before it was broken must have been nearly 20 feet from the ground. The Toltecs built their houses of uncut stone laid in mud and covered with hard cement. This cement seems to have been of an excellent composition, as it is well preserved in spite of the centuries that have elapsed since the city was built. The floors are leveled with the same cement, and some of them are smooth enough for skating rinks. The palace that we visited contains 30 or 40 rooms, and there is a smaller palace in another part of the town, which we did not see. One of the Toltec stone basins is used as a baptismal font for the church, and the ruins supplied much of the material on which the walls are composed. We dined fairly well at the Hotel de Diligencias, having taken the precaution to order the dinner as soon as we arrived. We allowed ourselves scant time for the meal, as we wished to utilize our stay as much as possible in seeing the sites of Tula. If we ever turn excavators of ruins, we will come to Tula and see what can be found. Our interest is somewhat stimulated by the story that an Indian boy once found a jar here containing 500 gold coins. He was ignorant of their value and sold the entire lot for a few coppers. If you hear of our doing anything of this sort, please let us know. On their return to the city, Dr. Brunson found at the hotel a letter which contained an invitation to visit the sugar plantation in the state of Morelos. The invitation included the Jews and was accepted at once. Immediate acceptance was necessary as the proprietor of the state was to leave the city on the following morning and wished the visitors to accompany him, and on their part they desired the pleasure and advantage of his company on the road. The party took the morning train of the Interoceanic Railway, the line by which they went to Amecameca on their excursion to Popocatepetl. Their destination was Cuautla, pronounced Cuautla, or Cuautla Morelos as it is officially designated. It was named in honor of the patriot Morelos, said Señor Domingo, the gentleman whose sugar estate our friends were going to visit. I have seen his name in the list of Mexicans who have made their names famous, replied Fred, and must refresh my memory concerning him. I will save you the trouble of consulting the histories, the gentleman answered, by giving you a brief sketch of his life. The Jews above their acknowledgments of his courtesy as Señor Domingo continued. You doubtless know about the insurrection laid by the priest Hidalgo in 1810, which was the beginning of the War of Independence. Well, Morelos was one of the curates under Hidalgo, and when the insurrection began, he joined in it, and raised a force of patriots to oppose the Spaniards and drive them from the country. He began with five Negro slaves as the nucleus of his army, and soon had a following of several thousands. 
He was successful at first, and his defense of Cuautla was one of the most heroic affairs known in Mexican history. Morelos had taken his position in the town and was attacked by the Spanish general Calleja in February 1812. He repels the attack, and then the Spaniards laid siege to the place. For more than two months, the siege was kept up, provisions grew very scarce, and the besieged were near the point of starvation. Rats sold for one dollar each, and a cat was worth five or six dollars. Lizards became valuable, and a fair-sized one was worth two dollars, and could not be readily obtained at that price. Was the Patriot Army forced to surrender? Frank asked. No, was the reply. It held up for 62 days, and then Morelos managed on a dark and rainy night to evacuate the place and retreat. He fought several other battles, but was finally captured. He was tried for reason and condemned to death, and it is notable that his conviction was one of the last acts of the Inquisition in Mexico. Morelos was shot in December 1815. His memory is preserved in the name of the state we are about to visit, and also in that of his native city, Valladolid, which is now called Morelia. To be shot for treason seems to be the fate of the majority of Mexican leaders, one of the Jews remarked. Yes, was the reply. An intimate friend of Morelos and one of his ablest officers was the priest Maramoros. He was captured and shot by Iturbide in 1814, and in revenge for his execution, Morelos is said to have butchered 200 Spanish prisoners. And Iturbide, as you know, was disposed of in the same way when he set foot on Mexican soil after his banishment. It may seem strange to you to see the portraits of Iturbide, Morelos, and Matamoros side by side in the public hall of Cuautla, and to know we revere them all as heroes. But it shows you the ups and downs of Mexican history better than anything else I know of. The conversation just related occurred as the train was wending its way from Mexico to Amecameca. Beyond that town, there were numerous curves in the railway line, and the Jews were interested in studying the rapidly changing panorama as the train wound among the mountains in its descent from Osamba to Cuautla. Before the ride was ended, they declared that they had nowhere seen a more crooked railway and expressed unfeigned admiration for the engineer that built it. But their admiration was checked when Señor Domingo pointed out the scene of one of the most terribly fatal accidents known in the history of railway management. This is the place, said he, as they reached the deep barranca of Malpais. The railway was opened on the 18th of June, 1881, and there was an excursion from the city with the grand banquet of Cuautla. President Diaz and nearly all the notable men of Mexico went on the excursion and banqueting party. In fact, there was hardly any government left in the capital on that day. The banquet was given in an old convent, which had been converted into a railway station and a very good station it makes. There was a regiment of soldiers at Cuautla at the time, and just six days after the excursion and the opening of the line, it was ordered to the city. The soldiers were placed on platform cars, and several other cars loaded with barrels of aguardiente were attached to the train. It was dusk when the train started, and the night came on very dark and rainy. The soldiers broke open some of the barrels of the fire liquid and drank heavily to keep out the effects of the rain. The foundations of the bridge at this barranca had been badly built and were made unsafe by a flood. When the train came along, the bridge gave way and the cars were thrown into the abyss. The barrels of aguardiente took fire, the cartridges in the belts of the soldiers exploded. The men who were not killed outright or stunned by the fall were crazy with drink and excitement and shot and stabbed each other. Many were swept away by the torrent and altogether the accident was the most horrible ever known upon a railway, so far as I have read or heard. More than 300 lives were lost, and many persons think the real number was not much below 500. Frank and Fred shuddered as they looked from the windows of the car into the deep barranca, where the stream was rushing along in its wild fury. The fallen train, inky darkness, the tropical storm, men crazed with drunkenness, Burning aguardiente, exploding cartridges, knives, bayonets, and loaded rifles combined to make a picture terrible to contemplate. The change from the valley of Mexico to the warm country south of the encircling mountains is very perceptible in the distance between Osumba and Cuautla, and more so where the line continues to Yautepec, 
15 miles farther on. Cuautla is 85 miles from Mexico City, and before the railway was opened, it was very difficult to access. The railway, as before stated, is entirely Mexican in character. It is a narrow gauge line and owes its existence to the owners of the sugar estates in the region of which Cuautla and Yautepec are the commercial centers. Through the political influence of these men, a government concession and subsidy were obtained with extra subventions for the speedy constructions. To the insecure character of the work, owing to the speed with which the line was built, may be attributed the accident at the Malpais Barranca. Cuautla has about 12,000 inhabitants and is 3,500 feet above the level of the sea. The rapidity of the descent of the railway will be realized when it is remembered that Amecameca is nearly 5,000 feet higher up in the air and less than 50 miles away. That the region is tropical, a glance from the car windows as the station is approached will readily show. Cuautla contains a very good and venerable church and a well-built town hall. The Alameda is pretty, and when these have been seen, the stranger has practically finished with the place. Señor Domingo did not allow our friends an opportunity to inspect the town, as his carriage was waiting at the station, and they were off in a few minutes. They did not see the sights of Cuautla until their return. They had breakfasted lightly before the starting in the morning, and substantially at Osumba. It was half past three in the afternoon when they ended their railway ride, and the drive to the sugar estate occupied fully two hours. The drive was along roads lined with tropical trees and plants, and among plantations of bananas, sugarcane, oranges, and other products of the warm region. The air was dense and hot, and by no means an agreeable change from the pure atmosphere of the Valley of Mexico. Sugar is the chief product of the state of Morelos, the annual yield being over 60 million pounds or 30,000 tons. Next to sugar comes corn, the value of the corn product being nearly two-thirds as much as that of the sugar. Coffee, rice, wheat, and fruits are the remaining yields of the soil, and there are several silver mines in Morelos, but they are not of great repute. The story is that they swallow up a great deal more than they produce and are only worked when a capitalist happens along who has a few hundreds of thousands he is willing to part with. A late and bountiful dinner was served at the plantation, and after a pleasant evening with the family of their host, the strangers retired to rest. They were out early the next morning, ready for an investigation of the sugar-making process as it is conducted in Mexico. Here is what Fred wrote on the subject. We have seen sugar-making in several parts of the world, so that there is nothing particularly new to us here. They have the most improved machinery for crushing, boiling, and refining, and there is a portable railway for transporting the sugar cane to the mills. This railway is shifted from one part of the estate to another as it is wanted, and the saving of horse or other quadruple L power is very great. The peons appear to be well fed and happy, but it must be remembered that it takes very little to support this class of the population. Nearly all the sugar consumed in central Mexico is ground in the state of Morelos and the tropical region which immediately borders it. It is said that the business is less profitable now than in former times, owing to the low price of sugar. The process of making sugar has been described so often that it would be superfluous to give it a place here. Some of the estates date from the time of Cortés, and we were shown a building that was erected about 1540, if the tradition concerning it is correct. Of course, the processes for obtaining sugar from the cane have greatly improved since that time, and the sugar makers of 300 years ago would be very much astonished if they could wake up and see what is going on here now. Dr. Bronson and his nephews spent two or three days around Cuautla and then continued on to Yautepec, where they took horses for the five hours ride to Cuernavaca. They took the advice of Señor Domingo and spent the night at Yautepec so as to make the horseback journey in the early hours of the day and thus escape the heat of noon. We had a rough ride, said Frank, but were amply repaid for it, not only by the scenery along the way, but by the quaint and picturesque position of Cuernavaca. It has a commanding side of the promontory projecting into the valley of Cuernavaca several hundred feet above it. The valley is exceedingly fertile, 
and so is the ground on which the town, with its 12 or 14,000 inhabitants, is located. There was a town here when Cortes came to Mexico, and it was captured and converted to Christianity before the siege of Tenochtitlan was begun. There is a wonderful supply of tropical fruits, and also, we regret to say, of tropical insects, the scorpion having a prominent place among them. The widest street is the Calle Nacional, and the most interesting buildings are the church and the palace of Cortes. The conqueror had a grant of land from the king, which included the valley of Cuernavaca. He established his private residence here, and had a large estate where he introduced the cultivation of the sugar cane and other useful growths of the hot lands. His palace is now used as the public building of the estate of Morelos, which has its capital here. It has been changed a good deal since his time, and we had some doubt as to the veracity of the guide, who pointed out the different rooms and told the uses which the great warrior made of them. The church is well worth seeing, and according to the historians, it was founded in 1529, along with a convent of the Order of San Francisco. There is another church which was built by a Frenchman who came to Mexico, a poor boy, and was so successful in mining enterprises that he accumulated a fortune of $40 million. He has spent a million dollars in building the church, and another million in making a garden which is one of the finest in Mexico, though it is far from being what it was in its best days. We went through it and were fairly enraptured with what it contains. The whole flora of the tropics seemed to have been gathered in this garden, and not only that of the tropics, but also of a large part of the temperate sun. This fortunate Frenchman was named Joseph de la Borde, which is changed in Spanish into José de la Borda. Lest you might think of coming here to make his acquaintance, I would add that he was born in the year 1700, and therefore isn't around very much just now. Cuernavaca means cow's horn, but we looked in vain for something to remind us of the weapon of the favorite animal of the farmyard. It was explained to us that the word is a corruption of Cuaunahuac, which means where the eagle stops. This was a better definition, as the site of Cuernavaca is one which an intelligent eagle might elect for building his nest, provided there were no human beings around to molest them. The ill-fated Maximilian followed the supposed example of the eagle as he was fond of coming here. It was his favorite dwelling place whenever he could snatch a few days from the cares of state. Most of the houses are roofed with red tiles, which make a fine contrast with the foliage of the tropical and semi-tropical trees. We visited the springs of Guadalupe, which supplied the town with water, and found some charming scenery among the neighboring hills. Cuernavaca lies between two barrancas with very steep sides, and thereby, or therein, hangs a bit of history. The barrancas offer an excellent protection against assault, and when the army of Cortes came here, there seemed to be no point of access. You must remember that Cortes had no Krupp or Armstrong cannon with which he could lie off at his ease to batter the town to pieces and care nothing for the intervening chasms. The Spaniards were at bay for some time, till at last some of the soldiers found a place where two trees had fallen across the barranca and made a perilous but possible bridge. Over this passageway they crept one by one, some of them growing dizzy and falling off, to be dashed to death on the rocks below. Silently, they effected the transit, formed the ranks on the other side, and then, with the blare of trumpets and the fire of musketry, they dashed forward and captured the town. How it must have astonished the people when the position they had considered impregnable was thus captured by the white men from beyond the sea. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of the Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 22 at Cuernavaca, our friends learned that they were on the road from Veracruz and Mexico to Acapulco, and the youths greatly wished to continue to the Pacific Ocean. It is the old route of commerce between Spain and Asia, and was traveled for hundreds of years by long trains 
of pack mules laden with the products of the orient on their way to europe and with those of mexico and europe destined for asia it seems incredible that such a route should have been so long maintained across the continent with no track for wheeled vehicles over mountains and through deep gorges with the dangers of robbers pestilence and the hundred accidents that are liable to occur in such a country and such a time but so it was over this route were carried the cargoes of many richly freighted galleons along these dangerous pathways thousands of soldiers marched to glory or the grave and hundreds if not thousands of civilians went in search of new lands from which they could gather the wealth they coveted it is eighty leagues or two hundred forty miles from cuernavaca to acapulco the port which once enjoyed a profitable commerce but is today of comparatively little moment spasmodic efforts have been made at different times for the construction of a wagon road but they have never been carried far there is a wagon road between cuernavaca and mexico city a distance of about forty-five miles and over this a diligence runs three times a week each way and wagons laden with merchandise pass in fair number but the business of the route is less than it was two hundred years ago the mexicans hope for a revival when the railway is completed from veracruz to acapulco and a line of steamers between acapulco and china is under consideration dr bronson's plans did not include the overland journey to acapulco and by way of consolation the youths determined to write a description of the route from what they could learn from others by consulting those who had made the journey and by references to some of the volumes in their possession they composed the following there is no regular system of hiring horses and baggage mules for the journey and the traveler must make his bargain with an arario a horse to carry himself and a mule for the baggage will cost about forty dollars twenty for each animal if there are several persons in a party the price can be reduced somewhat it should be carefully stipulated that the arario pay his own expenses and those of his animals or the traveler will find himself mulcted for a considerable sum as he goes along the arario will want to be paid in advance a demand that should be strenuously refused the affair can be compromised by paying half down and the other half at the end of the journey which is ordinarily made in ten days as we start from cuernavaca we find ourselves on a carriage road and wonder how it happens that we were told we must go in the saddle the reason is soon apparent as the carriage road comes to an end after a little while it reminds us of that famous turnpike somewhere in the western states that began with a macadamized road fifty feet wide and steadily dwindled till it became only a squirrel track and ran up a tree or a similar road that terminated in a gopher hole one gentleman says the route from cuernavaca to acapulco is spoken of as a bueno camino de pajaros a good road for birds and he is about right the country is rough and the scenery wild and interesting except that one wearies of mountains and valleys after seeing a few hundreds of each portions of the way as we leave cuernavaca behind us are through the sugar region we pass large fields of cane and meet trains of mules laden with sugar at irregular intervals we find villages or isolated houses and in the construction of these buildings we observe that the cane is very prominent houses in this region are mostly built of cane and their roofs are heavily thatched to keep out the heat of the tropical suns and the heavy downpour of tropical rains this is the regular routine we make an early start in the daybreak take a long rest in the middle of the day then ride in the late afternoon and put up in a maison or inn or in the hut of some villager the accommodations are of the most primitive character but they are the best the country can afford and we accept them without murmuring for food we have eggs chickens fried bananas tortillas and always the national dish frijoles we can get milk in the morning but not at night as they milk their cows only once a day some of the rivers are fordable others have been bridged and others swollen by rains must be crossed in boats some of the boats are large enough to ferry our animals along with ourselves 
while at the crossing of others we are transported in dugouts and the horses and mules are compelled to swim of course in such a case everything must be removed from the backs of the animals and this causes a considerable delay we think ourselves fortunate in getting through in ten days when all the hindrances of progress are considered in some places there is absolutely no track as we follow the beds of streams where at each rise all traces of previous travellers are washed away in the time of floods these river beds are abandoned and the banks of the streams are followed years and years before new england and new york were settled the spaniards were traversing this route with long trains of beasts of burden laden with the treasures of the east if you want to know what they carried read bret harte's poem of the lost galleon in sixteen hundred and forty one the regular yearly galleon laden with odorous gums and spice india cotton and india rice and the richest silks of far cathay was due at acapulco bay the trains were waiting outside the walls the wives of the sailors thronged the town the traders sat by their empty stalls and the viceroy came himself down the bells in the town were all a trip te dooms were on each father's lip the limes were ripening in the sun for the sick of the coming galleon all in vain weeks passed away and yet no galleon saw the bay india goods advanced in price the governor missed his favorite spice the senoritas mourned for sandal and the famous cottons of coromandel and some for an absent lover lost and one for a husband tempest tossed and all along the coast that year votive candles were scarce and dear a thousand mules and donkeys were required for the transport of the freight of one of these galleons a cargo was often valued at two million dollars and the return one to the east was at equal worth the return cargo consisted mostly of silver cochineal cocoa and other mexican products together with european goods from spain the cargoes from asia were taken to the city of mexico and whatever did not find a market there was sent to spain by way of vera cruz the old chroniclers say that the mexicans had the first selection of the goods and often aroused the jealousy of their friends in spain in consequence well here we are at acapulco and for the last time dismount from our steeds we look upon the blue waters of the little harbor but can see no galleon at anchor only a few sailing ships and one of the steamers of the pacific mail company which has just come into port and lies fuming uneasily as though impatient to continue her voyage were it not for the semi-monthly visits of the pacific mail steamers acapulco would have no regular connection with the rest of the world the place has a population of three or four thousand only and it has a fort on an island which lies opposite the town cutting off the long swell of the pacific ocean and forming one of the best harbors on the western coast of mexico frank and fred returned with dr bronson to the city of mexico by diligence the road is rough and they were severely jolted in their eight hours ride they managed to shorten the rough part to six hours by leaving the diligence at tlalpan and coming thence to the city by the tramway hardly had the youths shaken the dust of the road from their garments than they looked around for new worlds to conquer their attention was drawn to guadalajara a city that is not often visited by tourists for the reason that it lies off the main route of travel it is the capital of the state of jalisco has a population of some eighty or ninety thousand contains a fine cathedral and other public buildings and altogether is worth a good deal more than a passing thought we can go there by train said frank as the branch line from the mexican central railway at Irapuato has been recently opened how long will it take us to get there queried fred about twenty-two hours was the reply we can leave here at eight ten p m and if not delayed the northbound train will get us to Irapuato at six fifty seven the next morning the train for guadalajara leaves Irapuato at eight forty a m and we are due in the city at six p m but perhaps uncle will not wish to go there what will we do in that case why go alone to be sure if he can spare us the time the plan was duly laid before dr bronson 
who at once gave his permission for the use to make the excursion without him he did not care particularly for it and said he would be satisfied to look at guadalajara through their eyes they immediately secured places in the pullman sleeping car for irapuato and were off by the train that evening by good fortune they were introduced during the day to a mexican gentleman senor sanchez who had a large hacienda near guadalajara and was then on his way to it with the customary politeness he informed the youths that his house and all it contained were theirs he followed up the formality by inviting them to spend a day or two with him either on their outward or return journey they took the hint and concluding that he desired to have a little time to himself on his arrival they arranged to stop off on their return from guadalajara it is three hundred fifty three kilometers from mexico city to irapuato and two hundred sixty from that station to guadalajara a total of six hundred thirteen kilometers or three hundred eighty miles the country from irapuato is for the most part broken but it contains few high mountains and here and there the youths found themselves looking across plains of considerable extent the region is well peopled and there are several towns or cities along the route each of them containing upwards of five thousand inhabitants there are many arroyos and barrancas that severely tax the abilities of the engineers but they are insignificant when compared with the great barrancas between guadalajara and the western coast construction parties are at work on the western section of the route and in due time the locomotive from guadalajara will sound its whistle at san blas on the shore of the pacific ocean there are some interesting bridges along the old diligence road said mr sanchez that have excited the admiration of travelers a few miles this side of guadalajara there is a stone bridge of nineteen arches which crosses the rio grande de santiago nobody can tell when it was built it bears at one place the date seventeen forty but whether that refers to the construction or to the repair of the bridge i am unable to say at each end there are the statues of the king and queen of spain at the time of erection but they are so worn by time and defaced by vandals that they cannot be recognized there is another old structure near Zapotlanejo called the bridge of calderon which crosses a narrow but deep arroyo it is of interest to the student of mexican history as it is the point at which the patriot hidalgo with eighty thousand indians was defeated by a few hundred spaniards his men were armed only with bows and arrows and spears in addition to a few old muskets and some wooden cannon that burst at the first fire the spaniards were well armed and had six or eight cannon which wrought havoc among the followers of the patriot priest they were so ignorant of the power of gunpowder that they rushed up to the cannon and crowded their hats into the muzzles in the expectation that they would thus prevent the pieces from going off thousands of them were mowed down and finally the remnant were driven from the field this was the last great battle fought by hidalgo he retreated to chihuahua with a hundred followers and not long afterwards was betrayed captured and executed the country around here was formerly terribly infested with brigands he continued but they are rarely heard of now a large number were killed off by the government troops others by private enterprise and finally those that remained were induced to quit the business of robbery and become members of the rural guard you mentioned private enterprise as a way of getting rid of brigands fred remarked i do not understand it exactly i can best explain the matter by giving an illustration senor sanchez replied there is a hacienda called venta de los pagaros about twenty-five miles from tepotitlan which belongs to senor perez it is twenty miles long and there are nearly fifty thousand head of cattle upon it senor perez bought it for a very low price as the robbers had driven away the former occupants and nobody dared live there he strengthened his buildings so that nothing but artillery could do anything against them and then he organized his men into a military force and armed and drilled them till they were excellent soldiers they were all well mounted and he had thus a force of two hundred men about him ready to start at an hour's notice by day or night when a band of robbers was heard of it was 
pursued and hunted down and no prisoners were taken in two years nearly one hundred robbers were killed by perez and his men and the country became quiet other proprietors followed his example and brought about a peaceful state of affairs that is very much the plan on which the owners of the great mills at Carataro protected themselves fred remarked and then the conversation changed to other topics there were broad fields of wheat and barley visible from the windows of the train and fred observed that the fields were separated and protected from the incursions of cattle by fences or hedges of cactus their new friend explained that it was the cheapest fence in the world to make they only had to take the long shoots of the organ cactus cut them into proper lengths and stick these lengths or sections into a trench where the fence was to be the dirt piled around the end of the sections serves to keep them in place they soon take root and grow and as they live for a hundred years or so the owner has no further trouble with them no animal larger than a rabbit can get through such a fence and it is equally impervious to a man unless armed with a hatchet senor sanchez left the train at a station about forty miles east of guadalajara the youth named a day when they would visit him and they continued their journey to the city for what they saw and did in guadalajara we will refer to fred's notebook it is a handsome city said the youth and we are not surprised to learn that it is considered next to mexico in importance it has a dozen or more fine churches and its cathedral which was completed in sixteen eighteen is one of the oldest in the country and is considered next to those of the capital and puebla in point of wealth and grandeur it occupies one side of the grand plaza has two tapering steeples and a handsome dome and altogether is well calculated to impress every beholder whatever may be his religious leanings the interior reminded us of the cathedral of mexico in a general way though the detail is greatly varied what surprised us most was the high altar which is thirty feet high and broad in proportion and as rich as carving and precious metals can make it it was made in rome and hauled here we cannot tell how over the terrible roads between this place and vera cruz some of the blocks weigh several tons and we shuddered as we thought what an expenditure of muscle human and quadrupedal must have been required to bring these masses of stone from the sea coast five hundred miles away the building has suffered from the elements the cupolas of the towers having been thrown down by an earthquake in eighteen eighteen some time in the sixties lightning struck the cathedral during service and two of the organists were killed by the shock there are many valuable paintings in the cathedral and in the vaults beneath it are the bones of the bishops and priests that have died here during the last three hundred years and more we visited several other churches and went to the great hospital of san miguel de belen which is generally known as the belen it is near the center of the city and covers or rather encloses within its walls about eight acres of ground it was founded about one hundred years ago and at one time had a very large revenue but successive revolutions and robberies have plundered it of nearly all its possessions it had an income of one million dollars a year in its best days but has barely ten or fifteen thousand at present it is the best constructed hospital edifice we ever saw and we're very sorry dr bronson is not here to see and appreciate it the buildings are only one story high so that the patients doctors and nurses have no stairs to climb and the rooms are twenty-five feet from floor to ceiling and well ventilated the thick walls and roof make the place warm in winter and cool in summer and they told us there is no artificial heating and but little change of temperature throughout the year there is another immense establishment called the hospicio de guadalajara which is an asylum rather than a hospital and an asylum for everybody it was founded about the same time as the belen hospital by some gentlemen of immense wealth and they are said to have expended eight or ten millions of dollars in building and endowing it sixteen hundred people are accommodated there from infants only a few hours old up to people who are nearing the end of a century of life it has sixteen departments that comprise an infant asylum reform school juvenile school orphan asylum deaf and dumb asylum blind asylum 
home for the aged and indigent high schools for boys and girls schools of art schools of trades workshops college and hospital we saw boys in the workshop making shoes clothes hats and other articles of wear while others were at work at carpentering and still others were setting type and working a printing press of the old-fashioned kind in the girls section there were classes in sewing knitting lace making and the like and there were classes of young women who were learning fine embroidery music and painting to fit them for governesses and families it would take too long to write down all we saw and heard and you might get tired before you read it through we couldn't help wishing that some of our very rich men would endow just such establishments in new york boston philadelphia and other large cities of the united states and take their reward in the knowledge that they had done a great deal of practical good we were told that the city has an excellent system of public education and many of its people think it is the best in the whole country there are twenty primary day schools five evening schools and two high schools or liceos one for boys and one for girls the girls high school is in an old convent which was confiscated at the time of the reform and is admirably adapted for its uses the boys high school is in an equally spacious building and the two schools have each four or five hundred pupils with a proportionate number of teachers the boys school has a library of thirty thousand volumes gathered mainly from the monasteries and convents then there are a school of arts and industries and a school of painting similar to that of san carlos though somewhat smaller they have an opera house and theatre here and of course such an enlightened city as guadalajara must have a bull ring this ring is equal to the principal one at the capital and the sport in it is liberally patronized there are four large cotton factories here and there is a considerable industry in making pottery we have mentioned elsewhere the pottery of guadalajara which is famous throughout the country and largely exported we have bought a considerable number of the clay statuettes that are sold here they represent all the industries and characters of mexico the prominent men of the country and in fact of the whole world statuettes twelve inches in height and well modeled and colored are worth about twenty-five cents each and you can buy smaller ones as low down as a cent or even half a cent apiece they offer to make busts or statuettes of frank and myself for three dollars each and have them ready in two days but we declined the proposal as for the people and the sights and scenes of the streets they are so much like what we have described elsewhere that i will not venture upon an account for fear of repetition we will say good-bye to this interesting city and return to the capital stopping a day at the hacienda of senor sanchez they kept their promise and visited that hospitable gentleman who organized a rodeo or cattle muster for their benefit the vaqueros or herdsmen rode away in different directions and after an absence of an hour or two reappeared driving numbers of cattle before them these cattle were assembled in a large drove and there was a continuous pawing bellowing and dashing here and there as long as they were together the vaqueros showed their skill in lassoing the animals seizing them by the leg or horn according to previous announcements of their intentions the performance ended with a contest of skill in picking up hats or other objects on the ground frank placed a silver dollar edgewise on the ground and half a dozen vaqueros one after the other endeavored to secure it the first second and third missed it by only a fraction of an inch the fourth tumbled it over but did not catch it it was set up again for the fifth who missed and saw the coin taken in by the sixth and last as he rode past it at a gallop their host pressed the youth to remain longer but they felt that might interfere with dr bronson's plans by doing so and therefore declined the invitation they returned to the capital without any other break in their journey and were warmly congratulated by the doctor on the good use they had made of their time End of chapter twenty two Chapter twenty three of the Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico 
by thomas wallace knox chapter twenty three it was a fortunate thing for the youth that they did not remain another day at the cattle hacienda of senora sanchez after listening to a short account of what they had seen dr bronson told them that he had a pleasurable surprise in store for the next day if it's a surprise said frank i suppose we must wait and ask no questions there's no occasion for secrecy responded the doctor the american minister has arranged for me to have an interview tomorrow with the president of the republic and you can accompany me that is a pleasurable surprise indeed said frank and fred promptly expressed a similar opinion i am to go to the legation at eleven o'clock continued dr bronson and meet the minister who is to present me to the president the interview is fixed for half past eleven at the national palace it is unnecessary to add that frank and fred were ready at the appointed time and that a carriage left the door of the hotel early enough to deposit the trio at the door of the legation a few minutes before eleven the arrival at the palace was duly arranged and the party was in the anteroom of the president when an official came to call them to an audience with the president the time of the chief of a nation is valuable and the interview was over in about twenty minutes there was nothing official about it and the visitors came away much pleased with the way they had been received the conversation ran upon general topics it related chiefly to what the strangers had seen during their visit to the country and some pleasant allusions on the part of the president to the united states and a few of its public men he did not follow the customary form of politeness by saying that his house and all it contained were theirs but as they rose to leave he shook hands with them cordially and said that if he could be of any service during the rest of their stay he hoped they would not hesitate to apply to him through his and their friend the american minister a more courteous gentleman than president diaz wrote frank it would be difficult to find and i believe this is the testimony of his opponents as well as of his friends perhaps you would like to know something about his history well here it is he fought all through the war under great discouragements was captured a second time and a second time escaped after the retirement of the french from mexico in eighteen sixty seven he rapidly increased his army and besieged and captured puebla then he laid siege to the city of mexico at the same time that maximilian was being besieged by another part of the liberal army at Querétaro. in the following autumn he was a candidate for the presidency but was defeated by juarez then he laid plans for a revolution but was unsuccessful and obliged to flee from the country he went to new orleans and after a time was permitted to return then he was concerned in another revolution and went again into exile whence he was called back by his friends who had revolted against the government in his return he ran a great risk as he was obliged to come to mexico by way of vera cruz he took passage under an assumed name and remained in his room on the steamer under pretense of being seasick when the steamer was leaving tampico he suspected that his identity had been discovered by the officers of a mexican regiment which had been taken on board at that port discovery and arrest meant execution and he jumped overboard and endeavored to swim to the shore which was about ten miles away the captain thought he was a lunatic and sent a boat after him he fought against being rescued but was taken into the boat and returned to the ship the purser took charge of him and diaz immediately told who he was and asked for protection the purser promised it the colonel of the regiment suspected that diaz was on board and in the hearing of the latter offered fifty thousand dollars for information that would lead to his capture diaz tells how his heart sank when he heard the offer and how it beat with satisfaction when the purser replied that he knew nothing about the insurgent leader the purser smuggled him on shore disguised as a coal heaver and diaz reached oaca in safety after his elevation to the presidency one of the first things he did was to appoint that purser a consul to represent mexico at a french seaport and afterwards gave him the consulship at san francisco the oaca revolution was successful lerdo who was then eighteen seventy six president was driven out of the country and there was a very disturbed state of affairs for a time it ended in the election of diaz as president 
He held the office from May 1877 till November 1880, when he was succeeded by President Gonzalez. The Constitution then in force, and originally proposed by Diaz, forbidding the President to succeed himself. He succeeded Gonzalez in 1884 for a second term of four years. In 1887, the Constitution was modified so as to permit the President to serve for a third time and in consequence of this modification, he was again elected in that year. On the 1st of December, 1888, he took the oath of office in accordance with the constitutional provisions and began his third term, which will expire December 1st, 1892. There you have a personal history boiled down. President Diaz is a thorough believer in general education and in railways, telegraphs, and other modern enterprises. In this belief, he has been bitterly opposed by the reactionary party, which is principally composed of the old aristocracy. In his first term, concessions were granted for the construction of railways by American companies, and other concessions have been made since that time. One writer, who is not particularly friendly to the president, says, Under the administration of Diaz, manufactures have increased. The resources of the country have been developed, Commerce has multiplied, education has been advanced, the revenues have been appropriated to the purposes for which they were designed. Travel is safe, bandits have been dispersed, and railroads and telegraphs are extending. And from all we can learn, this is by no means an overstatement of the case. For the benefit of his young lady friends at home, Fred added to Frank's sketch that President Diaz had been twice married, his present wife being the daughter of Honorable Romero Rubio, Secretary of the Interior. She is said to be a beauty of the brunette type, charming in manners, an accomplished linguist, speaking several languages, of which English is one, and an exquisite judge of feminine apparel. Her dresses are made by Worth, the famous man milliner of Paris, and therefore she may justly be considered the leader of fashion in the capital of Mexico. Her duties are less onerous than those of the wife of the President of the United States, as there are no receptions similar to those of the White House, and consequently the Mexican capital is free from the social ferment which is constantly going on in Washington. Dr. Bronson added a note to the effect that there was a considerable amount of diplomacy in the marriage of President Diaz with his present wife. Her father was one of the leaders of the church party, and the marriage strengthened Diaz with the conservatives by making them less hostile to him and his policy. The party was further conciliated when Senor Rubio became Secretary of the Interior, and other members of the old opposition were provided with places under the government. But though the hostility of the church party has been diminished, it still exists. Its leaders are ready to take advantage of any mistake of the government and if they could again obtain control, they would speedily overthrow the present Constitution, whose authority they have never acknowledged. The hostility of the two political parties in Mexico to each other, added the doctor, is far greater than that between the two great parties of the United States. The Liberal Party in Mexico believes in general education, in the construction of railways, the encouragement of manufacturing, and other commercial enterprises, and a complete separation of church and state. The clerical party believes in the condition of affairs which existed before 1858, in a union of church and state, and the control of education by the church. And it has been a steady and consistent opponent of the railways that connect Mexico with the United States. It looks with alarm upon the present influx of foreigners and the adoption of their ideas by the Mexicans. It is proper to add that this alarm is shared by many adherents of the Liberal Party, who fear that their country is being denationalized and will some day be gathered into the fold of the United States. Frank and Fred examined the Constitution of Mexico and found that it had many points of resemblance to that of the United States. Each of the states has the right to manage its own local affairs, but all are bound together for general governmental purposes. The central government consists of legislative, judicial, and executive branches, as in the United States. The president is the executive head, and the Senate and House of Representatives form the legislative branches. 
there are two senators for each state and one representative for every 40,000 inhabitants. Senators and representatives alike receive $3,000 a year. Congress meets on April 1st and September 16th, and each of its sessions lasts two months. During the interim between the sessions, a permanent committee of both houses remains at the Capitol. Representatives must be 25 years of age and senators 30 years, and both must be residents of the states they represent. All religions are tolerated, but no ecclesiastical body is allowed to acquire landed property. Regarding the Army and Navy, Fred wrote as follows. The President is Commander-in-Chief of the Military and Naval Forces, just as he is in the United States. According to the official figures, the war footing of the Army comprises 3,700 officers and 160,963 men. These are divided into 131,523 infantry, 25,790 dragoons, and 3,650 artillerymen. On a peace footing, the Army includes about 30,000 men, men of all arms of the service, including the rurals who keep the brigands in order, as we have described elsewhere. A friend at my elbow says the officers are almost as numerous as the privates, and he has known a garrison where there were 29 officers and only 27 soldiers. The Navy won't take long to describe, as it contains three small gunboats and two larger ones. The small gunboats each carry one 20-pound gun, and the larger boats two guns of the same caliber. They are unarmored vessels, are not fast, and from all we can learn, we don't think the Navy of the United States need have any fear of that of Mexico at any rate after we complete some of the ships we are now building while we are considering public matters wrote frank let us look at the postal department there are about twelve hundred post offices in the republic or one for every eight thousand seven hundred fifty inhabitants in the united states we have a post office for every twelve hundred inhabitants or seven times as many as mexico in proportion to the population the number of pieces of mail matter handled in a year in Mexico is an average of two to each inhabitant, while in the United States the average is 51. The Mexican males are increasing in importance every year and will continue to do so as the people become better educated. The extension of the railways causes many new post offices to be established and also many telegraph offices. There are more than 20,000 miles of telegraph and 500 telegraph offices. 14,000 miles of telegraph belong to the government, and the remaining portion is the property of private companies, railways, and individuals. If you want an example of progress, look at the railways. Mexico had 379 miles of iron roads in 1879, while in 1887 it had 3,962 miles open for traffic including 92 miles of city and suburban lines. The length of railway completed and in operation at the end of 1888 was something more than 4,600. Competent authorities say that by the end of 1889, the length of railways in operation in Mexico will exceed 5,000 miles. A great many concessions of railways have been granted by the government for lines that are not likely to be constructed in the life of the present generation. At one time, there seemed to be a mania for railway concessions, and the holder of a permission to build a line over an impracticable route between two insignificant points believed that he would be able to sell it for a fortune to an English or American corporation. Newspapers and other publications have increased in the last few years, but not as rapidly as have the railways. The number is constantly changing, new publications being started and old ones discontinued, and sometimes the starting and discontinuance are very close together, as is the case in other parts of the world. Altogether, there are about 300 newspapers in the Republic, and of this number, fully one-third are published in the capital. Mexico City has as many newspapers as New York or Chicago in proportion to its population but their circulation is not by any means as large. Mexican publishers are not obliged to stretch their consciences 
by making affidavits every morning as to the hundreds of thousands of copies they printed on the previous day or the hogsheads of ink they used for each edition but though they may not print and sell as many copies as the new york dailies it is certain that the mexican papers are steadily gaining in circulation and influence and the future is full of promise for them the capital city has a daily paper called the two republics which is printed in english it is specially interesting to strangers as it has a list of the things and places they wish to see and contains timetables of the railways sometimes it has special dispatches from the united states and other parts of the outside world but as it has no competitor and its circulation could not be greatly increased by a large expenditure it wisely studies economy to an extent that would not succeed in new york there's a weekly paper called the mexican financier printed in english and spanish it circulates all over the world and is an excellent authority for everything relating to railways banking and commercial matters in general the financier discusses important questions relating to the affairs of the government attacks abuses of every kind and suggests ways in which the prosperity of the country and the welfare of the people may be improved the french population is large enough to have a daily paper in its own language and the germans have a weekly one there are twelve or fifteen dailies in spanish and they represent all shades of politics generally it pays better for a newspaper to be on the side of the government than against it but some of the opposition papers are profitable and edited with much ability the style of opposition writing here is to attack very savagely and sometimes the editors find themselves in prison on account of the bitterness of their editorials and their sweeping charges against public men and measures some of the editorials we have read since we came here surpass anything in new york or chicago papers in the heat of political campaigns and that is saying a great deal the editor-in-chief of el monitor republicano served a sentence of seven months in the penitentiary for a too free use of his pen he was charged with exciting sedition he was ably defended and his case was carried to the highest court in the country which affirmed the decree of the lower courts you couldn't remember them all if we should give a list of the daily papers in mexico and so we refrain still worse off would you be with the names of thirty or more weekly papers and as many monthlies and other periodicals you can find publications here on almost any topic that one could name and you can find an abundance of romances at least that is what they tell us the popular novels deal mostly with mexican life manners and history a friend tells us that we should read guadalupe by irenio paz calvario y tabor by vincente riva palacio and pasejas y leyendes by ignacio manuel altimirano the first is a novel describing mexican home scenes and life the second is chiefly concerned with the reign of maximilian and the sufferings of the people during the foreign invasion and the third is an account of the manners and customs of the mexican people in former times and at present we intend to get these books and read them at our leisure on the way home the delightful and interesting visit of our friends to the mexican capital came to an end as all things must farewell calls were made upon friends and acquaintances and early one morning the trio left the hotel for the station of the mexican railway as the line from the capital to veracruz is called the daily passenger train leaves at six thirty a m and reaches veracruz or rather is due there at seven thirty three p m the distance is two hundred sixty three miles and there is a branch line to puebla twenty nine miles in length the manager of the hotel told our friends that it was advisable for them to procure tickets and check their trunks in the afternoon preceding their departure else there might be mistakes and consequent delay in getting away assisted by one of the runners of the hotel frank attended to these formalities and completed them to his entire satisfaction tickets were taken to puebla and baggage checked to that place the trunks were carefully weighed and all exceeding thirty-three pounds to each passenger 
was heavily charged for. Frank remarked that evidently the managers of the line were not running it for fun, but to make money. And well they may, said an American gentleman who was talking with the doctor when the youth returned from the station. This line of railway is one of the most expensive in the world, he continued, partly in consequence of the difficult engineering over the mountains and partly by reason of the wastefulness of its builders. According to the report of the Minister of Finance, its total cost was $36,319,526, or at the rate of more than $123,000 per mile. It was built with English capital aided by Mexican subsidies. It was sprung in 1852, though there had been a concession for a line as early as 1837. The concession included a government subsidy, and one of the conditions was that construction should be pushed from both ends of the line towards the middle. This necessitated the transportation to the city of Mexico of rails, locomotives, cars, and all sorts of building material over the old diligence road. The transport of these things gave employment to great numbers of men and animals, but increased the cost enormously, probably twice what it would have otherwise been. The work was suspended several times by revolutions, wars, lack of funds, change of government, and other obstacles, and the line was not completed until the end of 1872. It was inaugurated by President Lerdo on the 1st of January, 1873, having been solemnly blessed by the Archbishop of Mexico the previous day. When you see the section between Boca del Monte and Orizaba, where the railway descends 4,000 feet in 25 miles, with numerous curves of 300 feet radius and gradients of 3 or 4 percent, you will not wonder that a great deal of money was expended in crossing the mountains. While the surveys were being made, it was frequently necessary to lower the engineers by means of ropes over the precipices, and the workmen were often suspended in this way until they could cut deep enough into the side of the mountain to obtain a foothold. There was not much of interest along the railway line as the train rolled out of the capital. Our friends found themselves skirting Lake Tezcoco, and they had a near and farewell view of the famous church of Guadalupe. In order to avoid heavy grades, the railway takes a circuitous course and is much longer than the wagon road connecting the capital with Puebla. For many miles it is bordered on both sides by fields of maguey. Frank and Fred estimated that the acres of maguey plants they had seen since entering the country were sufficient to supply pulk enough for a population three times as large as that of the Republic at the present time. As they neared Apizaco, they saw some changes in the general aspect of the country, but it was still the Tierra Fria, or cold region, in which they had been so long sojourning. At Apizaco, they changed to another train which took them over the branch line to Puebla, landing them at the station of that city at the hour of noon. They sought the Hotel Diligencias and found it a comfortable establishment from a Mexican point of view. Puebla is a city of 70,000 inhabitants. It is old and wealthy, and its cathedral is one of the finest in Mexico. Some do not hesitate to give it higher rank than the cathedral of the capital. Our friends went the usual round of sightseeing in the city, and according to custom, one of the first things they saw was the cathedral. Stop a moment, said Frank. The cathedral was not the first object to attract our attention. Our eyes had been fixed upon the great volcano, Popocatepetl, and his white sister. They are in full view from the city and much nearer than at Mexico, so that they are far more impressive. Then, too, we had a view of the noble peak of Orizaba, of which we shall have more to say later on. Puebla has so many churches, continued Frank, that you can't expect us to visit all of them. We went to the cathedral, which was consecrated in 1649, and therefore is a venerable building. Additions have been made to it at various times since then, and within the last two or three years, a handsome monument to Pope Pio Nono has been erected on the terrace on which the cathedral stands. The building has two fine towers. We climbed to the top of one of them 
and had a fine view. Fred and I did the climbing while the doctor remained below. You can judge the richness of the interior when I tell you that the high altar cost more than $110,000. There are 18 bells in the tower, the largest of them weighing 9 tons, and an inscription on the tower tells that this large bell cost $100,000. The chapels abound in sculpture and paintings, and if we should make a list of them, without any comment whatever, I am afraid you would find it too long for patient perusal. The cathedral is 323 feet long by 100 wide and occupies an imposing position which is well calculated to impress the beholder. We visited two other churches, the San Francisco and La Compania, and found them well worth the time we devoted to them, and a great deal more than we could spare. Our guide showed us the ruins of the covered way to the Inquisition, for Puebla, no less than the city of Mexico, had a branch of this institution of the church. Puebla has always been noted as a religious city. It was founded as an antidote to heathen Cholula, which is only a few miles away, and its full name is Puebla de Los Angeles, Town of the Angels. Before the laws of the reform went into force, four-fifths of the valuation of real estate and other property in Puebla belonged to the church, and one-fifth to private individuals. Puebla has extensive manufacture of cotton cloth, glassware, and pottery. Like Guadalajara, it is famous for its pottery, and it is also famous for glazed tiles, which have been liberally used for ornamenting the houses, both inside and out. Domes of churches and their outer and inner walls are covered with these tiles, and the same is the case with many private buildings. The effect is very pretty, though sometimes too gaudy for our taste. But then, you know, the Mexicans are fond of color. Another famous manufacturer of Puebla is braided straw work. Baskets and mats were offered to us in great quantity and variety, and we found them so pretty that we invested a handful of dollars in these articles. They will come in very well at Christmas time for friends whom we wish to remember. The city has a plaza market, a Zocala, an Alameda, and a Paseo, just like any and every Mexican city. We gave a glance at them and then went to the battleground of the Cinco de Mayo, 5th of May, 1862. It is on the hill of Guadalupe, and from one point we have a view of three snow-covered volcanoes, together with a fourth mountain that just barely misses reaching the snow line. A much more important battle than that of the Cinco de Mayo was fought here, April 2, 1867, when General Porfirio Diaz, now president, stormed Puebla and captured the imperial garrison. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of the Boy Travelers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by J. Thurgood The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 24 In the height of its glory, said Fred, Puebla contained more than 90 churches. In 1869, it had 60 churches, 9 monasteries, 21 collegiate houses, 13 nunneries, and numerous chapels and shrines. The confiscation of ecclesiastical property has reduced the number of the churches to little more than 20, abolished the nunneries and all the monasteries except two, which are really hospitals or almshouses for old and disabled priests. Some of the confiscated buildings have been sold for private uses, and others converted into schools, hospitals, libraries, and other government establishments for local, state, or general government use. Dr. Bronson had a letter of introduction to the superintendent of the Hospital de Dementes, or Insane Asylum, which is in the building that was formerly the nunnery of Santa Rosa. We accompanied the doctor when he went to deliver the letter, and were politely received and shown through the establishment. The hospital appears to be well managed, and Dr. Bronson was much interested in it. Of course, the building was particularly attractive to Frank and myself, as we wanted to see how the nuns were lodged in the olden times. 
They certainly had a most delightful home so far as the eye was concerned, and I don't wonder that the nunneries in Mexico were popular among the women. The decorations everywhere were of beautiful tiles, the courts in their walls, the walls of rooms, the ceilings, the oratories, the bathrooms, and even the kitchens and cooking stoves were all covered with finely painted and glazed tiles. It is easy to keep such rooms clean, and we certainly have never seen a cleaner and neater building anywhere. We did not ask whether the attractions of the place had any beneficial effect upon the insane patients, but certainly they ought to have. From all we could observe, the city is admirably provided with hospitals, schools, and asylums, and no doubt the fact that so many suitable buildings were ready at hand had something to do with their number. Then, too, the church had made liberal provision for the sick and suffering, and the government here, as in other cities, had the good sense not to undo the philanthropic work which was so long carried on under religious auspices. In the general hospital, half the patients are treated by allopathy and half by homeopathy. The advocates of either system can readily demonstrate its superiority over the other, as they can in other countries besides Mexico. Every visitor to Puebla should go to Cholula, and particularly to its Great Pyramid, which is, in some respects, the most remarkable edifice on the American continent. In point of fact, very few visitors fail to see it, and many of them go to Cholula before doing anything else. It is an easy excursion, wrote Frank, as Cholula is only six or seven miles from Puebla and can be reached by a tramway which deposits you at the very foot of the Great Pyramid. A special car for 16 persons or a smaller number can be had for $10, and it is as much subject to your orders as a private carriage would be. As we were three instead of 16, we decided to go in the ordinary way, paying 50 cents each for the round trip. The cars afford a fine view, and altogether we greatly enjoyed the excursion. We took a guide from the hotel, and he called our attention to the various buildings and other objects, of which there were so many that they are considerably confused in our recollection. We crossed the Atoyac Valley, which abounds in fields of grain and is dotted with ruined churches and monasteries, one of the latter having been converted into an iron foundry and another into a cotton mill. There is an old Spanish bridge crossing the Atoyac River, and the Mexicans have shown their ability to utilize the water power of the stream by building several mills upon it. We had not gone far before our eyes took in the mound, or pyramid, of Cholula, and also the great volcanoes of Popocatepetl and the white woman all in one view. The mound did not seem insignificant, although backed by these great mountains. They are thirty miles away, though they seem much nearer, while the pyramid is close upon our horizon and steadily swells into the sky as we approach it. This is a good place for a bit of history. Cholula was an important city and covered a large area when Cortes came to Mexico. Under the conquerors, it had at one time fifty churches and other ecclesiastical buildings, but now it has dwindled to a population of less than 5,000, and most of its former edifices are in ruins. The Great Pyramid is the principal monument of the Aztecs, and, in fact, it is the best preserved of their monuments today in all Mexico. For a picture of what it was when Cortes looked from its summit, we have read with great interest the description in Prescott's history. Here it is. Nothing could be more grand than the view which met the eye from the truncated summit of the pyramid. Towards the north stretched the bold barrier of porphyry rock, which nature has reared around the valley of Mexico, with the huge Popocatepetl and Iztaccíhuatl standing like two sentinels to guard the entrance of this enchanted region. Far away to the south was seen the conical head of Orizaba, soaring high into the clouds and nearer the barren, though beautifully shaped, Sierra de Malinche, throwing its broad shadows over the plains of Tlaxcala. Three of these volcanoes, higher than the highest peak in Europe, and shrouded in snows which never melt under the fierce sun of the tropics at the foot of the spectator, the sacred city of Cholula, with its bright towers and pinnacles sparkling in the sun, reposing amidst gardens and verdant groves. Such was the magnificent prospect which met the eye of the conquerors, and may still, with slight change, meet that of the modern traveler as he stands on the broad plateau of the pyramid, and his eye wanders over the fairest portion of the beautiful plateau of Puebla. 
we are quite willing to adopt Prescott's description for our own, as the scene is the same today as in the time of Cortes, except that there is little left of the sacred city of Cholula, with its spires and pinnacles, its gardens and verdant groves. The pyramid is a stupendous structure and worthy a place by the side of the great pyramids of Egypt. It was long thought to be a natural mound, but all the excavations that have been made in it show that it is an artificial work, built by time and patience and the muscle of many thousands of men. Its interior is of earth, and its exterior was once stone and adobe, but time has covered much of the outside with earth, in which trees, grass, and bushes have taken root and grown luxuriantly. The car stopped at the foot of the pyramid, and there we alighted. There is a sloping road leading to the summit. It was built by the Spaniards, and in its construction, much of the old masonry was removed. We ascended partly by this road and partly by steps, pausing several times on the way in order to rest and take in the ever-changing view. We did not take the measurements of the mound and therefore must give you the figures of others. Humboldt says the mound is 1,400 feet square, covering 45 acres of ground and 160 feet high. Another authority makes it 177 feet high and 1,425 feet square. Another, and probably the most exact measurement, gives the following figures. North line, 1,000 feet. East line, 1,026 feet. South line, 833 feet. And west line, 1,000 feet. The summit is a platform or plateau measuring 203 by 144 feet and having an area of not far from one acre. This plateau has a stone parapet around it and there is a chapel in the center. The mound was evidently built in four stories, like some of the oldest pyramids of Egypt. But they are less distinct than the stories or stages of the famous Pyramid of Saqqara on the banks of the Nile, which is said to have been built by the children of Israel during their captivity. The sides of the pyramid correspond to the cardinal points of the compass, north, south, east, and west, and in this respect the structure resembles the Great Pyramid of Cheops. Nobody can tell when it was built. The Aztecs found it here when they came, and the Indians, whom they conquered, said it was not the work of their ancestors. The Aztecs dedicated it to their god, Quetzalcoatl, and every year they sacrificed on the summit of the mound thousands of victims in the manner we have described in our account of Tenochtitlan. When the Spaniards came here, they found a statue of the Aztec deity on the place where the chapel now stands. One of the first acts of Cortes was to destroy the statue and order the erection of a church in its place. In his reports to the king, Cortes said the city of Cholula contained 20,000 houses and the suburbs as many more. The people received him kindly, but he learned, or pretended to learn, that they were plotting against him. So he called a meeting of all the dignitaries under pretense of a consultation. And when they were assembled, he ordered a general massacre. 6,000 of the people were slain, and for two days the city was given over to be pillaged by the Spaniards and their allies the Tlaxcalans, who were bitter enemies of the Cholulans. The Tlaxcalans were, of course, gratified with the slaughter and pillage, but Cortes offended them deeply when he refused to permit the sacrifice of the prisoners captured in the affair. We remained nearly two hours on the summit of the mound enjoying the magnificent view and trying to picture the place as it was in and before the days of Cortes and shuddering as we thought of the blood that had been shed there in sacrifices and by the swords of the conquerors. Fred made a sketch of the view and then we descended and looked through the village which contained very little of interest. Next we took a Mexican dinner at the Fonda de la Reforma, a small but clean restaurant on the Plaza Mayor. The plaza is as large as that of the capital city, but so little used that it is grass-covered in many places. There were few people there when we saw it, but they told us that it is quite lively on market day when everybody in the town comes there. There is a socala in the center of the plaza, but it offered so few attractions that we did not visit it. We strolled through the ruined churches, and our guide told us that one of them, the Capilla Real, which consists of three churches in one, was built for the especial accommodation of the Indians. The massacre which Cortes ordered is supposed to have begun on the plaza, but no one knows the exact spot. The natives have a tradition that there are vast amounts of treasure concealed in the pyramid of Cholula, 
and we remark that this tradition seems to prevail concerning old structures in all parts of the world. We heard it in Egypt, India, Japan, China, Palestine, and other countries, and presume we shall continue to hear it wherever we go until we give up traveling and settle down to home life. Mr. Brocklehurst tells a good story about a priest who once learned through the confessional that one of his parishioners had discovered the cave where Montezuma's treasures were hidden. He explains that there is a belief common through Mexico that at the time of the invasion Montezuma hid all his treasures, and afterwards he and his high priest put to death all that assisted in the hiding, so that only they too should possess the secret. The priest persuaded the Indian to show him the cave, but it was only on the condition that he should be blindfolded while going to it. The priest thought to outwit the Indian, and so he managed to drop the beads from his rosary one by one as he walked along. In fact, he had provided himself with several rosaries so that he would have beads enough for the road. The priest saw the treasures in the cave, and then walked home blindfolded as he had come. When home was reached, the Indian remarked to his reverence, You had the misfortune to break your rosary and drop the beads on the road. I picked them up, and if you count them, you'll find they're all here. And to this day, no white man has found out where those treasures are concealed. Secrets are preserved generation after generation by these people. There may or may not be any treasures of Montezuma in the caves around Mexico. But if the Indians know of their existence and the place of their concealment and believe it their duty not to reveal the hiding place, nothing can ever wring the secret from them. Persuasion, threats, punishment, torture have been tried repeatedly upon these primitive people, but all to no purpose. There is a document among the records of Tlaxcala, which says a tribe of Tlaxcalans brought in large quantities of gold dust and gave to the church enough to make and pay for the crown of the Virgin of Guadalupe. The Spaniards tried to find out whence it was obtained, but the Indians would not reveal the locality of the placer. Losing all patience, they tied up several of the Indians and flogged them within an inch of their lives. The Indians bore the pain without a murmur, and within a week the whole tribe left for Guatemala and with them, all who knew the location of the placer. To this day, it has not been revealed. From Puebla, our friends went to Tlaxcala, which is interesting on account of its connection with the conquest of Mexico by Cortés. According to history and legend, it was an important city when Cortés landed at Veracruz. Now it has barely 4,000 inhabitants, and the greater part of its public buildings have disappeared. When Montezuma learned of the approach of Cortés, he asked permission to send ambassadors to him through Tlaxcala, which was then at war with the Mexicans. The crafty Tlaxcalans gave the desired permission, but at the same time dispatched an embassy to negotiate an alliance with the Spaniards and join hands with them in subjugating the Mexicans. Of course, this was exactly what Cortés wished, and the treaty was made before Montezuma could be heard from. We went by the morning train towards Apisaco, said Fred and stopped at the station of Santa Ana, 19 miles from Puebla. There we found a tram car, which carried us to our destination, three or four miles from the line of the railway. It took us through the curious and sleepy little town of Santa Ana, where not even the dogs showed any signs of activity, with the exception of one that was biting a flea. Then we passed some ruined churches, went at full speed into the valley of the Atoyac, passed another town whose name I've forgotten, and pulled up at Tlaxcala in front of the hotel, where we expected to have breakfast and pass the night. It was not a prepossessing hotel, but we thought it might be endured for our brief stay. The result was better than we anticipated, as the food, thoroughly Mexican, proved toothsome, and the beds were hard enough to get us up early in the morning without any summons from a night porter. The state legislature was in session, for Tlaxcala is the capital of the state of the same name which happens to be the smallest commonwealth of the Mexican Union. We looked in upon the meeting and found the members seated in two rows, facing each other. There were eight of them, and all were smoking as unconcernedly as though in their own homes. Dr. Bronson told us that smoking is permissible at all times in the Mexican Congress, and therefore the state legislatures only follow the example which is set by the higher body. At one end of the hall is a railing which shuts off a space for the president and his secretaries, and close by the rail there is a tribune where the members stand when making speeches. After looking at the legislature and listening for a few minutes to a discussion relative to an appropriation for making a road from somewhere to somewhere else, we looked at the curiosities in the legislative building 
which seems to be quite a museum in its way. They showed us the banner which Cortés carried in his conquest of Mexico and afterwards presented to the Tlaxcalans in acknowledgment of the great services they had rendered him. It is about ten feet long and forked or swallow-tailed at the end. The fine and heavy silk of which it is made was once a beautiful crimson, but it has faded to the complexion of a decoction of badly made coffee, and the tassels and cords are somewhat frayed and worn. Considerable sums of money have been offered for this banner on behalf of Spain, but the Tlaxcalans have refused all propositions for its sale. We saw also the grant of arms to the city signed by Charles V of Spain, and the city charter bearing the signature of Philip II, and dated at Barcelona, May 10th, 1585. There is a mass of official documents all of great age that we had no time to examine, but which would be of great interest to a student of Mexican history. They showed us the treasure chest, which had four locks, and it was explained that anciently the city was ruled by four chiefs, each of whom had a key to one of the locks. Each of these chiefs had a palace of his own, and when the Spaniards came they destroyed the palaces and erected churches upon their sites. Time is destroying the churches, and only their ruins remain to show where the palaces were. One of the documents preserved here is the Spanish translation of an order commanding that 80,000 picked men should march with Cortés against Mexico. Cortés personally gave orders for the translation of this historic paper. In the same room is the war drum of the Tlaxcalans, a hollow log, two and a half feet long, and six or eight inches in thickness, and covered with curious carvings. The object of greatest interest to us was the first Christian church and the first Christian pulpit erected on American soil. They told us that the structure now standing is the original one built by order of Cortés. It is in good preservation and evidently has been well cared for. On the pulpit is an inscription which relates that the church was the first erected in New Spain. Not far from the pulpit is the font in which the four chiefs of Tlaxcala were baptized in 1520. It is cut from a single block of black lava, resembles a huge bowl, and is of very creditable workmanship. The portraits of these four chiefs are preserved in the legislative building, and each of them has Señor Don prefixed to his Indian name. Other portraits are in the same building, and there are many paintings in the church, but few that we saw possess any merit beyond that of an ordinary tavern sign. While we were strolling about the town, continued Fred, we saw some Indians coming in from the mountains with logs of wood, which were to be cut into planks, and beams already shaped and finished. We judged that these timbers weighed not less than 400 pounds apiece, and some of them little, if any, below 500 pounds. They carried these timbers as they carry most other burdens, slung over their backs and supported by straps crossing their foreheads. These are the descendants of the people that carried over the mountains the timber for the brigantines of Cortés, which he launched on Lake Tezcoco and used for the reduction of Tenochtitlan. We examined a beam that one of the carriers had placed on the ground, and found it to be of hard pine, twenty feet long, ten inches wide, and six inches thick. You may make your own calculation as to its weight, if you think our estimate's too high. There are several old churches in Tlaxcala in addition to the one we have mentioned, and we visited some of them more to pass away the time than with the expectation of finding anything of interest. In the afternoon, we went to the shrine of Ocatlan, which is on a hill a mile or more from the Grand Plaza. This, we learned, was similar to the Church of Guadalupe near the capital, as it commemorates the miraculous appearance of the Virgin to a poor, ignorant, but benevolent Indian named Juan Diego in the years not long after the conquest. The shrine is mostly of modern construction and is greatly revered by the Indians, who come here in large numbers from all the surrounding country. The party spent the night at Tlaxcala and left the place in season to connect with the train from Puebla, which meets the downward train at Apisaco from Mexico for Veracruz. Their trunks went by the train of the previous day and were waiting for them in care of the Apisaco station master. They had an abundance of time for breakfast at the junction. The through trains stopped there 20 minutes for meals and our travelers arrived fully a quarter of an hour in advance of the train by which they were to depart. Apisaco is 86 miles from the city of Mexico. For the next 60 miles of the journey, there was nothing of special interest along the route, which traverses the tableland at an elevation of nearly 8,000 feet above the sea. The highest point on the line is at the siding of Ococotlan, 
between the stations of Guadalupe and Soltepec, where the elevation is 8,333 feet. At Esperanza, near the edge of the Great Plateau, 152 miles from Mexico City, the barometer shows a height of 7,900 feet. Here they met the up train from Veracruz, which had left that city at 5.30 a.m. and was due in the capital at 7.30 p.m. Just beyond Esperanza, the train reached Boca del Monte, or Mouth of the Mountain. And here began the descent to the Tierra Caliente. What our young friends saw in this descent will be told in the next chapter. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chris Bins. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 25 The plateau terminates suddenly at Boca del Monte, and here begins the descent of the Cumbres. At Esperanza, the train exchanged the ordinary locomotive for a monster one of great power. It looked like two locomotives placed end-to-end -end with a tender between them, and was specially built to take the trains over the extraordinary grades on this part of the road. High speed was out of the question, or at all events dangerous, and in descending the slope, the train moved not faster than 15 miles an hour. The schedule time of the ascent is 12 miles an hour, and the Brobdingnagian locomotive is taxed to the utmost of its ability. Frank learned from one of the officials of the road that there are no fewer than 148 bridges between Veracruz and Mexico and on the branch to Puebla. These bridges are of various lengths, the longest being the Puente de Solidad, which measures 742 feet. The longest of the tunnels is 350 feet, and there are 15 tunnels in all. Nowhere else in the world, wrote Frank, have we seen finer engineering work than on this railway. It reminded us of the railway from Bombay to Pune in India, the line from Colombo to Kandy in Ceylon, and the St. Gothard and Semmering railways in the Alps. We looked down from dizzy heights where the train would have been ground to atoms had it rolled from the track into the abysses below. We crept along the edges of precipices, or in niches cut in perpendicular walls of rock. We crossed deep chasms upon slender bridges. We darted into tunnels in rapid succession, and swept around curves so sharp that it seemed as though the brakeman on the rear of the train might have shaken hands with the engine driver. We looked into the beautiful valley of Maltrata, which lay spread far below us, a gem of floral and arboreal beauty among the rugged hills. And we wound and turned among the sinuosities of the track so that our locomotive faced to all points of the compass a dozen times over in a single hour. In a direct distance of two and a half miles as the bird flies, the railway goes 20 miles. Looking down, we saw the track far beneath our level, and looking up we could trace its zigzags along the slopes and precipices. It was the railway passage of the Alps, the Caucasus, the Sierra Nevadas, the Indian Gout, and the Blue Mountains of Australia, all in one. We stopped a few minutes at the station of Maltrata, which is on an artificial platform that was built up from the slope. It was originally intended as a passing point for the up and down trains, and for several years after the completion of the line, the daily trains each way met at Maltrata. From this point onward, the descent was as rapid as before. The locomotive held the train back instead of pulling it, and the brakes kept up a continual grinding against the wheels. We shuddered to think what would have been the result if the brakes had given way and the locomotive failed to restrain us. But in such an event, our agony would have been brief, as the whole business would have been ended in a few minutes. They told us that once, when a freight train was climbing the mountain, two of the rear wagons became detached and started down the slope. Fortunately, there was no one on these wagons to lose his life. They jumped the track at one of the curves and were dashed a thousand feet or more down a steep hillside into a rocky valley. A little distance below Matrata, we skirted one side of the Barranca del Infernillo, 
a great chasm which made our heads swim as we looked into it. Twelve miles from Maltrata, we reached Orizaba, where we had arranged to spend a day, and therefore we left the train as it drew up at the station. We observed a change in the vegetation as we descended the slope. We had left the Tierra Fria behind us, and were now in the Tierra Templada, or temperate region. The maguey and cactus gave way to darker and richer verdure, which was certainly far more pleasing to the eye than the scanty vegetation of the Great Plateau. Orizaba is 4,000 feet above sea level, 181 miles from the capital of the Republic, and 82 from Veracruz. It has 20,000 inhabitants, and is a favourite resort of the people of Veracruz in the hot and sickly season. We expected to have a fine view of the peak of Orizaba from the town of the same name, but in this we were disappointed, as there is no part of the great volcano visible from here, except a thin strip of white over the top of a nearer and lower mountain. Even this strip cannot be seen from all parts of the town, but only by climbing to the roof of the hotel or the tower of one of the churches. Dr. Bronson asked if we wished to ascend the peak of Orizaba. We gave a prompt negative to his question, partly for the reason that his plans would not permit us to stay here long enough, and partly because the sensation was pretty well exhausted at Popo Catapetl. The ascent is quite as difficult as that of old Popo. Orizaba is a beautiful peak, shaped like a sugarloaf, and wearing constantly a mantle of purest snow upon its regular and beautiful cone. According to Humboldt, it is 17,378 feet high. A party of American officers ascended it in 1848. Three years later, a Frenchman named Douagnon followed their example and found the flagstaff they left there, with the torn fragments of the American flag which marked their visit. There was a town here at the time of the conquest, and Cortes left a small garrison to hold it when he pushed on to Mexico. It has an agreeable climate, but the frequent rains and the mist from the gulf keeping it well moistened, so that the trees, plants and green things generally are in a high state of luxuriance. Coffee and tobacco are grown here in large quantities. The town has quite a manufacturing industry, and contains the repair and construction shops of the railway company. We greatly enjoyed a stroll through the streets, which seemed rather dull and sleepy after those of the capital. Most of the houses are covered with red tiles, which give the city a very picturesque appearance when it is looked upon from the heights surrounding it. Like all old towns of Mexico, it has an abundant supply of churches, and the inhabitants are mostly of the Catholic faith. Not many years ago, it was unsafe for a Protestant woman to appear on the streets wearing a hat or bonnet of foreign make. She was liable to be pelted with mud and stones, and her life was by no means out of danger. A milder feeling prevails at present, and the old bigotry is steadily passing away. We made a pleasant excursion in the environs of the city, which are very attractive owing to the luxuriance of the vegetation. Fields of coffee, tobacco, sugarcane, oranges and bananas alternate with each other and show the mildness of the climate of Orizaba. Some of the plantations are of great extent, and we received many invitations to make a leisurely visit and spend whatever time we liked in their examination. One of the sights of the place, which we were told not to omit, were the falls of the Rincón Grande, about three miles from the city. We did not omit the falls, and will always hold them in pleasant recollection. The Rio de Agua Blanco, which supplied the water for the falls, is a deep and swift stream coming from the mountains to the eastward of Orizaba, Much of its course is through a deep canyon, but where the falls begin, a part of the river flows along the surface of the mesa, which forms one side of the ravine and breaks over the side to join the main stream below. The fall is perhaps 50 feet from top to bottom, and a cloud of mist rises like that from Niagara or Montmorency. Both sides of the fall are bordered with a luxuriance of tropical verdure rendered especially luxuriant by the moisture from the plunging waters. The trees are covered with bunches of Spanish moss, some of them several feet in length, and by numerous parasitical plants, nearly all gaudy with flowers. 
Some of the trees are so completely in the grasp of the parasites that hardly anything of the original trunk or limbs can be seen. They showed us one tree that had been killed by the parasites. The wood had decayed and crumbled, and the vines were so thick where it had stood that they remained erect as though unaware that their former support had passed away. We saw the falls from above and also from below, and while both views were interesting, each had an especial beauty of its own. The shrubbery was so dense that we could walk only in the paths that had been cut for the purpose, and the growth of vegetation is so rapid that these paths require to be trimmed out several times a year. There is no possibility of straying from the path, for the simple reason that it is impossible to proceed in the dense undergrowth except by the aid of a machete. Though at an elevation of 4,000 feet above the sea, Orizaba has a tropical climate, its location places it in the Tierra Templada, but its temperature and characteristics would seem to include it in the Tierra Caliente, and not only its temperature, but its mosquitoes give it a tropical character, as they are of the kind with which the traveller in equatorial regions has a disagreeable familiarity. There's a pretty river flowing through the Orizaba, and it is useful to the inhabitants in many ways. When we saw it, there was not much water in its bed, but they tell us that at some periods it is a rushing torrent of great force and volume. It turns several mills, and is the resort of the women whose duty it is to cleanse the soiled linen of the rest of the inhabitants. Laundry work here is about as it is in the rest of Mexico, and the rough handling of shirts and garments by the lavanderous converts them into rags in a very short time. This is good for the cotton factories of Orizaba, which turn out a fair quality of goods, but are said to be unprofitable for their owners. We have better reports of the flouring mills here, and also of a paper mill which was established by an American several years ago. As the Mexicans become better educated, the demand for paper is likely to increase, at present, it does not take a large number of mills to supply their wants in this respect. The people of this city are less eager to point out the hill of El Borrego than are the Pueblans to indicate the scene of the Battle of Cinco de Mayo. The latter was a Mexican victory, while the Battle of Borrego was a disastrous defeat. Four or five thousand Mexicans were surprised and put to flight by a few hundred French troops. The French say there were not over 100 in the attacking party. It was a night surprise, and the French had all the advantages of a nocturnal assault. In justice to the Mexicans, it should be added that the assailants were old soldiers, while the surprised army was composed of raw recruits, who are proverbially easy to throw into a panic, especially in the darkness. The same troops made a good record for themselves later in the war. From Orizaba, our friends continued their railway journey into the Tierra Caliente, passing Fortín and Córdoba, the latter the centre of a coffee-growing district of considerable importance. A German gentleman who had a coffee estate near Córdoba was in the carriage with Dr. Bronson and the youths and gave them some account of the industry. Fred made notes of his remarks and afterwards wrote them out in full with the following result. Cordoba is less important now than it has been, owing to the decline in the prices of sugar and coffee. It was founded in the early part of the 17th century, and for a long time, its industries were the growing of sugarcane and tobacco. Coffee is a comparatively recent introduction. We produce annually in the Cordoba district over 10 million pounds of coffee, and five times as much tobacco, and our coffee and tobacco have a high reputation in the market. Coffee grows in the lower regions of Mexico, and up to elevations of four or even 5,000 feet. The best site for a plantation is about 3,000 feet above sea level, but it must be remembered that the coffee tree requires a great deal of moisture, and unless a region is warm and wet, it will not answer for a successful experiment. Frank asked how soon after a plantation was started, the trees would begin to bear. The gentleman replied that he had seen coffee trees bearing two years after they were planted, and it was very common to gather fair crops from trees three years old, but they could not be relied upon for a profitable yield until they were four or five years old, and they continued to bear for 20 years. When a plantation is five years old, it does not cost much to keep it up, 
but before that time is a heavy outlay with little or slight return. You may grow tobacco or bananas between the young coffee trees when you set them out, he continued, and the profit from these products will cover a part of your expenses. In fact, you should set out enough bananas or plantains to shelter the young plants, which are liable to be injured by the sun and rain and wind in their infancy. The coffee tree would grow to a height of 20 or 25 feet if we permitted it to do so. We cut it off about 6 feet from the ground, and thus force the vigour into the branches. We want it low enough to pick from without too much reaching or climbing, and this would not be the case if we allowed the tree to run up as it would naturally. Then he gave the youths an account of the harvesting of the crop and its preparation for market, but as this had already been described elsewhere, Fred did not make a record of it. The culture of coffee is pretty nearly the same all the world over wherever the plant is grown. The conversation with the coffee grower had not prevented our friends from observing the scenery which lies between Orizaba and Cordoba, along the line of the railway. They were especially interested with the engineering which was required for crossing the Barranca of Metlac. This barranca is about 200 feet deep, by twice that width, and the first thought of the engineers was to throw a bridge directly across it. A bridge of a single span of 400 feet would be very costly, and piers 200 feet in height to support a lighter structure could not be built without great expense. Consequently, the plan was adopted of descending to where the barranca is less wide and high before attempting to span it. The bridge, wrote Frank, is on eight piers of iron, resting on masonry, and it curves in its course from one side of the barranca to the other, on a radius of 325 feet. It is 400 feet long, and 92 feet high. The railway is cut into the slope of the barranca on each side, and as it nears the bridge, it enters a tunnel that curves so as to give the necessary approach. The incline of the railway on each side of the barranca is about 3 feet and 100, and for quite a distance, the opposite tracks are almost parallel to each other. The sides of the barranca are covered with a dense growth of tropical trees and underbrush, and the picture it presents is very attractive to the traveller, however disheartening it may have been to the men who planned the railway. Many a railway engineer in Mexico has regretted that barrancas were ever invented, and on the other hand, has congratulated himself that their number is no larger than it is. From Cordoba to Paso del Macho, the fine scenery continued, the train winding among hills and mountains, disappearing into tunnels, crossing deep valleys upon graceful bridges, and steadily unfolding a panorama of great beauty. Frank made note of the bridge of Atoyac, 330 feet long, the Chiquihuite Bridge, 220 feet long, and that of San Alego, three miles before reaching Paso del Macho, which is 318 feet long. In 20 miles there was a descent of 1,200 feet, and the scenery steadily assumed more and more a tropical aspect. But beyond Paso del Macho, the country changed again and grew sterile, as though they were once more in the region of the Tierra Fria. How is this? queried Fred. Here we are coming all the time nearer the sea, both in elevation and distance. I thought we should have it a perfect forest of tropical growths all the way to Veracruz. Those who have studied the subject, answered the doctor, say that this strip of land along the coast is not touched by the moist vapours which blow inland from the sea. They are attracted by the mountains and highlands, and blow over this region to shed their moisture at a greater elevation. Evidently, the youths were disappointed, but they consoled themselves with the reflection that they were not intending to settle in the country, and therefore it didn't matter much to them what it was. Paso del Macho is about 1,500 feet above sea level, and 47 miles from Veracruz. The slope of the land from here onwards is regular, and no unusual engineering skill was required for the construction of the railway. Fred noted the names of four stations, Camarón, Soledad, Purga and Tejería, before they reached Veracruz, but there was nothing attractive about any of those places to render them worthy of further record. Historically, Soledad is memorable as the scene of the convention between generals Prim and Doblado 
in 1862, which led to the occupation of the country by the French troops and the invitation to Maximilian to become Emperor of Mexico. Fred asked if there was any monument at Soledad to commemorate the event, and was not at all surprised at receiving a negative answer. Night had fallen when they rolled into the station at Veracruz. Fred watched for the fortifications of which he had read so much, and was disappointed to learn that they had followed the fate of the walls of most European cities, and been levelled out of existence. Modern artillery had rendered all defences of this kind of no value for military purposes, and it is an act of common sense to destroy them and make practical use of the ground they occupy. The air was close and warm, and offered no inducements for a stroll. By the time our friends had located themselves at the Hotel de Diligencias, which was said to be the principal one, and partaken of a not very appetising supper, they had more thoughts of bed than of anything else. Next morning, the ewes were out in good season for the local sites. The first objects of interest were the zopilotes, or vultures, that act as a street-cleaning bureau in taking possession of everything edible, from their point of view, in the refuse of the streets. Frank and Fred had seen these birds before on many occasions, but never in such numbers. They are analogous to the turkey buzzards of the southern states of North America, and are said to be scientifically of the genus Cathartes. They roosted on the housetops and walked through the streets, constantly on the lookout for something in their line. They are protected by law and are faithful scavengers, working without pay other than board and lodging. They lodge in the open air and board upon what no other living creature would eat, so that they are inexpensive luxuries. They have never been charged, like street cleaning bureaus elsewhere, with obtaining money under fraudulent contracts. The streets were quiet, wrote Fred, and we were not surprised to learn that the population of Veracruz is under 20,000, and not particularly prosperous, although for a long time, nine-tenths of the foreign commerce of the country passed through this port. Since the railways from the United States were open to the capital, the trade of the city has greatly declined. Most of the business is in the hands of foreigners, so that the chief connection a Mexican has with it is to handle the goods as they are transferred from ship to railway or warehouse. The streets are straight and mostly narrow, and the open drains require to be constantly flushed, to keep down the stenches and unhealthy miasmas. In the sickly season, the drains are nightly supplied with disinfectants to keep off that dreaded scourge, the vomito, or yellow fever. We had heard much of the unhealthiness of Veracruz, and particularly of the vomito, which sometimes carries off hundreds of victims in a single week, and makes the road to the cemetery the best-travelled one in the whole city. Forty or fifty deaths a day are by no means uncommon. The old inhabitants do not seem to mind it, as they claim that a person who has once had the fever is ever after safe from it. A few years ago, Dr. Trowbridge, the American consul, was removed from the office which he had held for 12 years. His successor arrived during the prevalence of yellow fever, and died on the 13th day of his occupation of his new place. Dr. Trowbridge and his family had the fever lightly when they first arrived, and never afterwards suffered from it. They tell us that yellow fever is most dangerous in summer months, and least so in the winter. It is not advisable for a stranger to come here in the sickly season, and so well is this recognised that the betting men of Veracruz are said to make wages as to the probable length of life of a visitor from Europe or North America, when the vomito is prevalent. A Yankee whom we met upcountry says that when he came to Veracruz, a polite individual called upon him at the hotel and solicited his patronage, which he was sure to need. He did not feel very comfortable on learning that the polite man was an undertaker, and fled from the city by first train. It used to be said that a life insurance policy was vitiated if the holder remained more than 24 hours at Vera Cruz. Yellow fever is as dangerous for the Mexican from the tablelands as it is to the North American, and some authorities say that the stranger from over the sea is less liable to it than the Mexican from the Tierra Fria. It begins in May, is worst in August and September, and then declines to December when it practically disappears under the influence of the strong northers that blow during the autumn equinox. Were it not for these northers, 
Veracruz would be altogether too unhealthy for human habitation. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of The Boy Travellers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chris Bins. The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 26 The walk of our young friends took them to the Alameda, which proved unusually attractive as it was filled with tropical plants and trees, to which their eyes had not been accustomed in the upland region. They welcomed the palm trees as old friends. The palm does not flourish in Mexico at a greater elevation than 1,500 feet above the level of the sea, excepting under peculiarly favourable circumstances. The palms of Veracruz are finely developed, but they do not attain the size of those at Medellin, 12 miles down the coast. Medellin is a summer resort of the Veracruzanos. They go there for recreation during the hot season, or at least such of them as cannot afford the longer journey to Orizaba and the mountain regions. Many of the trees and bushes in the Alameda were bright with flowers. As if there were not enough floral products growing in sight, several flower sellers came around with their wares, which they persistently offered to the visitors. Frank asked for the Palo de Leche, but the flower sellers did not have it, though one enterprising dealer endeavoured to substitute a common blossom in its place, with the gravest assurance that it was the article sought. I haven't heard of that flower before, said Fred. Why were you asking for it? I read about it last night, was the reply, and had a curiosity to see what it was like. Well, what did you read that was interesting? The description said that the term palo de leche means simply milky plant and is applied to several plants from whose stems a milky substance exudes. We have the same kind of plant in the north, such as the milkweed and its kindred. There are many varieties of the palo de leche in Mexico and they belong to the family of euphorbia. One kind is used by the Indians for fishing. They throw the leaves into the water and the fishes are stupefied and rise to the surface, where they are easily taken before the effect of the narcotic has passed away. The same writer says that if the milk is thrown upon a fire, it gives out fumes, which produce nausea and severe headaches that often last for several hours. Taken internally, the milk of some of the euphorbia is a deadly poison. It will produce death or insanity, according to the size and preparation of the dose, or the condition of the person to whom it is administered. There is a popular belief among the Mexicans that the insanity of the ex-Empress Carlota was caused by this poison. While many deny this and point to the fact that she became insane after going to Europe, they admit that the Palo de Leche is to be feared when in the hands of unscrupulous persons. On the other hand, it is claimed that the Indians can so prepare and use the poison as to regulate the time at which it will cause death or insanity. If that is the case, replied Fred, it is no wonder that the flower sellers do not deal in what you wanted. Perhaps it would not be altogether safe for a Mexican to ask for it, as he might be suspected of evil designs, and bring the police nearer than would be comfortable. The subject of Palo de Leche was dropped, and the walk continued. At a fountain, they saw quite a group of men and quadrupeds, and a glance showed that the same system of water supply prevails here as in most other cities of Mexico. Water is carried by the aguadores, either on their backs or on those of donkeys. An aguador who possesses a donkey is an aristocrat in his line of business, and looks down upon the poor wretch, who is obliged to be his own beast of burden. The mule and donkey are important animals at Veracruz, and a good part of the carrying business is in their hands, or on their backs. Frank and Fred paused to look at the governor's palace, an imposing edifice of two stories with a high tower at one corner. There are wide balconies on each of the stories, where the occupants can sit in the shade and enjoy the cool breeze whenever it happens to blow. A drawback to sitting there is the presence of the mosquitoes, 
which fill all the space not taken up by the governor and his household. Not only do the inhabitants of Vera Cruz maintain a constant warfare with mosquitoes, but they associate intimately with fleas, ticks, and other bodily annoyances. Official station offers no exemption. The insect pests are indiscriminate in their attentions, and light on the brow of the governor or the general in command of the post just as readily as on that of the humblest peon. If there is any difference, it is in favour of the peon, as his tougher skin renders him less inviting to the diminutive assailants. Veracruz has an interesting history, wrote Fred in his journal. It was founded by Cortés in 1519, who gave it the name of Villa Rica de la Veracruz, the rich city of the True Cross. The original site was a little north of the present one, and altogether the location of the city has been changed three times. The last change occurred in the year 1600, and brought it to where the first buildings were erected by the Spaniards, before Cortes made the formal location of what he intended as the maritime metropolis of the New World. The city has suffered in a great many ways, leaving out the annual visitation of yellow fever, which we have already mentioned, it has had occasion to mourn the advent of buccaneers, pirates, hostile fleets and armies, and occasional conflagrations and hurricanes. In 1568, and again in 1683, it was sacked by pirates, and many of its inhabitants were killed. In 1618, it was nearly burned to the ground by a fire that broke out during a northerly gale. In 1822 and 1823, it was bombarded by the Spaniards, who held the castle of San Juan de Ulloa on the island opposite the city, in the struggle of the Mexicans for independence. In 1838, it was bombarded by the French, and nine years later by the Americans. The latter captured it by coming ashore on the beach some distance below the city, and attacking it from the land side, so that the surrender was rendered imperative. Some of the Mexicans complained that General Scott did not fight fair, as he made his attack where they were least prepared for defence. Evidently, they expected him to march up to the muzzles of their guns, instead of going around to the undefended rear of the city, as he did. The shipping in the harbour was destroyed by a hurricane in 1856, and it has suffered serious damage in other years. President Juarez was besieged here in 1859 by General Miramon. Two years later, the city was taken by the French and imperialists, and remained in their hands until 1867, when the death of Maximilian and the collapse of the empire restored it to Mexican possession. After breakfast, the party arranged to visit the fortress, which stands on the island of San Juan, already mentioned, at the Mole or Pier, the only one of which Veracruz can boast, they hired a boat in which they were rowed to the fort. The distance is nearly a mile, and our friends were easily able to understand the unsafe character of the harbour of Veracruz. It is little better than an open roadstead. When high winds prevail, landing from or embarking upon a steamer is impossible, and during heavy northers, steamers sometimes put to sea for safety. There are no docks where vessels can lie. Everything must be discharged or received by boats or lighters, and the uncertainties of the weather make the time of a steamer's departure very uncertain. The dangerous character of the harbour is said to cause the insurance companies to increase their rates when Veracruz is given as a vessel's destination. The fort is a grim-looking place, said Frank. Its walls are thick enough to justify the belief of its builders that it was impregnable. Whatever it may have been in ancient times, it is not of much consequence at present, and short work would be made of it by modern artillery. No attempt is made to keep it in condition to resist a determined attack, all the cannon which it possesses being of ancient date. Many of these cannon would be quite as dangerous to the garrison as to the enemy, in case they were discharged. The story goes that it costs so much to build the fort, that the King of Spain once called for a telescope and pointed it at the west. For what is your majesty looking? inquired one of his officers of state. I am looking for San Juan de Ojoya, he answered. I have spent so much money on it that I ought to see the fort standing out on the western sky. Our guide pointed out some great rings of copper that were built into the wall of the fortress on the face next to the city. 
These rings were intended for ships to tie to under protection of the guns. But in the past 200 years, the water has become so shoal that only a small boat can come near enough to make any use of the fastenings. There are large courtyards inside the fort, where a whole regiment could parade, and the casemates are sufficiently capacious to hold a garrison six times as large as the government keeps here. Parts of the walls are broken down, and no effort is made to keep them in repair. The chief use of the once celebrated fort is as a prison. They told us that about 60 or 70 prisoners were kept there, some of them being sentenced for life. We looked into some of the vacant dungeons and thought them the most horrible places of imprisonment we had ever seen. They are badly ventilated, very little light can enter them, and the walls are damp and almost dripping with moisture. Escape is out of the question, as the water around the island swarms with sharks, and a prisoner who should attempt to get away by swimming to the shore would be eaten by these monsters of the sea. An excursion of a pleasanter character was made to the city of Halapa, ah, as in father. It should be called a journey rather than an excursion, as it consumed no less than three days. Halapa is 74 miles from Veracruz and 4,000 feet above the sea, and one of the prettiest places in Mexico. Our friends were obliged to rise at a very early hour, as the train starts at 5am. They went by steam for 16 miles to Tejeria, and there changed to a tramcar, drawn by mules, for a ride of 60 miles. The old diligence road between Veracruz and the capital passes through Jalapa, but it is not much used since the completion of the railway. General Scott marched by that road, and the youths were on the watch for El Puente Nacional, or the National Bridge, where he was sharply resisted by the Mexican army. It is 35 miles from Veracruz, and is an immense viaduct, built in the early part of the present century, when the road to the capital was begun. In the happy days of Brigandish, it was the favourite spot for stopping coaches and plundering passengers. Many a traveller has given up his valuables at this spot, under the potent influence of a pistol in the hands of a Mexican road agent. Sixty miles by mule power was a long distance, said Fred, and we wondered how it was to be accomplished. The mules went along at a good pace, considering that it was an ascending grade. They were urged by the whip in the hands of the driver, and he was certainly not a merciful one, perhaps for the reason that the mules belonged to the railway company and not to himself. Part of our ride was through a comparatively desert region, and we rejoiced that it was early in the morning while the sun was not high and hot. The train was composed of three cars. Each car had four mules for its motive power, and the vehicles were divided into first, second, and third class. First class fare is $6.63, second class $4.08, and third class not far from $2.00. My memorandum for third class is so blurred that I cannot make the figures out to a certainty. The mules were changed every two hours, and seemed very well satisfied when their terms of service were ended. We stopped at Rinconada, where we breakfasted and changed mules for the second time, the first change having been made at the National Bridge. The second station from Rinconada was Cerro Gordo, where General Scott defeated the Mexicans in 1847. It is a narrow pass bordered by high hills, and connects the lowlands of the coast with the regions of the Tierra Templada. How an army could get through the pass in the face of anything like determined and intelligent opposition by a force superior in numbers, it is difficult to understand. An English writer who has visited the spot says of it as follows. That 10,000 Americans should have been able to get through the mountain pass and to reach the capital at all is an astonishing thing. And after that, their successes in the Valley of Mexico follow as a matter of course. They could never have crossed the mountains but for a combination of circumstances. After passing Cerro Gordo, in which we had no such difficulties as beset General Scott, we found ourselves in a less tropical region than the one behind us. Cornfields were numerous, and so were fields of barley. That we had not left the region of warmth altogether was evident by the sugar cane and the coffee trees that abounded in many places. They continued up to and into Jalapa, whither our mules went at a gallop, and came to a halt about half past four in the afternoon. 
12 hours for a journey of 74 miles, up a slope of 4,000 feet, and 60 miles of the distance by mule power isn't so bad after all. There was a drawback to the interest of the scene, in the shape of a cloud of mist in which we were enveloped as we entered the city, but the wind swept it away and we had some beautiful views. Then it came on again to our aggravation, and in fact it kept up a sort of peep show performance all the time we were there. They told us that a good deal of rain falls at Jalapa, and when there is no rain, there is generally a mist of more or less density. We were reminded of Ireland and Scotland, and in more ways than one, the mists that obstruct the view are the glory of Jalapa in keeping everything green, even to our memory of it. It does not rain, nor is the sky obscured all the time, else there would be no ripening of fruit in the gardens, and the gardens of Jalapa are among the finest in the world. The great staple of Jalapa is coffee, but there is a large product of sugar, and as for plantains, bananas, mangoes, and similar fruits, they are to be had in abundance, and for little more than the asking. We looked for that old-fashioned drastic medicine, Halap, which takes its name from the city, but we're told it is no longer exclusively produced here. Dr. Bronson says the drug was introduced into England from Mexico in 1609, and was in use for 200 years before the plant from which it came was known. It belongs to the same family as the four o'clock of our gardens, and grows wild in the mountains in the neighbourhood of Jalapa. As this city was then the centre of commerce in this article, the name adhered to it, just as the name of Calicut adhered to the cloth called Calico, which originally came from that town of India. Another staple for which Jalapa is famous is pretty women, but so far, as we have been able to observe, it has no monopoly of them against the other cities of Mexico. They have been praised by many travellers, and there is a Mexican saying that las jalapeños son muy jalagüeñas. The women of Jalapa are very charming. We have seen many pretty faces, and if the weather has been uninterruptedly fine, perhaps we could have seen more. The streets resemble those of Spain more than they do any we saw in Mexico, Puebla or Veracruz, they are narrow, crooked and irregular, and separating solid old buildings with thick walls and heavily grated windows. The city has about 15,000 inhabitants, and there is said to have been an Indian town here at the time of Cortez's arrival. The houses cling to the hillside, as though afraid of falling off, and there is a good deal of uphill and downhill in a walk through the streets. In fact, it seems to be uphill no matter which way you go, an excellent feature about the streets is their cleanliness. Another vegetable product of the region around Jalapa is the vanilla, which was cultivated here long before the conquest. The Indians had practically a monopoly of it at one time, but its cultivation has spread to other parts of Mexico and Central America, and also to distant countries. The best quality still comes from this part of Mexico, and the Indians show great skill in harvesting and curing the pods. The drying of the pods takes a long time, and if any mistake is made in the process, it greatly injures the value of the product. We had a fine view of the peak at Orizaba and the famous mountain of Perote, which from its shape is known as the Cofre, or Casket. At the base of this mountain is the town of Perote, which was famous during the Mexican War as the place where some Americans were imprisoned. Dr. Bronson says there was a novel of that time called The Prisoner of Perote, which had a very large circulation. Downhill is easier than uphill all the world over, and nowhere more so than on a tramway. We started from Jalapa at seven in the morning, and went flying down the roads, turning curves at a gallop, dashing on as though pursued by a nemesis or a pack of wolves, and raising clouds of dust wherever the roads were dry. Our hair stood on end half the time, figuratively at least, and I wish the mules could have told us what they thought of such recklessness. We breakfasted again at Rinconada, and at a little past four in the afternoon, rolled into Veracruz. Jalapa is to be connected with Puebla and the city of Mexico by the Inter-Oceanic Railway, perhaps before these words appear in print, as a part of the line is already built, and work is being pushed on the remainder. As has been shown on previous pages, 
It is the intention to carry the railway through to the Pacific Ocean by making use of the line already completed from the capital to Morelos and Yautepec. Another Pacific line has been surveyed from Puebla through the state of Oaxaca, and a part of the road has been built. On their return trip from Jalapa to Veracruz, our friends made the acquaintance of a railway engineer who had been at work upon the line from Tampico westward. He was enthusiastic about the future of Tampico, and predicted that when the railway had formed its connection with the national and central lines, Veracruz would be out in the cold, as he expressed it. Tampico has, said he, a harbour that can be greatly improved by dredging away a part of the bar, which is now dangerous. The town is five miles up a river, and affords the shelter which a ship cannot find at Veracruz. With the dredging I mentioned, the port can be used by the same class of vessels that now go to Veracruz. Tampico will get all the business when the railway is completed, and the line open to the capital. Filled with the idea of the importance of Tampico, and the ruin that awaited Veracruz. Before leaving the latter city, Frank had a conversation with an advocate of another port of future importance. The new claimant for commercial favours was Anton Lizardo, who lived some distance down the coast, and was selected as the starting point of the Mexican Southern Railway. It is claimed to be in a healthy locality, and to have a fairly good harbour capable of improvement by the use of the dredge and the construction of piers at which vessels may lie. General Grant was the president of the Mexican Southern Railway, and since his death, the enterprise has languished, and our friends were unable to learn that it showed any positive signs of activity. It was Dr. Bronson's intention to leave Veracruz on the day following their return from Jalapa, but his plans were rudely upset by a norther, which set in furiously, and for two days cut off all communication with the ships in harbour or out of it, Frank and Fred climbed to the top of the highest tower they could find, and watched the waves breaking on the walls, and also on the long line of beach north and south of the city. At times, the island of San Juan de Ojoya seemed to be half buried in the spray. The ships rose and fell unpleasantly, as they tugged at their anchors, and some of them took the course of prudence and steamed away seaward. Two or three small craft were torn from their moorings and driven ashore, that similar accidents may befall larger vessels was painfully evidenced by an English steamer, which lay high and dry on the beach, where she had been wrecked in an order a few weeks before. But all things have an end, and so did the gale, which blew itself out after cleansing the city of all miasmatic impurities, and rendering it healthy for a while. The sea went down, and as soon as the steamer on which they were to leave had completed her cargo and was ready for sea, the travelling trio went on board. An hour later, they were moving over the dark waters of the Gulf of Mexico, with their faces turned in the direction of the equator. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mario Pineda The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 27 The steamer on which our friends were embarked was a small one engaged in the coasting trade. She drew less than 12 feet of water and was therefore able to enter the shallow harbors of some of the Mexican and Central American ports where large vessels cannot go. On the morning after leaving Veracruz, she was off the mouth of the Coatzacoalcos River, and a little after sunrise she crossed the bar and steamed slowly against the current of that tropical stream. Dense forests, broken here and there by clearings, covered the banks of the river and reminded our young friends of the Menam River in Siam or the Mekong in Cambodia. Thirty miles from the mouth of the river brought them to Minatitlan, a tumble-down village or town with a few hundred inhabitants who are chiefly engaged in doing nothing if one is to judge by appearances. The business of Minatitlan is not large, and is chiefly connected with trade in mahogany and other tropical woods. The river and the town have an international importance, 
as they are on the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which has long been under consideration as the route for a canal to connect the Atlantic with the Pacific. The width of the Isthmus from ocean to ocean is 143 miles, but by making use of the rivers on either side, the length of a canal would be little, if any, more than 100 miles. The route has been surveyed at different times, notably in 1870 by Captain Shuffled of the United States Navy, who declared that there was no insurmountable obstacle to the construction of a ship canal. Recently, the Mexican government has given to an English company a concession for a railway across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. One of the surveyors of this company was a passenger on the steamer with our friends who fell into conversation with them during dinner and learned many things of interest. The engineer told them that work was to begin immediately on the railway and they hoped to have it completed by the end of 1889. Dr. Bronson recalled the fact that in 1842, a concession was granted to Don José de Garay for the Tehuantepec Railway, but nothing was accomplished for the simple reason that the money for the work could not be obtained. As soon as the Garay concession fell through, the United States government offered $15 million for the right-of-way across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, but the offer was declined. During the California gold excitement, a Tehuantepec transit line was established. Steamers ran between the Isthmus and San Francisco on the Pacific side and to New York and New Orleans on the Atlantic. Passengers were carried across the neck of land in stagecoaches. The enterprise proved unprofitable and was abandoned after a few years. What interested Frank and Fred more than anything else at this point was the suggestion that huge ships might yet be transported across the Isthmus not by canal, but on a railway. Their newfound friend told them about the project of Captain James B. Eads, an enterprising American engineer, and referred them for further information to an article on Harper's Magazine for November 1881. With their usual good fortune, they found a copy of the magazine in the hands of the purser of the steamer. Aided by it and the points given them by the engineer, together with some from Dr. Bronson, they wrote the following while the steamer was continuing her voyage from Minatitlan. Anyone who thinks the idea of a ship railway here is a new one is grievously mistaken. It originated with no less a personage than the conqueror Cortes, who visited the Isthmus, examined the river Quetzalcoatlcus, made soundings, and walked across from ocean to ocean with a view to establishing a portage by which ships could be carried overland for the commerce between Spain and the far east of Asia. Cortés reported favorably upon the enterprise and suggested a broad road carefully graded by which ships could be transported on rollers or wheels from one ocean to the other. It must be remembered that the ships of his day were much smaller than those of the present time and their transportation a hundred miles over land would not have been a very difficult matter. Somehow, the Spanish government did not favor the proposal sufficiently to authorize the expenditure of the necessary cash. The matter slumbered until 1814, nearly 300 years, when the government consented to the undertaking, but the revolution then going on prevented anything like actual work on the road. The Garay Railway concession in 1842 was the next project. Three canal concessions have since been made to Mexicans and one to Americans, then came the concession to Capital Eads for a ship railway, and last of all is the concession already mentioned for an ordinary railway to be built by an English company. We will remark here that if concessions would build railways, Mexico would have been gridironed with them long before this. It is probable that two or three hundred concessions have been granted in the last ten years, and nine-tenths of them are not likely to go beyond the permission to build which the concession grants. The idea of Captain Eads was that wherever a canal can be built to float a ship, a railway may be built to carry one. His theory was laughed at by a great many people, but has been accepted by eminent engineers all over the world who have carefully studied his plans. Like every novel scheme, it has met with much opposition and many objections have been made to it but they are chiefly by men whose minds are not scientific. It should be borne in mind that the steam railway, the steamboat, the ocean steamship, 
the telegraph, in fact, every great enterprise of modern times has encountered similar opposition and in some instances has had no support even from scientific minds. Dr. Bronson says there is fair reason to believe that the ship railway of Captain Eads will be in operation before the end of the century and vessels of five or six thousand tons will safely pass over dry land from one ocean to the other. Captain Eads proposed to build a line of twelve rails with a grade of not more than fifty feet to the mile at each end. The line descends into the water to enable ships to be placed in the cradles in which they are to rest during the transit. The grade of one foot in a hundred or fifty-two and eight-tenths feet to the mile would carry the line to a depth of thirty feet in a length of three thousand feet. Here the ship, in a landlocked basin, will be floated to a cradle and made fast. The cradle and ship together will be hauled out by means of stationary engines on land just as ships are hauled upon marine railways or dry docks. The cradle is an enormous platform car, 300 feet long, or it may be a tank of the same length in which a ship can float. In either case, it will be the width of 12 rails spaced to a standard gauge, 4 feet 8.5 inches, and will have 100 wheels on each rail, or 1,200 wheels in all. This will give a pressure of 5 tons to each wheel, supposing the cradle to be carrying a ship of 4,000 tons, which is no more than the burden of the wheel of an ordinary freight car with its load. Thus is answered the objection which has been made, and very naturally, about the enormous pressure upon the cars and roadbed. Taking the area into consideration, the pressure is no greater than that upon an ordinary railway when a loaded train goes over it. The cradle will be drawn along the railway by four locomotives, each of them as powerful as five ordinary freight locomotives of the Pennsylvania or other great railway company. Of course, there can be no curves on the railway, as the cradle can be no more flexible than the ship. All bends on the line will be made at turntables, but the nature of the country is such that only two of these, or possibly three, will be needed. The youths pause at this point to look at the drawings which show the design for supporting the cradle on its carriage. Fred observed that the axle of each wheel was independent and that there was a pair of springs above each and every wheel. He asked Dr. Bronson why it was so many springs were needed and it was evident that with 1200 wheels there would be 2400 springs. I suppose was the reply that it is to facilitate the change of the carriage from a level to a grade or vice versa. In going from an upgrade to a level there would be a greater pressure at the ends than in the center, and the same would be the case in going from a level to a downgrade. The springs are intended to regulate this. The railway is intended to form an upward incline from each end towards the center, where there will be a level of several miles. Frank asked how fast the train, if train it could be called, was expected to run in making the transit of the isthmus with the ship. From eight to ten miles an hour, replied the doctor. Captain Needs proposed not to keep a vessel more than twelve hours out of the water, and he thought it quite likely the time might be reduced to ten hours. Then the youths looked at the map and studied out the course of the proposed ship railway. Frank slowly dictated, while Fred jotted down the names of the places mentioned. The bar at the mouth of the river must be dredged out so as to admit ships, which will then find plenty of water up to a point called Ceiba Bonita on the Uspanapan River, which runs into the Coatzacoalcos just below Minatitlan. There, the ship railway will begin, and it runs in a straight line to the mountains, where there is a depression only 650 feet high. In fact, there are two of these depressions, and either of them may be taken. These are the passes of Chivela and Tarifa. By the former, the railway may run to the town of Tehuantepec, and there make a bend by turntable and continue to the Pacific Ocean. And by the latter pass, it may go to Salinas Cruz, which lies on a lagoon, where a harbor must be dredged out. And how much will be the cost of this great work? What are the youths asked. I believe the estimate is 75 millions of dollars, was the reply, 
including the construction of the railway and its equipment with cradles, tanks, locomotives, and everything else needed for operating the line. The saving of distance, continued Dr. Brunson, for a ship going by the Isthmus of Tehuantepec instead of Cape Horn from New York to Hong Kong is 8,245 miles and from New Orleans to Hong Kong 9,900 miles. The route from England to the ports of Eastern Asia and Australia is also considerably shortened and there can be little doubt that the completion and successful operation of the ship railway would be of great advantage to the commerce of the world. While laminated land, the Jutes saw a vessel loading with mahogany logs for the port in Europe, and they naturally made inquiries about the wood and where it was procured. They learned that it grew on marshy ground in the valleys of rivers in southern Mexico, Honduras, and Central America generally, and also in the West India Islands, tropical South America, and tropical Asia and Africa. It is, said the informant, the most valuable of all the tropical trees, as you will see when I tell you the prices at which it is sold. Logs 15 feet long and 38 inches square have been sold for two or three thousand dollars each, and in one instance three logs from one tree brought fifteen thousand dollars. Frank asked if that was the regular price for the timber or only an exceptional one. In these cases it was exceptional, was the reply, the value depending upon the peculiar curl or grain of the wood but the work of getting out the logs is so great that unless high prices were paid for all mahogany, the business would be abandoned. The mahogany cutters search through the forest for trees, and then they build roads, often for many miles, to haul the logs to the banks of the rivers. The logs are usually from 10 to 16 feet long and 2 to 3 feet square. The length of the logs will depend upon that of the tree, and the number of cuttings that can be made to the best advantage. The largest log I've ever heard was cut in Honduras. It was 17 feet long, 57 inches broad, and 64 inches deep. It weighed more than 15 tons and was cut into 5,421 feet of inch plank. Reduced to veneering 1 16th of an inch thick, it would have covered very nearly 2 acres. Fred observed that the logs were square instead of round and asked why it was. There are two reasons for it, was the reply. The first object is to reduce the weight as much as possible without injury to the wood, and hence the workmen square the logs roughly as soon as they have been divided into lengths. In the second place, the squaring makes them less liable to roll while upon the rough carts by which they are brought through the forest to the rivers, where they are floated down to the places of shipment. The cutting and hauling are done in the dry season and the work is timed so that it will be completed when the rainy season sets in. Then the rivers swell and the logs are floated. The system is in many respects analogous to lumbering operations in Maine, Minnesota and other northern states of America. After leaving the Coatzacoalcos River, the steamer headed for Frontera at the mouth of the river Tabasco but she did not remain long enough for our friends to go on shore, much to the disappointment of Frank and Fred. They were consoled by a fellow passenger, who told them that the place was hot and unhealthy, and they would run the risk of taking the fever by passing no more than a few hours on land. Another consideration was that the anchorage was six miles from town, and the fare to the shore was four dollars each way, at least that was what the boatmen demanded. The Tabasco is a river of considerable size and navigable for quite a distance in land by small steamers. The capital of the state of Tabasco is San Juan Bautista, about 50 miles from the mouth of the river. By continuing up the stream, the traveler can reach a point whence an overland journey will bring him to the ruins of Palenque, one of the archaeological wonders of the western continent. We didn't care much for the modern part of Tabasco, said Fred as it would not have been much unlike what we have already seen, but we did want ever and ever so much to go to Palenque. We have read the descriptions of the ruins by Stephens, who visited them in 1839-1840, and Bancharney, who went there in 1882. Both gentlemen agree that they are wonderful to look at, even from the point of view of an ordinary traveler. They tell us of a ruined palace 238 feet long by 180 deep, 
and is standing on a mound or platform of earth and stone 40 feet high and measuring about 100 feet each way more than the palace does. The palace was built on stone laid in a mortar of lime and sand and seems to have been covered with stucco in various colors. There is a great quantity of bas reliefs and hieroglyphics. Many of these have been injured by time and the Indians, but on the other hand, a great number are still perfect. Nobody can yet tell the exact extent of the city as it was in the time of its glory. A dense forest has grown over the spot, and it would take an army of men to remove the huge trees and clear away the ground. You may ask how old the city is and when it was abandoned. That as well as the city's extent, is a conundrum. Some writers think it was inhabited as late as the time of the conquest. This is the theory of Mr. Charney, and a traveler who preceded him in 1774 says he discovered 18 palaces, 20 great buildings, and 167 houses in a single week, which is more than can be found by one person in the same time nowadays. According to the account of the expedition of Cortes to Honduras, he must have passed quite close to the site of Palenque, but his faithful chronicler, Bernal Diaz, makes no mention of the city, nor it is referred to in the conqueror's reports to the king. Mr. Charney made explorations through this region, and to the southeast of Palenque he visited the ruins of another city. This he named in honor of Mr. Pierre Lorillard of New York, who had defrayed the expenses of the expedition. He had hoped to be the first explorer of these ruins, but on reaching this spot he found himself preceded by an enterprising Englishman, Mr. Alfred Maudsley of London. The latter generously proposed that the Frenchman should name the town, called himself the discoverer, in fact, do anything he pleased, since he, Maudsley, was only an amateur traveling for pleasure and not for scientific purposes. Charney accepted the offer, in so far as the naming of the place was concerned, but he could hardly call himself the discoverer, as he had been previously visited by residents of Tenosique, the nearest modern town of any consequence, and one of them had described it in writing and by drawings. One of the interesting objects found at Lorillard was an idol that has a remarkable resemblance to the idols in the Buddhist temples of Asiatic countries. It was in a temple that was greatly ruined. There are 15 or 20 temples and other buildings at Lorillard and it is quite possible that others may be found by a careful examination of the forest. Mr. Charney pronounced the idol one of the finest ever discovered in tropical America. It represented a figure sitting in the attitude of Buddha, with the hands resting on the knees. The head was surmounted by an enormous headdress intended to represent a cluster of feathers surrounding and rising above a medallion and diadem. The garments worn by the bust are a sort of cape covered with pearls and having a medallion in front and on each side. There are heavy bracelets on the arms, and there is a girdle around the waist with a medallion similar to that which decorates the cape. The sacred character of the statue or idol is indicated by the circumstance that all around it, and in fact all through the temple, were many bowls of coarse clay, which were used for burning incense. Some of the bowls contained copal, which was the substance used for incense, and the walls of the temples were black with the smoke from the offerings. A singular feature about these temples, and also those at Palenque, is the presence of the cross among the bas reliefs and hieroglyphics. This circumstance has given rise to the supposition that the temples were built long after the conquest, and that the natives had been converted to Christianity, but the most careful students of this subject say that the cross was a symbol of the Toltecs long before Columbus or Cortes was born. The famous sculpture of Palenque was the temple of the same name and represents a Roman cross on the top of which a bird is perched. A man at one side presents an offering to the bird and the spaces beneath the arms of the cross are covered with hieroglyphics that have not been deciphered. The whole sculpture on which this cross appears was upon three stones placed side by side in the wall of the temple. One of them is still there, the second is in the Smithsonian Institution at Washington, and the third, which is the central one with the cross upon it, has been taken to Las Playas in the state of Tabasco. The whole country is said to abound with ruins that have never been seen by white men, 
and some of which are not even known to the Indians of today. It is certain that this region once contained a dense and highly civilized population, and the ruins that have been explored show that they had a good knowledge of the principles of architecture and sculpture. Exactly who they were has not been revealed, but explorers and scientists are slowly penetrating the secret, and in course of time the history of this primitive people will be given to the world. The cities at Palenque and Lorillard were of Toltec origin. The Toltecs were in Mexico previous to the Aztecs, as we have already mentioned, and it is fair to presume that these cities now in crumbling ruins were older than the Tenochtitlan, which Cortes captured from the Aztecs. In the state of Oaxaca are the ruins of Mitla, an Aztec city, and they are extensive enough to show that a powerful people once lived there. The ruins at Mitla are in two groups, each consisting of four buildings fronting on a square like the plaza of modern times. There is a hall with six columns of stone in the center, each column being about 12 feet high and tapering towards the top like a slender sugar loaf. It is supposed to have formed a central support for the roof that rested at its edges upon the walls which are parallel to each other. The walls are built of rough stones laid with cement and they seem to have been covered originally with stucco. On the outside, the buildings at Mitla were built up with blocks of hewn stone and covered with a mosaic laid in stucco and composed of stone of different colors. The doors and windows are square and have lintels of hewn stone and altogether the buildings had quite a resemblance for those of the ancient Egyptians. There is a tradition at Mitla that vast amounts of treasure are concealed in the temples and surrounding grounds and the earth has been repeatedly dug over in the search for these things. Under one of the temples is a chamber in which there is an upright column of stone called the Pillar of Death. The natives believe that any Indian who clasps his arms around this pillar will die in a short time, but white men are not in any such danger. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of The Boy Travellers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by a fine voice. The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas W. Knox. While considering the accounts of the ruins of ancient cities in Mexico, and the countries bordering it, our young friends came upon allusions to a mysterious city. Somewhere in the unexplored region of tropical forests lying to the southward, their curiosity was excited, and they wondered if such a city really existed. In the forest, they found that two explorers, Stevens and Morellet, believed in its existence, and though they tried hard to reach it, were unable to do so. Stevens learned of it from the Cura of Quiche, a native town of Guatemala, who claimed to have looked upon the city from the wall of rock surrounding the valley where it stands. He had heard of it many years before at the village of Chachul. He was then young and had climbed to the top of the ridge, which the Indians indicated, and from his elevated standpoint looked down upon the plain and the white walls and towers of the city glistening in the sun. It covered a large area, and its people were advanced in the arts, and capable of making a vigorous defence against all intruders. John L. Stevens Wouldn't that be an expedition worth making, said Frank to Fred, after they had read the account in Mr. Stevens's book. Just think of it, to be able to discover the mysterious city which no white man has ever returned from. Yes, that's the tradition concerning it, was the reply. Several white men have gone there, but no one has ever returned from it to tell the story of what he saw. Writers on the subject are not very encouraging, said Frank, as they assert that the Indians in this mysterious city murder every white man who comes within their boundaries. Not even the Spanish padres are permitted to enter, and they are usually able to go where no other white man dare try to penetrate. Frank read and reread all the attainable descriptions of the mysterious city, and his imagination was fired almost to the degree of explosion. The inhabitants understand, he remarked, that a white race has conquered the rest of the country, 
but they are determined not to be conquered. They have no coin or other circulating medium, no horses, cattle, mules, or other domestic animals except fowls, and they keep these underground, so that the crowing of the cocks will not be heard. Probably Frank's belief was largely influenced by the circumstance that such a careful explorer as Stevens accepted the story as true. In speaking of it, he uses these words. I conceive it to be not impossible that in this secluded region may exist at this day, unknown to white men, a living Aboriginal city, occupied by relics of the ancient race, who still worship in the temples of their fathers. Seeking the Mysterious City In writing an introduction to the narrative of the travels of Arthur Morellet, who spent several years in that country, and evidently believed in the existence of the mysterious city, Mr. E. G. Squire says as follows, There is a region lying between Chiapas, Tabasco, Yucatan, and the Republic of Guatemala, and comprising a considerable portion of each of those states, which if not entirely blank is only conjecturally filled up with mountains, lakes, and rivers. It is almost as unknown as the interior of Africa itself. Within its depths, far off on some unknown tributary of the Usamacinta, the popular tradition of Guatemala and Chiapas places the great aboriginal city, with its white walls shining like silver in the sun, which the Cura of Quiche affirmed he had seen with his own eyes, from the tops of the mountains of Quetzaltenango. A Guatemalan gentleman, Don Pedro Velasquez, claims to have accompanied two young gentlemen of Baltimore, who succeeded in reaching the mysterious city a few years after the account of Stevens was published. Having once reached the city, they were not harmed, but when they attempted to escape, they were seized, and one of them was sacrificed on the altar of the sun, after the manner of the Aztec sacrifices already described. The other made his escape, but was so badly wounded that he died in the forest. Don Pedro and a few Indians who accompanied the young gentleman managed to get away with their lives, but only by running great risks. The account he gives of their adventures is not very clear, and it has not secured a prominent place in the history of scientific explorations. A few years ago, an enterprising American naturalist, Mr. F. A. Ober, was on the borders of this unexplored region and was greatly tempted to venture alone in search of the mysterious city, and particularly to learn about the fauna and flora that abound in its vicinity. It would have been madness for him to have undertaken the journey, and he wisely refrained from doing so. He is still of opinion that the examination of this unknown and unconquered region offers a fine field for the naturalist, and for societies engaged in promoting scientific investigation. After mature deliberation, Frank and Fred concluded that the exploration of this unknown region was not practicable just at that time, but they would keep it in mind, and perhaps might lead an expedition thither at some future day. Dr. Bronson suggested that in the meanwhile they could amuse themselves by reading The Phantom City, a romance based upon the stories told by Stevens and others. He thought that the romance might contain hints which would be useful in case they should fit out their expedition. At all events, said he, it is an interesting story and will well repay perusal. The steamer made a brief halt at Carmen, an insignificant town on an island on the coast, and then proceeded to Campeche, where she anchored about five miles from shore. There was quite a groundswell on the sea, which would have made a journey to the shore somewhat uncomfortable, with the possibility, in case the wind increased, of being detained there until the next steamer happened along. So our friends concluded to acquaint themselves with Campeche by looking at it from the deck of the vessel. All day they lay there, and long before the sun went down, the youths were impatient to be on their way. As they looked upon the white walls of the city glistening in the sun, it was no great stretch of the imagination for them to believe they were repeating the experience of the cura of Quiche, and gazing from the top of the mountain chain which he claims to have ascended. They learned that Campeche was once of more importance than it is today. It has a population of 20,000 and is built of a white limestone that is very abundant in the neighbourhood. 
Its houses are nearly all of but one story in height, and the city is surrounded by walls, which were built by the Spaniards when they founded a settlement here. An interesting feature of Campeche is a great number of subterranean caves in the hills on which it stands, some of them natural and some artificial. These caves were made by the Indians long ago. Most of them have been explored in search of treasure, of which very little was obtained. Numerous skulls and skeletons were found there, and it is evident that the caves were used as burial places and are much like the catacombs of Oriental countries. A few of them have been utilised as cellars by the inhabitants, but only a few. The Indians of today have a good many superstitions concerning the caves, and look with an unfriendly eye upon anyone who desecrates them. Campeche Tobacco A lighter came alongside with some cargo for the steamer, and Frank made a note of what it brought. There were hides of cattle, deer skins, sugar in bags made of the pita plant, bales of that textile product, beeswax, and a considerable quantity of Campeche cigars. The tobacco grown in the states of Campeche and Tabasco is of very good quality, and the cigars are often sold for Havanas in foreign markets. Frank learned that logwood is an important article of trade on this part of the coast, but it is mostly shipped on sailing vessels, on account of the lower charge for freight. Carmen has a considerable commerce in logwood, which grows so extensively that there is no immediate danger of the exhaustion of the supply, especially as its cultivation has extended to other countries, by planting the seed or transplanting the young trees. Logwood is used for dyeing purposes, wrote Frank, after he had informed himself concerning it, and also in medicine. There is a belief that it is used by winemakers in colouring claret quite as much as for dyeing cloth or leather. The tree is usually about 25 feet high and 15 inches in diameter. Only the heart of the trunk contains the dyeing substance, and this is the part exported, the outer sap wood being cut off in the forest as soon as the tree is felled. The logwood cutters have a hard life, and their business is less profitable of late years, owing to the extensive use of aniline dyes. The Quethal, a passenger who came on board the steamer at Campeche, had as part of his baggage a cage containing a bird of remarkable plumage. It presented a variety of colours, green, golden, red and white, and its tail feathers were so long that they seemed out of all proportion to the size of the creature's body. Frank and Fred were immediately attracted to it, and asked what it was. It is a Quetzal or Quetzal, was the reply, which was at one time the sacred and imperial bird of Mexico. The one you see here is not a fine specimen. Sometimes you find these birds with the tail feathers four feet long, and in ancient times none but the emperors were permitted to wear them. Perhaps you saw the feather cloak of Montezuma in the museum at the capital. Well, the feathers that adorn that cloak came from the Quetzal, and the bird is so rare that it takes a long time to gather feathers, enough to make a single garment. Difficulties of travel in Campeche the Quetzal is still regarded with much respect by the Indians of this part of the country and of Central America, but less so than in the days of the Montezumas. As it darts through the forest, its feathers flash like a moving rainbow and remind us of the accounts that Eastern travellers have given of the bird of paradise. It is rarely taken alive and is so shy that the hunter can only approach it with difficulty. This region abounds in birds, continued his informant, and also with less pleasing things to meet, snakes. Some of the serpents are large, and others are venomous. It is a fortunate thing for travellers in the forest that the snake seeks safety in flight when he can do so, and does not voluntarily attack man. Birds and small animals are his prey, and he takes them after the same fashion as the serpents of the rest of the world. Fred asked what was the most dangerous of the serpents of this tropical region. The worst I know of, was the reply, is the vivora de sangre, which causes the blood of man or beast to sweat through the pores of the body until the veins are exhausted and the victim dies in a state of utter weakness. It is literally a case of bleeding to death, though not in the ordinary way of opening the veins. Then he told of another serpent called the mica, or whipping snake, which when irritated flattens its head upon the ground and seems to fasten it there. 
Then it lashes on either side with its tail like a whip, and it strikes a blow of wonderful force when its size is considered. Then followed an extended conversation upon the natural history of Campeche and the regions bordering it, but the youths did not take further notes, and so we are unable to repeat what was said. Some of the stories of the traveller were impressed on the mind of Frank more on account of their improbability than for any other peculiarity. He told about serpents thirty feet long that suspended themselves from trees, which overhung pathways and swooped down upon cattle, sheep, and other animals that came within their reach. Frank asked if human beings were exempt from their attacks, and the stranger replied that those who ate plenty of chili colorado with their food were not disturbed, or at any rate the snake would not swallow them, as he wasn't fond of red pepper. He might kill them before finding out the fact, but as soon as he had done so, he would respectfully turn aside and seek other game. Then followed a story about another variety of snake that kills a bird on its nest, and then proceeds to coil affectionately about the eggs and hatch them out. When the young birds appear, he cares for them tenderly, bringing them food in the daytime and at night, nestling over them to protect their unfeathered bodies from the cold and dampness. And I suppose, said Frank, that when he has reared them to a suitable size, he proceeds to eat them up. As to that, the stranger could give no information, and accordingly the youth concluded that the narrative was not based upon personal observation. From Campeche the steamer held her course to Progresso, the principal port of Yucatan. That honour formerly belonged to Cisal, but the advantages of Progresso caused it to be preferred, and now it is the seat of commerce. Not that the harbour amounts to much, as the shallow coast prevents vessels of more than a few feet draught from coming anywhere near it. The passengers were landed in a large rowboat that danced very uneasily upon the waves and disturbed the digestion of some who thus far had borne the movements of the sea without objection. It was a long pull to the shore, but they reached it in safety and resigned themselves to the custom house officials who were waiting at the landing place. The inspection was not very rigorous, as the passengers were from another Mexican port and not from foreign lands. In fact, it was nothing more than a form and was quickly over. Then the strangers had a half hour in which to inspect the town of Progresso. They inspected it and had fifteen minutes to spare. The place is simply a shipping point, and nobody lives there except those whose business connects them with marine matters. It is surrounded by swamps and is damp and unhealthy. It was desirable to get away from it as soon as possible, as it seemed an excellent spot for incorporating fever germs into the system. The population is less than 2,000, not including the tenants of the cemetery, which is said to be liberally patronised. Tropical Railway Train and Station Merida, the capital, is about 30 miles from Progresso, and connected with it by railway. The train rolled slowly along, taking nearly three hours for the journey. But as it has no competition, it has no occasion to hurry. Passengers sometimes complain of the snail-like speed, and are told that they can possibly do better by getting out and walking. Our friends made no complaint as they realised that even at a pace not exceeding ten miles an hour, it was much better than no railway at all. The engine and cars were of American make, and the conductor was a New Yorker, who had become so bronzed by the sun as to be readily taken for a Mexican. This railway was built like a good many other lines in Mexico, said a passenger on the train, who fell into conversation with Dr. Bronson and the youths. All the material was brought from foreign countries and landed at Progresso. It was then hauled in carts to Merida, and the line was built from Merida towards the sea. The same ideas prevailed as in the case of the line between Veracruz and the city of Mexico. The peace of the country would be endangered if the railway should be constructed from the sea coast inland. The story goes that the contractor received a liberal subsidy from the government only on condition that he built from Merida. And as he began to use the line, as soon as he had five or six miles completed, he made money by the operation. There is another story that he was allowed to charge a high price for passengers while the road was under construction, but must come down to a low figure when it was completed. 
The result was that the contractor stopped work before reaching the coast and did not resume for a long time. There was a mile or so of unfinished road and this gave him an excuse for exorbitant rates for passengers. Complaints were so numerous that the government was obliged to interfere and compel him to carry out the spirit as well as the letter of his contract. Flock of Pelicans Frank watched from one side of the train while Fred kept a sharp eye out on the other. Soon after starting, the train passed a lagoon, which abounded in aquatic birds. Duck, teal, egrets, herons, curlews, snipe, pelicans, and the like. Were it not for the liability to fevers, owing to the unhealthy miasmas arising from the lagoon, the region would be an attractive one for sportsmen. Even with its drawbacks, a fair number of hunters find their way there, and some of them praise the locality in glowing terms. After passing the lagoon, the road reaches the coral rock, which is the foundation of Yucatan, and supports a thin and rather dry soil. The youths thought they were again among fields of the maguey plant and haciendas for pulque making, as soon as the solid ground was reached. But their new acquaintance undeceived them. Sizal Hemp These fields that stretch for miles in every direction between the coast and the capital, said he, are not covered with the maguey from which pulque is made, but with henequin. Henequin belongs to the aloe family, as does the maguey, and it is from this plant that a variety of fibre like hemp is produced. When Sizal was the seaport, the product took its name. It is known in commerce as Sizal Hemp, though very little of it comes directly from that place at present. It grows like the maguey on rocks or very thin soil, when nothing else can flourish, and it requires no water or but very little. Take away the henequin plant and the fibre made from it, and Yucatan will be seriously crippled in its commerce. Considerable corn is raised, but it is mostly needed for home consumption. The value of the sizal hemp export is above three millions of dollars, annually, sometimes exceeding and sometimes falling below that figure. Yucatan has no rivers, he continued, and the planters depend entirely upon rains for irrigation. These are supplied by the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, and if this should fail, the country would soon become a desert. The gentleman then gave some information relative to the cultivation of henequin, and the preparation of the fibre, which we will reserve for a later page when the youths have had an opportunity to see the process. Fred made note of the fact that the plant was indigenous to Yucatan and used for the production of fibre long before the advent of the whites. Its exportation in large quantities is a matter of recent times and is steadily increasing. Henikin is grown from shoots, which are cut from the base of the old plants. Three years after the shoots are set out, the plant is large enough for a first crop of leaves to be cut, the cutting goes on for 12 or 15 years, and in the meantime, new shoots are set out every year, so that a plantation is constantly being renewed. When the plant is at its full size, the leaves are four or five feet long. After a plantation is fairly underway and producing regularly, it requires very little attention. Indians of Yucatan The scientific name of sisal hemp is agave sisalensis, or agave sisolana. Properly speaking, it is not hemp at all, and reminds us of the peddler of hot mutton pies, who replied when a customer complained that his wares were frozen, hot mutton pies is the name of them. The true hemp is an annual plant, supposed to be a native of India, whence its culture has spread through the world, and it has no resemblance whatever to henequin or agave sisalana. While we have been talking on this and other topics, the train has been rolling on towards Merida. Frank recorded in his notebook that Yucatan was first seen by the eye of a white man in 1506 and was first visited and partially explored in 1517 by Hernandez de Cordova. The visit of Cordova was not altogether encouraging as the Indians killed or wounded all but one of his companions, among the wounded being Bernal Diaz, the historian of Cortes. Not discouraged by his injuries, Diaz came the following year to Yucatan 
with Grijalva, and in 1519 with Cortes to the same country and Mexico. Mexico and its treasures attracted attention for the next decade or two, and very little thought was given to Yucatan. In 1537 a settlement was effected, but the Spaniards were opposed by a ferocious people, and found time for nothing but fighting until 1540, when they defeated the natives in a great battle on the present site of Merida. After conquering the country they found they had achieved a barren victory, as Yucatan contained neither gold nor silver, the object of all the Spanish conquests in the New World. After their defeat, the Indians seemed to have accepted the situation and acknowledged themselves vassals of the Spaniards. They became Christians, like the people of Mexico, and though they may have been somewhat perplexed in their endeavours to reconcile the precepts and practices of the religion of the white men from beyond the sea, they did not find it worth while to argue vigorously with their masters. From an exceedingly warlike race they became a peaceable one, though they might have been otherwise had their country contained gold and silver mines, in which they would have been put to work as slaves. According to history, they did not forget all the arts of war, or lose their instinct for it. In 1761, and again in 1847, they rebelled against the government, and made a great deal of trouble. And even at the present time there is a section of the country where the Indians are living in open hostility to the authorities. A few thousand of them in the eastern part of Yucatan have made a great deal of trouble, causing towns and villages to be abandoned in consequence of the raids which they make at irregular intervals. Several times they have come into the neighbourhood of Merida and caused a great deal of excitement. Frank and Fred heard terrible stories about these Indians and were cautioned not to go anywhere near their country. If they get hold of a white man, said their informant, they cut him to pieces immediately without waiting for any explanation, or else they take him to one of their villages and torture him in the most cruel manner for the amusement of the women and children. They live among the hills, swamps and forests of the southeastern part of the country. And though several expeditions have been sent against them, it seems impossible to penetrate to their retreats. They have a very little trade with the English residents of British Honduras, but refuse to allow them to enter their country. One Englishman, who had dealt with them for several years, ventured to go there, and was never seen or heard of again. Retreating from Hostile Indians they are constantly making threats of destroying Merida, and as these stories are circulated, they greatly alarm the timid portion of the inhabitants. It is not likely that they really intend anything of the kind, as they would probably be defeated, but they know the value of rumours and keep them constantly circulating. In this way they have diminished the population and business of Valladolid more than one half. It was once a prosperous city, but is now languishing, and many of its houses are in ruins. End of chapter 28
The woodwork was bright with paint and gilding, and over the frame was drawn a cover of white linen to ward off rain and dust, together with the heat of the sun, which is by no means light in the Yucatan. Fred suggested that it was a wise provision of nature to seat the driver on the horse, as he could not conveniently go to sleep there. A somewhat rickety carriage to hold four persons was secured, and in this conveyance the travelers proceeded to the only hotel of which Merida can boast. Until recently, the place had no hotel whatever, and strangers were obliged to hunt lodgings for themselves, or apply to their consular representative or a foreign merchant. Even as it is, a letter of introduction to a resident is a very useful document. Few travelers go to Merida, and the universal testimony of those who have been there is that the residents are hospitable. The same may be said generally of the inhabitants of the towns, villages, and haciendas throughout Yucatan. The streets of Merida are broader than those of many other Mexican cities, but their pavement does not attract attention by its excellence. The houses are of stone and mostly but a single story in height. The entrance is generally through an arched doorway into a courtyard, and the windows that face the street are invariably graded and nearly all without glass. The construction of the houses suggests Moorish and Spanish architecture, together with some features peculiar to the dwellings of the natives. Merida stands on the site of a native city, where a great and decisive battle was fought in 1540. According to the Spanish historians, there were 200 Spaniards against 40,000 Indians. Doubtless the figures are not exact, but it is quite likely that the defeated army was vastly superior in numbers to the invaders. The Spanish had, of course, the advantage of firearms, as they had in the conquest of Mexico, and we have seen in previous pages what a great advantage it was. The Indians had only spears, swords, and bows and arrows, and their bodily defenses were tunics of wadded cotton. These tunics were efficient against their own kind of weapons, but of little use to repel a musket ball. The cannon of the Spaniards created terrible havoc among them, and one chronicler says that when the Indians were heavily massed, the cannonballs tore through them and mowed down hundreds at every discharge. Whereas now the Plaza Mayor was a mound of stone and earth at the time of the conquest. On the top of the mound was an altar on which sacrifices were made. But the natives were not as much addicted to them as were the people of Mexico. This very circumstance has much to do with the success of Cortes in his conquest. The Aztecs sought to take their enemies alive in order to sacrifice them on their altars. And it is said that Cortes himself was in their hands on two occasions. They might easily have killed him, but while they were leading him away uninjured, in order that he should be kept for sacrifice, he was rescued by his followers. The mound referred to was torn down for the sake of the building material it contained, and the same was the case with many other mounds and pyramids in its neighborhood. Very much of the material of which Merida is constructed was obtained from these edifices. The streets cross each other at right angles, and Frank observed something which he thought quite original in the naming of the streets. Here is his memorandum on the subject. For the convenience of the Indians, who could not read or write Spanish or anything else, in fact, the streets were named after birds and beasts. In addition to the Spanish name in letters, there was the figure of the creature after which the street was called. The street of the ox had the figure of an ox in stone or plaster, or painted on the wall. The street of the flamingo presented a tall flamingo with a beak of fiery red. And the street of the elephant had a well-molded figure of that animal with enormous trunk and tusks. The idea is a capital one, 
and I'm surprised it has been so little utilized. It is utilized more than you think, said Dr. Bronson, when Frank called his attention to the subject. You remember that in Russia and other countries where large numbers of the population cannot read, the shopkeepers ornament their signs with pictures of the things they have to sell. And the custom is by no means unknown in our own land. A watchmaker hangs out a wooden watch. A bootmaker displays a boot or shoe. And a druggist shows a mortar and pestle. You remember how convenient it was in the Far East for the servants who did not know a single Roman letter that the canned fruits, meats, and vegetables from America and England bore on their labels a picture of the article contained in the can? Certainly I do remember, replied the youth. After all, there's nothing new under the sun, though the application of the idea here is something we have not before seen. There are twelve or fifteen squares, or plazas, in the city. The most important being, of course, the central one, known as the Plaza Mayor. The cathedral and the Casa Municipal, or City Hall, face upon this square. And on one side of it is the oldest house in the city, dating from 1549. The city was founded in 1542 by Don Francisco de Montejo, the son of the governor of the province of Yucatan and bearing exactly the same name. Montejo, Jr. was lieutenant governor and captain general, and the old house just mentioned, which is one of the sites of Merida, was built by him. The facade is ornamented with sculptures, which are said to have been made by Indians after designs supplied by the Spaniards. They represent the conquerors trampling on the bodies of natives who have been made non-resistant by the removal of their heads. It was probably the idea of Montejo that the sight of these sculptures would deter the Indians from any further resistance to the white men who came from beyond the sea and brought the Christian religion to replace the paganism which they found here. The hotel in which our friends were lodged is also on the great square, directly opposite the old house of Montejo, which was the first building to which the youths gave special attention. Most of the buildings fronting the square are of more than one story. In fact, the best architecture of the place may be said to be in that neighborhood. The Casa Municipal is an imposing building of two stories with broad porticos supported on arches. It has a high tower from which watchmen are supposed to be constantly on the lookout for fires, though Owing to the material used in the construction of Merida and the absence of stoves and furnaces, fires are of exceedingly rare occurrence. The first thing to attract our attention as we strolled through the streets, wrote Fred, was the dress of the people. The men, I am speaking of the native Indians, wear cotton trousers or drawers, which are tight at the waist and descend to the knee or below it. Sometimes they have shirts on their backs and sometimes none. But in the latter case, a man is reasonably certain to have one folded away in his hat, to be worn on state occasions or when the rules of society demand. Some of them wear a long shirt and no trousers, and altogether the wardrobe of a native of the lower class is not costly. Frequently, we see men with one leg of the trousers rolled up, and the other hanging down, and it is a comical sight when a half a dozen thus arrayed are grouped together. A very noticeable feature about the shirt is that it is worn with the flaps outside, like a carter's frock or jumper, and not inside as in northern countries. The dress of the women is a skirt, hanging from the waist to the ground, and a white uipil, or outer garment, that hangs from the shoulders to the ground, like a loose wrapper. It is the traditional dress of 300 years ago, and the fashion has not changed at all in that time. On Sundays and feast days, both sexes are arrayed in spotless white, but on other days their garments are apt to be more or less dingy. Compared to the Mexicans, the Yucateos, 
as the people of Yucatan are called, are wonderfully cleanly in their dress and ways. And it is as rare to see a dirty Yucateco as it is to see a clean Aztec. The ui peel of the women has short sleeves and is not as high in the neck as the close-fitted dresses of New England, but it is a modest and neat-looking dress, and the whiteness of the material makes a fine contrast with the dark skin of the wearer. Many of the women are pretty, and we do not wonder that the Spanish conquerors were loud in their praises of the comeliness of the feminine part of the inhabitants of Yucatan. Their eyes are black as coals, and their sight is as sharp as that of the traditional Indian everywhere. Altogether, the people have a close resemblance to the Malay race, and we have but to close our eyes a moment to imagine ourselves once more in Batavia or Singapore. The people are of the Maya race, and here, in the name, we have a near approach to Malay. By some, they are supposed to be an ancient people who lived here before the advent of the Toltecs, which happened about the 12th century. Others believe them to be a combination of two races, the Toltecs from the west and another race from the islands of the Caribbean Sea. Landa, Stevens, Squire, and other writers say the Mayans were the most civilized people of America. They had an alphabet and a literature, cultivated the soil, had rude machinery for manufacturing textile and other fabrics, possessed sailing vessels, and had a circulating medium which corresponded to the money of the old world. The great temples of Palenque and other cities of this part of the world were built by this people, or by tribes and races closely allied to them. We have shown by our accounts of Palenque and Lorillard City that these temples were of no mean architecture, and we shall have more to say when we come to the ruined cities of Yucatan. According to the Spanish historians, the people were ruled despotically by a king and were divided into nobles, priests, common people, and slaves. The king, nobles, and priests held the greater part of the lands. The land of the common people was held on the communistic principle, and each man had enough to cultivate for the support of his family. The commoners were obliged to supply the noble with fish, game, salt, and other things he wanted, to cultivate his land, and to follow him to war whenever he chose to go on a campaign. In fact, the condition of the peasants in Yucatan was much like that of the subjects of a Raja of India before the English took possession of the country, or of a daimyo of Japan. They had nothing they could call their own, not even their lives, and their condition was not at all improved by the conquest of the country by the Spaniards, except that they were not liable to be taken for sacrificial purposes, according to the ancient customs. Slavery has been abolished, and imprisonment for debt is no longer allowed by law. But every man between the ages of 21 and 50 can be drafted for military service. When so employed, he receives six cents a day and supplies his own food. Merida has a population of about 50,000, by far the greater number of them being of Indian blood, either pure or mixed. There is a large proportion of mestizos, or half-castes, and they are the handsomest part of the population. We have seen some mestizo women who could compete successfully in a beauty show, including Mrs. Langtree and all the other professionals of the day. The mestizos inhabit a part of the town by themselves, where their thatched huts stand in quarter-acre lots planted with grass and trees. These huts are said to be very much like those occupied by the Indians before the conquest. You know, we always go to the marketplace in every strange city that we visit, and may be sure that we did not omit that of Merida. It is not unlike the marketplaces of Mexican cities in general, but has some features peculiarly its own. Half the population of the city 
seem to have gathered there. Indians, mestizos, Spaniards, foreigners, and dogs. And there was a hum of voices which never ceased for an instant. The manners of the natives are more pleasing than those of the people in the markets of Mexico. They chat good-naturedly and with many a smile, as though they enjoyed coming to the market without regard to whether they sell anything or not. A great deal of bargaining is necessary in making purchases, for the Indian has no notion of the value of time, and for the matter of that, the tropical resident, whatever his nationality, is rarely in a hurry. We passed many picturesque groups, fruit sellers with their wares and broad baskets, their heads wrapped in rebozos, either white or colored, and their eyes shining like little globes of polished anthracite set in their brown skins. These fruit sellers were so numerous near the entrance of the market that it was no easy matter to get past them into the open space beyond. A medio would buy all the oranges, bananas, or mangoes that one would care for. Frank and I invested two medios, 12 cents, in oranges, and distributed them to a lot of boys that were strolling through the place. They took the fruit with an air of gratitude combined with dignity, and during the rest of our stay, several of them followed us about in the hope that our princely generosity would be renewed. The square where the market was held was filled with little shelters to keep off the heat of the sun. These shelters were made by sticking up poles so as to hold a piece of matting or common cloth in a horizontal position. Under each of these impromptu tents, a vendor was seated, generally a woman or a girl, and the articles for sale were spread on the ground. Eggs, fruit, lettuce, peas, beans, and kindred products of the garden were thus displayed, and the wonder seemed to be that nobody trod upon the wares, which were certainly endangered by careless feet. Mules and donkeys with large panniers on each side brought loads of things to be disposed of. But the greater part of the burdens were borne on the backs of men. Occasionally, a man on horseback appeared in the market, and once in a while a policeman showed himself, though his presence did not appear to be needed at all. We did not hear or see anything that approached a quarrel, and were told that fights were of very rare occurrence. Some of these shelters are restaurants on a small scale, and one day we went to the market to take a medio breakfast, being assured that it was one of the sensations of the country. We sought one of the most attractive restaurants we could find and squatted on the ground, close to the one individual who was proprietor, chef, head waiter, waiter, and everybody else. Our breakfast was a stew of frijoles, chili con carne, and tortillas. It was served to us in jicaras, or half-shells of some kind of tree fruit whose name we did not learn. No spoons or forks were supplied. We used the tortillas for spoons and afterwards devoured them in true Mexican style. As Sam Weller said of veal pie, a, a medio breakfast in a Yucateo restaurant is very filling at the price. The Yucateos are as devoted to the tortilla as are the inhabitants of the rest of Mexico, and the native cooks are expert in its manufacture. While in the market, we met our acquaintance of the railway train. His first question was as to whether we had seen how the natives practice gambling, and his second, have you tried euchre? We thought it a singular question, and Frank replied that neither of us played that or any other game of cards. He laughed and said, I don't mean euchre, I mean yucca. We looked rather puzzled, I'm sure, and then with another laugh he pointed to a pile of something that looked very much like rutabaga turnips, such as cattle are fed with in some parts of the United States. That, he said, is yucca, and it belongs to the same family as the mogwai and henequen. As soon as he said this, we remembered to have seen the plant in Mexico. 
We had just been talking about the fondness of the people for gambling, and hence our misunderstanding. We bought a medio's worth of the article and tasted it. The flavor was something like that of a sweet turnip, and not at all disagreeable. I can really understand that one might become fond of it, and our friend said that it was quite nutritious. The root is eaten by the natives. The fibers furnish a textile fabric like henequen, and soap is made from the stalk and leaves. Recently, an enterprising American has manufactured a preparation for the hair from a yucca plant, and it is said to possess remarkable powers for restoring hair to heads that for years have been as smooth as an ostrich egg. While on the subject of gambling, we will mention the popular amusement of la loteria, or the lottery. Our guide took us into a large hall which is open to the public, or rather to anybody who can force his way through the dense crowd at the door. All classes seem to have assembled there, rich and poor, were seated at the same tables, and their object seemed to be amusement rather than gain. The stakes were very small, ordinarily a medio, and in a few instances dos reales. The room was hot as an oven, brilliantly lighted, and every foot of standing and sitting room was occupied, and white people of all grades in life, gentlemen as well as ladies, negroes, Indians, and mestizos crowded together at the tables, which were in two rows, the whole length of the hall. The amusement is licensed by the government, which sells sheets of paper for a real each, on which the game is played. It is done by a combination of numbers, all the way from 1 to 90. These numbers are arranged on the paper or cards in different combinations, no two cards being alike. Each player buys a card and places it in front of him on the table. Then a hat or a basket is passed around and each one puts in his medio or whatever else the stake may be. When the money has all been collected and the amount of the stake announced, the game begins. In addition to his card, each player has a pile of grains of corn in front of him and a stick with which to rap on the table when the time to do so arrives. The object is to get a row of five numbers on the cards from the numbers which are drawn, and the one who first gets a row wins the purse. On a platform, in full view of everybody, is a man with a bag containing wooden or ivory balls on which the numbers from 1 to 90 are painted. When the game is to begin, the man draws a ball from the bag and announces the number on it, and the player who finds that number on his card places a grain of corn over the figures. One after another, numbers are called out in a voice that rises above all the confusion of sounds with which the place is filled, and each time a number is called, it is marked with the corn. Everybody is intently watching his card, and there is a crowd of spectators looking over the shoulders of the players. Men, women, children, white, black, yellow, and all other colors possible to humanity are there. And so are all the dresses of Yucatan, from the uniform of the high official and the satin or silk of the grand dame of society, down to the cotton garb of the Indian, and quite likely his bare shoulders with no garb at all. Three-fourths of those present are smoking, and the atmosphere is like a morning fog, only a great deal worse. By and by, someone raps sharply on the table with his stick to indicate that he has made a row of five numbers, and stands up in his place. Then the man on the platform calls the drawn numbers again, and if the announcement of the row is correct, the winner takes the purse. As the stake is small, he does not win a great deal, but evidently he is the envy of his less fortunate neighbors. Mistakes occur sometimes, and then there is a tumult, in which knives may be drawn and things become very lively for the bystanders. 
We did not stay long in the place, you may be sure, but we came away convinced that La Loteria is less ruinous to the pockets of the players than many other games of chance. An American gentleman with whom we talked on the subject said that this game is not unlike one known in some other parts of the world under the name of Kino. He told us that there were many other forms of gambling in Yucatan, most of them being forbidden by the government and consequently played less openly than the lottery. He told us that there was heavy gambling in the clubs, and some of them, the play is only for gold, silver being considered too insignificant and bulky for the amusement of gentlemen. We thought it was very much to the credit of the people of Merida that the utmost good nature seemed to prevail in the dense crowd at the hall we visited. We did not hear a rude word, or witness a rude act of any kind. And the only exception, we are told, is when there is a quarrel growing out of the drawing of the numbers from the bag. End of chapter 29 Read by Danny Hamilton, Progresso, Yucatan August 9th, 2022Chapter 30 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 30 The market we have described, wrote Fred, is for the sale of articles of food only. There is another market where pottery, cotton fabrics and other miscellaneous wares are sold and still another which is entirely given up to the makers and vendors of hats and hammocks hammock making is a great industry in yucatan and thousands of these articles are sent to new york london and other foreign ports a curious circumstance about this industry is that the best hammocks are those for home consumption the foreign markets are unwilling to pay the prices of the fine qualities and consequently none are sent away except upon special orders. When you next buy a Yucatan hammock in New York, you may make up your mind that it is one in which only a very poor man here would sleep. Hammocks are in use for sleeping purposes all through this country, and the natives prefer them to beds. Our personal experience is that a hammock is a very good thing to lounge in or even take a nap, but for an all-night sleep, it doesn't give the rest and refreshment to the tired body that we find in a bed. But habit has a great deal to do with this, as with many other things of life. A Japanese pillow is torture to a European quite as much as the European one is to a Japanese. The advantages claimed for a hammock are that the sleeper is protected from many insects that would trouble him in a bed, and the opportunity for the air to circulate which is a very desirable matter in a hot country. Both these arguments are well founded, and so is the further one that the hammock sleeper can carry his bed with him, as it weighs only a few ounces and can be rolled into a small parcel. We asked the prices and were staggered at the figures. In New York, we think two dollars a good price, and the majority of the hammocks sold there bring one dollar or one dollar fifty cents each. The cheapest they showed us was $7, and they had them all the way up to $15, $18, $20, $25, and even $30. The dealer said that if these were not fine enough for our purpose, we might have them made to order, and he could give us something superb for $50. We bought some of the cheapest kind, and they were far better than anything we ever saw at home. The best qualities are made of very fine fiber and if care is taken with them, they last for several years. While walking along the streets near the market, we met some ladies to whom we had been introduced. They recognized and saluted us. They were on the opposite sidewalk, and at first we thought they were beckoning for us to cross over to their side. Then we remembered what we had been told about the Yucateo form of salutation, and replied by raising our hats and bowing. This is what they did. Each lady raised her hand until it was on a level with her eyes, and then she wiggled her fingers back and forth in a way that is impossible to describe in words. It is very much 
what one would do in our country if we wish to speak to you and we can readily believe what we have been told that this form of salutation is a great puzzle to the stranger one day an englishman who was thus saluted went up to his fair recognizer a lady to whom he had been presented at a party on the previous evening and stood waiting for her to begin the conversation she was accompanied by another lady neither of whom could speak english while the englishman did not know a word of any language but his own the situation was awkward and after both had pronounced several phrases that the other side could not comprehend the englishman bowed and proceeded to walk away the lady repeated the merida salutation and this puzzled the stranger more than ever as he supposed she wished him to follow he gallantly complied and walked demurely along till he happened to meet the gentleman who had introduced him explanations followed and all parties concerned had a good laugh over the occurrence it is probable that the englishman's laugh was less hearty than that of the others as he could not fail to be somewhat mortified at his awkward misunderstanding in the fashionable hours for strolling on the paseo everybody is there and no matter how often you meet any one whom you know you are expected to salute this keeps everybody on the alert as the turns of the paseo are likely to bring the same individuals face to face every few minutes it was our good fortune to be in merida in the season of dancing and we were invited to go to a ball in fact to several balls we went first to an aristocratic one which was given in the casino a large two-storied building with balconies or verandas all around and brilliantly lighted it is built around a courtyard planted with tropical trees and flowers in great profusion and is a very attractive place the ballroom occupied three sides of the upper story of the building while the fourth contained the dressing and supper rooms the orchestra was in the corridor just outside the dancing hall and while everybody could hear the music very few could see the musicians we got there before the dance began and while the ladies were coming out of the dressing rooms and taking seats at the side of the ballroom very much as they are seated in other countries we observed that the gentlemen held the ladies by the hand as they escorted them to their seats and not by giving them their arms as we do it was a real beauty show when the ladies were ranged along the wall and they seemed to know it just as well as did their admirers who congregated at one end of the hall and in the corridors and smoked cigarettes the gentlemen chatted with each other with more or less animation but watched the line of senoritas whose eyes sparkled like diamonds and were a sharp contrast to their pearly white teeth under the light of the senoritas complexions were as glowing as that of a young english girl of course we cannot say how much of it is due to nature and how much to cosmetics they all had splendid heads of coal-black hair arranged in the tasteful way for which spanish ladies are famous the music struck up for a waltz and then each gentleman advanced toward the lady of his choice and whirled her away for the round of the hall the theory of these balls is that everybody knows everybody else and the gentlemen did not ask the ladies whether they wanted to dance or not of course it is to be presumed that they were there with that object in view but we thought it would be more graceful if they had been consulted before being lifted from their seats and set in motion we had wondered how it was possible for people to dance in this hot atmosphere but when we heard how slowly the music played and saw that the waltz was only a slow gliding and sliding over the floor as though the waltzers were not more than half awake we wondered no longer it is nothing like the exciting whirl of a waltz in northern countries and the same may be said of the other dances of this very select assemblage we remained half an hour or so and then went to the mestizo ball where it was a good deal more animated the mestizo girls wore the white dresses already described some of them had only a few ribbons or flowers for ornaments while others were loaded down with bracelets rings and other ornaments in which diamonds had a more or less prominent part a gentleman who was with us said many of the diamonds were hired for the occasion and he had no doubt that a good share of them were paste the men were the most comical sights you can imagine as they all wore their hats and most of them had their shirts waving outside after the custom of the country 
some of them had coats and jackets a man thus clad was looked upon as an aristocrat but to be so considered he was obliged to suffer some inconvenience as the outer garment is a serious burden in the heavy tropical atmosphere made doubly oppressive by the heat of the room two or three men carried their jackets on their arms and some flung them into a corner at the risk of never finding them again the musicians were native indians who played with perfect time and melody as though they had graduated from the schools of the most accomplished masters of europe all these people are natural musicians a very little instruction suffices for them and with careful training they ought to be able to astonish the world the men and women dance to perfection we did not see a false step taken during the time we looked on at the ball and yet it is not likely that any of the dancers ever had the advantage of a professional instructor the members of the orchestra at the mestizo ball were dressed in the shirt and drawers already mentioned and like the dancing men of the party retained their hats all the time they played the dances were more interesting than those of the fashionable ball inasmuch as the latter were european in character while those of the mestizos had a peculiarity of their own one was called the zopilote or buzzard dance a man and a woman each carrying a handkerchief which they twirled above their heads and in all sorts of directions whirled and twisted themselves along the floor all the while keeping perfect time to the music of the performers it reminded us very much of one of the national dances of the russians which is often given by the ballet troops of the imperial theatres of moscow and st petersburg and may be seen in its simplicity in almost any town or village of the great northern empire but more interesting to us than either of the balls we have mentioned was that of the indians where they were indulging in historic dances which had been preserved from ancient times when we entered the room which was pretty well filled with people who respectfully made way for us the performance had already begun we will remark here that the ancient yucateos like the parsees were worshippers of the sun the reverence for that luminary has descended to this day though it is by no means preserved in its former purity mr ober the author of travels in mexico seems to have witnessed a better performance of this dance than we did as he saw the beginning which we did not see so we will quote his account which is as follows the first thing these indians did was to spread a banner in the centre of the room on which was painted a figure of the sun with two people kneeling in adoration of it the chief of this band of about twenty indians then suspended from his neck a bright colored representation of the sun stamped on tin at the foot of the banner staff crouched an old man with a drum made by stretching the skin of a calf or goat over one end of a hollow log at the side of the drum hung the shell of a land tortoise and the old man beat the drum and rattled the shell in unison the article with which he beat the drum attracted my attention and i examined it and found it to be the gilded horn of a deer this hollow drum with turtle shell and deer's antler fully confirms the statement that the music is aboriginal for one of the old chroniclers in an account of a terrible battle with the indians of campeche writing not long after the event says that they made a most horrible and deafening noise with these instruments they had flutes and large seashells for trumpets and turtle shells which they struck with deer's horns after the banner was spread the band ran around in it a crouching attitude in one hand each held a rattle and in the other a fan of turkey feathers with a handle formed by the foot and claw of the bird each one wore a wire mask with a handkerchief over his head and a mantle embroidered with figures of animals and hung with small seashells the costume was that of the mestizo women a skirt from the waist to the ankles with their peculiar dress over it just such a one as was worn by their ancestors centuries ago and by the ancient egyptians on their feet they wore sandals tied on with hempen rope the chief was distinguished by a high crown of peacock feathers he chanted something in the maya language and they replied and then the music struck up a weird strain and they danced furiously assuming ludicrous postures 
yet all having seeming significance shaking their rattles and fans to right and left and all keeping perfect time after nearly half an hour of dancing they stopped at a signal from the chief and gathered about the banner gazing upon the image of the sun with looks of adoration this was the dance of sorrow or supplication after it came the dance of joy an indian fandango then the flag was furled and the floor occupied by two couples their night in the round of balls caused our friends to sleep rather late the next morning while they were at breakfast an invitation came to visit a hennequin hacienda near the city in the company of one of the owners to whom they had been introduced it is hardly necessary to say that they accepted at once they were to start at an early hour on the following morning and at the appointed time a volant cocher was announced at the door frank's description of this vehicle will be interesting to our readers it is the travelling carriage of yucatan and well adapted to the bad roads of the country it consists of a shallow box on two wheels the box being suspended on leather springs and having a thick mattress spread over the bottom and just filling it one or two europeans form a load for one of these carriages but it will easily hold half a dozen natives of assorted sizes there are no seats one is obliged to lie at full length or sit turkish fashion and hold on with one or both hands dr broadson says the volant cochet is warmly recommended for dyspeptics as it is guaranteed to kill or cure them in a very short time the driver sits on the footboard very much as in a canadian caleche and if there is any baggage it is piled on a projecting frame behind the passengers the carriage has a top to shelter passengers from sun and rain and there are curtains to be let down or rolled up as one may wish three mules are the regulation team for a volant cochet they are harnessed abreast and under the control of a vigorous driver they get over the roads with commendable rapidity when all things are considered there is a great deal of swing to the vehicle and it overturns occasionally though not often the roads of yucatan are not at all good one man told us they were made by cortez three and a half centuries ago and have never had a dollar of expenditure for repairs since they were constructed as our friends went to the door they met their host who had just descended from the carriage and was ready for them frank and fred wondered if all four of them the host and his three guests were to ride in one cochet and while the wonderment continued another vehicle of the same kind came dashing around the corner their entertainer mr Hanrades, suggested that dr bronson and himself would ride in one carriage while the two youths occupied the other as they were to spend a night at the hacienda each of the travellers carried a small handbag and these articles added to some cushions which mr Hanredes had thoughtfully placed in the seatless vehicles added considerably to the comfort of the ride away they dashed along the rough streets of merida and out through the thickly shaded suburbs they met dozens of natives bringing into the city loads of country produce to sell in the marketplace the bearers bent beneath their burdens and many of them had travelled all night in order to reach the city in the morning the most conspicuous of these porters were the sellers of Rimon, the branches of a tree that serve as food for horses and mules which eat the leaves and twigs of Rimon as they do grass or hay according to its bulk the stuff is very light and a Rimon seller is completely hidden beneath his apparently enormous but really comfortable load mr Honredes made things interesting said fred by getting up a race between our two carriages he promised two reals to the driver who would get first to a village which he named and the fellows went at it in earnest they stood up on the shafts of their vehicles and yelled at their mules at the same time they were not sparing of their whips and the result was that the poor beasts went at a furious gallop for a mile or more our driver got in advance and as we saw that the race would be kept up as long as the teams could run frank and i suggested to him that we would give him three reals to let the other man win he immediately accepted the offer and dropped to the rear shouting something in maya to his competitor as the latter passed him 
after that we went on at a more respectable pace and were heartily glad that the breakneck speed was not kept up at the village the name of which i have forgotten we rested ten or fifteen minutes and then went on reaching the hacienda just as the forenoon was beginning to be uncomfortably warm the great heat of yucatan renders it desirable to make all journeys in the night as much as possible and hence our early start from merida the hacienda covers a large area of ground there being thousands of acres devoted to the culture of henequen then there is a considerable amount of sugar and corn grown on the place enough for the use of all the employees and something more besides in the sugar-making industry the machinery is primitive the cane being crushed in a mill propelled by oxen in the old-fashioned way and the sugar obtained from the juice by the processes of half a century ago the real profit of the hacienda is in the production of fiber and in this the latest machinery is in use the old process of making fiber by hand is altogether discarded as unprofitable and the stripping of the leaves of the henequen is performed by great machines built in the united states or england and driven by a powerful steam engine of american make the machinery is not all complex and it is evident that no great ingenuity was required to invent it the scraper consists of a large wheel armed with strong and blunt knives all around its rim the henequen leaves are pressed against this rim and by means of a lever worked by the hand and foot of an indian the knives drawn by the swiftly revolving wheel remove it in an instant the pulp which covers the fiber and lay it bare considerable dexterity is required for this work and we looked on in admiration at the deftness of the indian who performed it the pulp being removed the fiber is taken from the leaf in long strips like a hank of very fine silk thread of a beautiful green tinge it is made into small bundles and placed in the sun to dry in drying it loses its color and becomes white and silky and when thoroughly dried it is ready for baling the only care requisite in the drying process is to see that it does not get wet by the rain and that all its natural moisture is expelled unless this is the case it will ferment after baling and fermentation means a great reduction in the commercial value of the article we watched the machine turning out the fiber and then went to the baling house where the stuff was being put up by a cotton press into bales of about 450 pounds each in this condition it is shipped to market one scraper requiring the labor of four men to tend it will produce about one bale of fiber daily provided the leaves are a fairly good size and quality and the workmen are not novices the average value of hennequin fiber is about twenty dollars a bale delivered at the nearest railway station of course it has its ups and downs like any other commodity in the world after our friends had looked at the machines and partaken of a hearty breakfast the fact is that the breakfast came before the inspection of the scraping and baling departments they took a siesta according to the custom of the country until the cool hours of the afternoon then they mounted horses and accompanied mr honrades in a ride over the estate and through the fields of hennequin plants as they rode along and paused occasionally to contemplate objects of special interest the gentleman explained some of the features of the business if you have decided to go into an enterprise of this sort said he you must first get your land by buying it from the government or a private owner who is generally the descendant of somebody who obtained an immense grant in consequence of some real or fancied service to the spanish crown the land is covered by a sort of scrub which must be cleared away the clearing is effected by cutting and burning the cutting being done one season and the burning the next then the young plants are set out in holes dug in the thin soil they are set about eight feet apart and take root at once you have doubtless learned already that the plants are in condition for cutting when they are five years old and will yield leaves annually for fifteen or twenty years a good planter will so arrange it that new plants are constantly coming to maturity and this he will do by setting out a certain quantity of new ones every year frank asked how many leaves were required for a bale of fiber from six to eight thousand was the reply according as they are large or small 
their size depends considerably upon the amount of rain which falls in the few weeks preceding the time they are cut is all the fiber made at the hacienda sent out of the country queried fred not literally all said the gentleman but for practical purposes the whole of it is exported four-fifths of our product is sent to the united states where it is used for cordage bagging and many other things of the same sort and most of the rest to europe there are two or three small factories here in yucatan for making coarse cloth ropes and twine out of the fiber they are owned by americans or englishmen and their machinery is of foreign make mostly american with the exception of the overseer engineer and machinist all the employees are natives many of them being mestizo girls who are as skillful as the girls of any other country in tending the looms where the cloth is woven these factories purchase their fiber from the haciendas but their consumption is small the indians use a great deal of fiber in making articles for their personal needs but they generally scrape it by hand they are very conservative and if permitted to have their own way they would destroy every machine in the country before sunset tomorrow it was evening before the ride was concluded and the party returned to the hacienda where a dinner of substantial character awaited them of course mr hanrades insisted that there was no money in the business and said he would be glad to sell out for less than what his estate had cost him but fred made a mental note of the fact that he did not name any price at which he would sell and that he lived in princely style both at the hacienda and in merida he had two sons at school in paris a daughter was being educated in merida by a specially imported governess and the gentleman himself spent a good half of his time in other countries from these facts and from information of various kinds that reached them the youths concluded that the hennequin culture was profitable and in this view they had many supporters both in the country and out of it end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the boy travelers in mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b the boy travelers in mexico by thomas wallace knox chapter thirty one would you like to see a cenote said mr Honradis, just before our friends retired for the night certainly replied dr bronson for himself and the youths while the latter wondered what a cenote was well i'll show you one in the morning was the reply then there was an exchange of wishes all around for a pleasant slumber and in a little while everybody was in bed or rather in hammock our friends had brought their hammocks as part of their luggage and when they were ready to retire they found those useful articles stretched in the corridor of the principal dwelling of the hacienda in a place that afforded ample ventilation whether it was owing to the unexpected cenote or the unrestful character of a night's novitiate in a hammock we are unable to say but the youths were up somewhat earlier than usual and eager to begin the day dr bronson was not far behind them and they did not have to wait long for their host when he appeared he was followed by a mozo carrying an armful of towels and after a hearty greeting led the way to a small house at a little distance from the stables of the hacienda fred suggested to his cousin while their host was in conversation with dr bronson that the cenote was probably some kind of game and they would quite likely have it for breakfast perhaps said he they keep it alive and kill it when wanted and this house may be the place where it is shut up i think it's something to wear replied frank and the house is the storeroom possibly though it's some kind of vegetable like celery or onions anyway we'll find out soon they were speedily enlightened on the subject on reaching the house in question mr Honradis explained that it was the entrance to a private cenote of his own you are already aware said he that there are no rivers in yucatan and have learned from experience that we have plenty of water notwithstanding the absence of streams beneath the calcareous formation on which the whole of the peninsula stands there are streams and lakes of water which are reached through natural or artificial openings in the surface rock these openings whether natural or artificial are called cenotes and some of them are of great depth sometimes they are mere pits or wells 
and on the other hand there are cenotes which form large grottoes with lakes of considerable size the water is clear and cool and entirely wholesome we use the cenotes for obtaining our supply of water and also for bathing this is our bathing house he continued and i brought you here for your morning bath you will find bathing trousers in the rooms and can undress and come down as soon as you like he showed them the way into their dressing rooms and then disappeared into a room of his own when the youths reappeared in appropriate costume their host called to them from somewhere down in the interior of the earth and they proceeded in the direction of the voice by a sloping and slippery stairway cut in the rock they descended some thirty-five or forty feet till they reached a pool of clear water over which the rock rounded in a high dome nearly to the surface a hole two or three feet in diameter and covered with an iron grating opened in the center of the dome and gave light enough to show the interior of the place very fairly many stalactites hung from the roof and stalagmites stood up wherever they could find standing room from the grotto where our friends found themselves little nooks and small grottoes open so that the spot was by no means unattractive numerous lizards clung to the rock or swam in the water and these crawling and slimy things took away many of the merits the bathing place might have possessed the lizards do no harm said mr Honradius, but they are not pleasant to look at and we would gladly drive them out if we could there is a curious bird called the toe which lives in the cenotes it has a soft plumage and sports a long tail of only two feathers which have nothing on their stems until the very tip is reached if you look sharp you may possibly see an eyeless fish similar to the fishes which are found in the mammoth cave in kentucky the youths looked in every direction and though frank thought he saw one of these strange members of the finny tribe he was unable to capture it frank asked if the cenotes communicated with each other or were separately supplied from the rain sinking into the ground we cannot say that all of them are connected was the reply but it is certain that some of them are many contain streams with perceptible currents and it has been observed that at times the cenotes are full of alligators while at others none can be found there as the alligator cannot pierce its way through solid rock there must be channels which connect with large bodies of water where the alligators live at the suggestion of alligators frank and fred intimated that they did not care to stay long in the water and their search for eyeless fish was abandoned in favor of the larger game mr Honredes laughed and said there was not the slightest danger as no alligator larger than a rat could possibly make its way into the place where they were as all the entrance channels were very small thus reassured they remained tranquil and enjoyed the plunge and swim in the cool water meanwhile their host explained that these sources of water supply had been known from very ancient times long before the conquest the inhabitants built their towns near the water holes and at the present time any one desiring to establish a hacienda seeks first a good cenote and locates his buildings near it on returning from the bath the host showed them the well which supplied the hacienda with water peons drew the water in buckets at the end of a long rope passing over a windlass and poured it into a large trough whence it was taken by the servants from the kitchen or allowed to flow in pipes to the engine house stables or wherever else it was needed in nearly every village throughout yucatan said mr Honredes, you will find a well of this sort in the public square it is called a noria and the usual mode of drawing water is by an endless rope passing over a wheel and carrying small buckets these bring up the water from below and as they turn over the wheel they pour their contents into a trough the system is almost an exact copy of that in use in egypt centuries before yucatan was heard of the rude machine is propelled by a mule walking in a circle and driven by a boy the mule is invariably an old one fit for no other work and sometimes a horse or ox likewise old and poor is found in its place i suppose the village pays for the mule and the driver one of the youths remarked yes was the reply and the payment is by direct taxation every person who takes a jar of water is expected to leave a handful of corn in payment this corn goes for the support of the boy and the animal 
and to judge by the condition of the beast, the lion's share of the tax is taken by the boy. The conversation about the curious wells of Yucatan came to an end with several stories concerning them. One was that in the town of Tabi there is a large cenote which shows down in the depths of the water when the sun is at the meridian, the perfect figure of a palm tree, trunk, leaves, and all being fully delineated. In another town there is a cenote where, according to the early chroniclers, anyone dies instantly who enters the water without holding his breath. It is needless to say that bathing there is not at all popular. Other subterranean pools contain poisonous lizards which cause violent and even fatal headaches by merely biting the shadow of any person who passes them. Another lizard, when wounded, is said to throw its tail at its assailant. It detaches and throws it a distance of several yards, and if it strikes the flesh will cause death. Many of the cenotes are reputed to be the haunts of demons and fairies, the bad spirits being much more numerous than the good ones. In the cool hours of the afternoon, our friends started on their return to Merida, and late in the evening drew up in front of the hotel. Their host urged them to remain a week or two at the hacienda, with the politeness customary to the country. He told them that the place and everything about it were theirs, a declaration which was certainly in earnest, so far as a prolonged visit was concerned. But they were anxious to continue their investigations of Yucatan, and having already arranged to get to Usmal with an American gentleman residing at Merida, were unable to remain longer with Mr. Honredes. The second morning after their return, they started for the ruins of Usmal, which are about 60 miles from Merida. Dr. Bronson and Mr. Burbank, his American friend, rode in one volant cochet, and Frank and Fred in another. A cart with the needed supply of provisions and cooking utensils had left on the previous day and was to meet them at Usmal, which contains no hotel or other accommodation for travelers. Lodgings are taken in some of the deserted and ruined buildings, and with a suitable equipment and a supply of food, one can get along very comfortably. The road presented the same scenes as the one they had taken a few days before, and therefore does not need special description. At the first village on the road, the vehicles halted to allow the panting mules to take breath and water, and our friends descended from their cramped positions to stretch their limbs. Mr. Burbank spoke a few words to some of the natives that gathered around them, and then asked the strangers to go with them to see a heat smack. Wondering what a heat smack was, they followed to a house a few yards away, where a woman was walking around the dwelling carrying a very young child astride her hip. Having completed the circuit, she repeated it again and again, till she had walked five times around the dwelling carrying the child as before. This is a ceremony which corresponds to the christening of infants in other countries, said the gentleman. The woman that you see is the baby's godmother. The position in which the Yucateos carry their children astride the hip is like that of India and some other Asiatic countries. The heat smack is performed when the infant is about four months old. The natives believe in the magic of the number five. You have seen the woman walk five times around the house as she carries the child. Five eggs have been buried in hot ashes, and as they break they will rouse the five senses of the infant. If they fail to open, it will be of only ordinary intelligence, but their breaking will ensure extraordinary mental ability. Probably, remarked Frank, they take good care to have the ashes hot enough to make sure that the eggs will burst. If they are as intelligent as they want the child to be, they certainly will, replied Mr. Burbank. In addition to the egg test, there is a further ceremony of putting into the infant's hands the implements it will use when matured. The godmother is held in great respect by the whole family, and especially by the child for whom she has stood sponsor. The heat's mech over, the journey was continued, the mules having rested sufficiently. It was nine o'clock in the forenoon, and about twenty-five miles of the journey had been made when the walls of the hacienda of Uyalke came into view. The appetites of the youths were on a keen edge, and Frank remarked to Fred, that he could breakfast off the hind leg of a donkey if only that ordinarily unattractive viand were presented. 
i think i sent breakfast responded fred they are famed for their hospitality in yucatan and will probably find what we want at this hacienda his prediction was verified for hardly had he ceased speaking when the foremost carriage turned towards the yard of the hacienda followed very naturally by the other the drivers unhitched their mules beneath a wide spreading tree in front of the residence of the manager and proceeded to make themselves at home the mayor domo came out and welcomed the strangers and without waiting for a suggestion from mr burbank whom he knew he sent a servant to order breakfast in a very short time it was ready and the travellers sat down tortillas frijoles stewed chicken eggs and fruit disappeared in due course and the keen appetites were keen no longer how about the posterior limb of the equus asinus now whispered fred to frank as they left the table non possumus was the only answer that occurred to frank his views on the subject of edible things had materially changed in the last hour the youths made note of the fact that the hacienda of Yoyalke was a large and evidently a very prosperous one the manager told them that they had several thousand acres of land in hennequin and there were more than twelve hundred men and women employed about the establishment and in the fields the engines and machinery were more ponderous and powerful than at the hacienda already described and the buildings of the establishment together with the huts of the laborers formed quite a settlement there was a deep cenote from which a troop of women were drawing water by means of a wheel with buckets on an endless rope as fast as their jars were filled they carried them away in the direction of the garden where the water was used for keeping bright the orange and other trees that cannot live without water the garden thus invigorated was like a spot of green in a desert and reminded the youths of some of the oases they had visited in their oriental journeyings frank compared it to biskra in the great sahara and fred declared that he saw a striking resemblance to some of the gardens at the edge of the libyan desert beyond the garden in every direction was the dry and repellent land covered with the hardy hennequin which needs no water or but the merest trifle of it they did not see an idler about the place every one from the manager down seeming to be fully occupied mr burbank said that no hacienda in the whole country was better managed than this and there was none where the laborers were better satisfied with their employer and employment he added that here as everywhere else in yucatan the laborers were constantly in debt to the establishment and therefore were unable to quit work suddenly or go on strike a laborer who is in debt cannot change employers unless the new one assumes the responsibility of the obligation to the old and to bring this about requires considerable negotiation after a stay of two hours and more at the hacienda the journey was continued six or seven miles farther on the travelers reached the cenote of Mucuiche and made a brief halt to examine it the cavern is about forty feet deep and the entrance is surrounded by a garden kept green by the water drawn from the never failing source our friends descended by means of steps cut in the rock these steps were overhung by stalactites which furnished convenient holding ground for nests of swallows and hornets in great numbers what particularly pleased the use was that they found here an abundance of the blind fishes that they sought in vain in their first exploration of underground yucatan there was the same abundance and variety of lizards and other creeping things as before some of them were of goodly size and fred learned that they were iguanas and that they often appeared at table i suppose you drive them away as soon as possible he replied they are not pleasant things to look at when one is eating on the contrary mr burbank answered the iguana is a delicacy of which i have often partaken he appears at table not in his live state but after passing through the hands of the cook fred thought he did not want any iguana then or at any time and his mind was firmly made up on the subject his views changed two or three days later when after eating heartily of a delicious stew which secured the praises of both frank and himself he learned that the stew aforesaid was nothing less than the despised iguana he quietly remarked that great allowance must be made for prejudice and then dismissed the subject two hours before sunset they reached a hacienda where they received the same cordial reception as at uayalke 
it had been intended to complete the journey to usmal that day but as the hour was late and darkness would certainly overtake them before their destination could be reached mr burbank decided to accept the pressing invitation of the mayor domo to spend the night there the mules were unharnessed and led away to the stables where they were bountifully fed on fresh grass cut and brought by the peons there was a fine garden here filled with all sorts of tropical trees and not the least interesting sight in the place was a large number of beehives of a very primitive character they were nothing else than sections of a hollow log cut off with a saw and the ends closed with dried mud or with boards fitted in like the head of a barrel frank and fred stood at a respectful distance as they looked at the beehives they were mindful of the proverb which refers to the prudence of the burnt child and having been stung by the honey insects on several occasions they did not wish a repetition of the experience mr burbank walked fearlessly up to the hives and called to the youths to follow him please excuse us replied frank the bees may recognize you as you've been here before but they don't know us never mind them the gentleman answered with a laugh the bees in this country are stingless and you run no risk in making their acquaintance thus assured the youths advanced and found themselves unharmed the bees circled about them in great numbers but left no sting behind mr burbank told them that the hives were emptied every six or eight weeks and thus the bees were kept busy the year round why they collect honey in a country where flowers are perpetually in bloom he could not understand it speaks well for the industry of the insect he remarked he has no occasion to work and only does so from the force of ancestral habit he has some imitators among the human race but by no means so generally as many of us might wish while discussing the subject of beekeeping in yucatan they were called to supper which was an excellent one of purely mexican character turtle soup chile con carne frijoles tortillas and other national dishes were served in abundance and the meal ended with honey from the beehives which they had investigated frank and fred had observed a delicious fragrance as they entered the room where supper was served and were unable at first to discover its origin all the scent of the finest flowers of yucatan seemed to be gathered there they looked around for floral baskets or bouquets but none were visible when the honey was served they found that this it was which furnished the fragrance and they asked mr burbank about it you are quite right he answered it is the perfume of the honey that fills your nostrils in some seasons of the year it is much greater than now it spreads over the whole house and is as powerful as musk or any other famous perfume of the old world just as they rose from the supper table the bell of the chapel rang for a ration or evening prayer which was attended by our friends and all the laborers and everybody else about the establishment when the service was ended each of the worshippers said buenas noches senor good night sir to each of the strangers everybody went early to bed and by nine o'clock the whole place was in the deepest silence this remark will not apply to all seasons of the year during the periods of fiestas or festivals late hours are generally kept and early rising is not assiduously practiced the hammocks of the travelers were slung in a corridor and the free circulation of air and the coolness of the night together with the fatigues of a long ride over rough roads ensured sound sleep in the morning chocolate was served before six o'clock and a little after that hour the carriages were on their way no direct payment for the hospitality of the hacienda was ordered but indirect compensation was made in the shape of fees to the mayor domo and the servants who had waited upon the strangers soon after leaving the hacienda the road ascended and frank ascertained from the driver who spoke spanish fairly that they were climbing the sierra a hilly ridge hardly worthy of the name of mountain though called so by courtesy it is the highest ground of yucatan and therefore the inhabitants are to be excused for calling it a mountain as they would otherwise be without one from the top of the ridge they looked over a considerable area of country covered with the scrub forest for which the country is noted and dotted here and there with the ruins of cities which indicate the existence of a numerous population in previous centuries down the other side of the ridge they went at breakneck pace 
the cochets being tossed from side to side with such violence that the youths were compelled to hang on with both hands to prevent being thrown out and left by the roadside several times the vehicle narrowly escaped overturning and this too close to chasms where an upset would have sent them almost perpendicularly down a hundred feet or so and reduced vehicle mules passengers and baggage to an average value of fifty cents a bushel and the curious thing about the whole business was that on reaching level ground the driver reined in his team and proceeded at a more dignified pace End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of the boy travelers in mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by mario pineda the boy travelers in mexico by thomas wallace knox chapter thirty two at nine o'clock they reached the hacienda of fuchmal where they were invited to breakfast the invitation was accepted and immediately after the conclusion of the meal the party continued to the ruins which were about a mile farther on the mayordomo invited them to make the place their home as long as they were in the neighborhood mr burbank gave an evasive answer to the invitation at the same time earnestly thanking their host for his courtesy to decline absolutely might seem a rudeness and to accept would not accord with their arrangement to live at the ruins of the ancient city on reaching the ruins the party halted to consider what should first be investigated dr bronson asked the dudes if they had any suggestions to make whereupon frank intimated that he desired above everything else to visit the dwarf's house why so queried the doctor on account of the very pretty legend connected with it replied frank it is given by Stephens, Charney, and others who have been here, but the best form of it is by Mrs. Le Plongeon. Then he read the following from New and Old in Yucatan. During the reign of a certain Maya king, there lived a woman who was both feared and respected, for she was a wonderful sorceress. A son was born to her, and he became a great favorite, for he was good and clever, though very small, in fact, a dwarf. Finally, he became so popular, probably the people fawned on him, to please the formidable witch, that the king grew jealous and sought his destruction by giving him difficult tasks, so that, failing, he might be accused of disobedience. But thanks to his mother, the boy always succeeded. One day, the king, out of patience, ordered the boy to build in one night a high mound and a house on the top. The tooth was at his wit's hand, but went as usual to seek maternal aid oh mother mother i shall surely die for the king has ordered me to do more than i can possibly accomplish and he told her his trouble never mind my child don't be alarmed in the morning the house will be there it was and from that day to this has been called the dwarf's house the king was enraged he sent for the dwarf i am greatly pleased with the house now i want to break six cocoyoles small and very hard coconuts about the size of a walnut on your head and then i will give you my daughter in marriage the dwarf declined to accept the offer on these conditions the monarch insisted i want you to marry my daughter and you must accept my conditions again the poor dwarf sought his mother in despair there is no hope for me now oh yes there is replied the clever witch you go back to his majesty and tell him that you accede to his request provided he afterwards allows you to break six cocoyoles on his own head and to this the king publicly agreed because he was determined to kill the dwarf with the first cocoyol then the sorceress rubbed her son's head with something that made it so hard nothing could possibly hurt it the king arrived and the dwarf in the presence of all the people laid his head on a stone with another the king broke the cocoyol on the head of his intended victim broke all six of them but the dwarf rose unhurt then it was the turn of the monarch to lay his proud head down and as his scalp was not prepared the dwarf broke his skull and thus got rid of his enemy the agreement had been faithfully carried out so the public had nothing to say 
the dwarf then married the princess and became king. Of course, the marriage of the dwarf to the princess was the end of the story, and Frank saw so intimated as the dwarf's house was visible from where they stood. In fact, it is the most prominent object as the ruins are approached. The party went to it at once. It stands on an artificial mound about 100 feet high, wrote Fred in describing the visit, and therefore was quite a task for the dwarf to accomplish in a single night. Do you doubt the truth of the story? Well, here's the mound with the house upon it, and anywhere around here you might get a cocoyoles in whatever number you like. Could there be any further proof needed than these facts? We climbed to the top by a broad staircase of stone, and it was by no means an easy climb. The steps are narrow, and some of them have become displaced, so that we were all tired enough to sit down when we reached the house. The tradition is that when the priests threw the bodies of the victims of sacrifice from the altars, they rolled to the bottom of the steps without stopping. The staircase is very wide, 60 or 70 feet, and this great width combined with the narrow steps makes it a dangerous one to ascend. A single misstep would send one rolling downward, like the sacrificial victims. The house was evidently a place of worship, and in this respect corresponds to the Teocalis of the Mexicans, which we have already described. Although generally known as the Dwarf's House, it is frequently called the House of the Prophet, and there is a tradition that prophecies were issued from it, as from the temples of ancient Greece and Rome. It is 70 feet long and 12 wide, and is covered with sculpture, some of it greatly injured by time, while the rest is well preserved. There are many hieroglyphics that form an interesting study for the archaeologist. Several travelers have given translations of them, and I believe that each one is able to demonstrate that his predecessors were all wrong. We will not attempt to decipher them, as we do not wish to run the risk of our work being overturned by the next comer. The building has three rooms. Dr. Bronson says that some of the sculptures on the walls of these rooms are Masonic symbols, and he wonders if the rays that erected the building were acquainted with the mystic rite. Who can tell? Lower down is a sanctuary of two small but very high sealed rooms, and having some fine sculpture on the outside. Over the entrance of the sanctuary is the carved head of a mastodon, showing that the people were acquainted with that animal, or at all events had his correct likeness. There are Masonic emblems on a cornice that extends around the sanctuary, and on the lower part of the cornice are rings cut in stone, from which curtains were suspended during the ceremonies that were performed inside the building. We spent an hour or more inspecting the building and its sculptures, and then gave quite a little time to the magnificent panorama that was revealed from the top of the mound. Indeed, we had considerable enjoyment of it while resting from the fatigue of the ascent. The pyramid rises from a plain, and at the elevation where we stood or sat, we embraced with our eyes a wide area. All the principal buildings of Ushmal were at our feet, and we looked and listened attentively while Mr. Burbank pointed them out. Nearest and to the west is the Casa de las Monjas, or House of the Nuns, but whether it was really a nunnery, or is only called so for convenience, we are unable to say. On a broad and high terrace to the south is the Casa del Gobernador, or House of the Governor, and there is a building close by called the House of the Turtles. Turtles did not live there, but figures of them are on the sculptures that adorn the building. There were several other heaps of ruins, of which I noted the names of only two, the House of the Old Woman and the House of the Pigeons. When we had finished our inspection of the Dwarf's House, we descended the steeply sloping pyramid, picking our way very carefully to avoid accidents. Except where the stones are so thick as to afford no clinging ground for vegetation, the sides of the mound are covered with bushes, which are occasionally cut away by the proprietor of Oxmal. We went first to the house of the nuns, which is a building about 280 feet square, with a large courtyard in the center. There is a high gateway on the south side by which we enter the house. The house has 88 rooms or apartments opening into the courtyard, but no doors opening to the outside. As we entered the court, our attention was drawn to the sculptures on the interior facades of the building. 
On one side there is a representation of two enormous serpents so immense in size that they run the whole length of the edifice, their exact measurement being 173 feet. Their bodies are twisted together and in the spaces between the folds are many strange hieroglyphics. We seem to be once more in India or some other eastern country where serpent worship once prevailed and is by no means so known at the present day. Mr. Burbank told us that the ruins have suffered a good deal in recent years and at the rate they are being destroyed there will be little more than a few heaps of rubbish remaining here when the next century begins. Nearly every visitor to them thinks he must carry away something and most people are not at all particular about defacing the hieroglyphics or other sculptures. A large quantity of stone has been taken from the ruins for building purposes at the Ushmal Hacienda and the Indians do not seem to have any reverence or but very little for the homes of their bygone ancestors. There are the usual traditions about buried treasures in the buildings and every little while somebody tries to find them. Nothing of value has ever been discovered, but the digging that forms a necessary part of every search is a serious injury to the sculptures and walls. The hand of man is ably aided in the work of destruction by the tropical vegetation. Around the building it is so thick that all access would soon be cut off if the rapidly growing mass were not occasionally cut away in places where paths are desired. The roof is overgrown with yuccas and other plants that convert it into a sort of hanging garden. The roots, swelling in the crevices between the stones, are rapidly breaking down the walls and converting the whole into a shapeless mass of ruins. The next spot of interest was the Casa del Gobernador, which has been alluded to in Fred's account of the view from the top of the pyramid. Our friends went there and found not only an extensive ruin, but what was of practical importance, the servants that had been sent on in advance from Merida with the cart and camping equipments. They had already taken possession of the best rooms in the house and were clearing them out for occupation. One room served for kitchen and servants' quarters, and the other for parlor, dining saloon, dormitory, salon de conversación, reception room, library, café, art gallery, and wardrobe. A flat stone made a very fair table, and other stones served in place of chairs. Hammocks were slung by means of ropes from one wall to another and altogether the place was comfortable enough for a temporary home. The kitchen apparatus was not extensive, but it sufficed for the preparation of satisfactory meals, doubtless rendered appetizing by the exercise which the strangers were getting in the open air. In the middle of the day, it was too hot to wander about a great deal. The time was passed in writing, reading, or possibly in the siesta, for which all tropical and semi-tropical countries are more or less famed. It fell to Frank to speak to the governor's house, which he did as follows. The governor's house, or royal palace, as it is also called, is on the uppermost of three terraces. It could not well be on either of the lower ones, and is 322 feet long by 39 in depth. The building is about 25 feet high and had a flat roof. Some of the ceilings were supported by triangular arches and others by beams. The beams have rotted away and disappeared, but the stone arches remain intact. The roof was originally covered with cement. The ancient Mayas seemed to have possessed a very good quality of cement, but it was hardly equal to that of some of the eastern nations. The top of the building is overgrown with yuccas and other plants, just like the house of the nuns, and from the top of each of the three towers, small trees shoot high into the air. There is not much ornament on the lower part of the walls, but the upper portion is profusely decorated. It is thought that the walls, as high as the cornice, about 10 feet from the base, were covered with stucco or cement, and this has been removed by the climate or possibly torn off during the wars that might have prevailed here. The cornice runs around the building just above the three doorways that give entrance to the place. Above this cornice the whole wall is covered with a sculpture, and I can best describe it by copying what was written by Stephens nearly 50 years ago. There is no rudeness or barbarity in the design or proportions. On the contrary, the whole wears an air of architectural symmetry and grandeur, and as the stranger ascends the steps and casts a bewildered eye along its opened and desolate doors, 
it is hard to believe that he sees before him the work of a face in whose epitaph, as written by historians, there are called ignorant of art, and said to have perished in the rudeness of savage life. If it is stood at this day on its grand artificial terrace in Hyde Park, or the garden of the Tuileries, it would form a new order. I do not say equaling, but not unworthy to stand side by side with the remains of Egyptian, Grecian, or Roman art. One of the interesting features of the governor's house and other buildings of Ushmal is the Maya arch, which is formed without the keystone. The sides are built up with stones projecting one beyond the other, and a flat stone is laid across the top. In spite of its violation of the principles on which builders say the arch is based, the work of the Mayas has withstood the ravages of time to a remarkable degree. The specimens of this arch are found here in the governor's house and in other parts of Ushmal, in fact, they can be seen at Palenque, Chichen Itza, and other historic places in Yucatan and neighboring countries. The archway of Las Monjas is an admirable specimen of this work, and we send you a photograph of it, so that you may judge for yourself. There was formerly a stone figure here representing a double-headed dog, but it has been carried away. It was found in a mound of earth at the corner of the second terrace, and not far from the house of the turtles. While we were walking about the terrace, Mr. Bunker cautioned us not to fall into one of the ancient reservoirs or storehouses, which are much easier to enter than to leave. They are a sort of stone jug on a colossal scale, bowls or cisterns ten or twelve feet square, and as many deep, with an opening two feet across at the top. A friend of his fell into one of these jugs while incautiously walking about. He was a stout in figure and slipped into the hole with no surrounding space to spare. When they came to get him out, it was necessary for him to remove the greater part of his clothing in order that he could be hoisted from his prison, and even then the work was not accomplished until the sides of the opening had been greased. At any rate, that's the story Mr. Burbank told us. We have mentioned the house of the turtles, which is so called on account of a row of turtles ornamenting its facade. It is on the corner of the second terrace, and is supposed to have been the kitchen of the palace. Fred thinks that if it was really a kitchen, the ornamentation will go far to prove that the governor, whoever he was, had a fondness for turtle soup, like a good many governors of modern times. Wouldn't it be funny if turtle soup should prove to have had its origin in Yucatan? Dr. Bronson says that though Yucateos might have had the article, they did not invent it, as turtle soup was known to the ancient Romans many centuries ago. Frank and Fred found that a residence in a royal palace had its drawbacks, especially when night came and the bats appeared in large numbers. Furthermore, there were lizards and other creeping things in great abundance, and some of them were especially repulsive. One of the worst annoyances of their visit to Ushmal was that whenever they moved about, they became covered with garrapatas. The garrapata is a tick so small that it is hardly perceptible to the naked eye, but it is capable of making a bite or sting like that of a red ant or a hot needle. Frank and Fred were reminded of their troubles in Ceylon when they became covered with land leeches in their journey to aid them speak. Mr. Burbank told them that the best antidote to the garrapatas was to rub one's body with petroleum before venturing where the insects abounded, and that they should change their clothing every time they came in from a walk. Here's Frank's note concerning the spests of Yucatan. They cause a frightful itching, and whenever the fangs of the insect break off in the skin, and they do so very often, the wound is liable to fester and be some time in healing. Their attentions are not confined to humanity. They attack dogs and other animals, and the poor creatures are sometimes killed by them. Mr. Charney gives an account of how a pet dog belonging to the wife of the consul at Merida suffered from the bites of these insects while out one day in the country. The little animal rolled on the grass and howled in agony, but the garapatas kept on with their biting as though it was all fun to them. Fred asked Mr. Burbank how many kinds of insects, troublesome and otherwise Yucatan could boast, but the gentleman was unable to say with any exactness. There is enough of them to go around, said he. Among the whole population, and some varieties go around with surprising activity when the heat and languor of the climate are considered. And if you camp out and sleep on the ground, you may quite possibly be aroused by a snake trying to get into bed with you and coiling around your arm or leg. 
Our young friends were especially ambitious to discover a statue or some interesting relic of the bygone race and so make themselves distinguished as explorers. But their inquiries as to the possibility and advisability of such a proceeding were greatly discouraged when they learned of the experience of Dr. Le Plongeon. You doubtless saw the statue of Chuck Moule, the god of fire, in the museum of the capital, said Mr. Burbank. Certainly, replied Fred. Well, continued Mr. Burbank, Dr. Le Plongeon found that statue at Chichen Itza, where he made extensive excavations at his own expense. It was nine feet in length, too large to be hidden in his coat pocket or any other ordinary way, and therefore he could not take it out of the country. The government claims all antiquities, no matter by whom they are found, and the officials immediately took possession of Dr. Le Plongeon's find and paid no attention to his protest. The same explorer dug up a statue here in the summer of 1881 and describes it as the finest ever discovered in Central America. He and his wife were working along when the treasure was unearthed, and with the recollections of the Chuck Mool experience before them, they immediately covered up the precious discovery and removed all trace of their work. Learning wisdom by their experience, I would advise against any serious expenditure of time and money in exploring the remains of Uxmal or any other of the sixty or more ruined cities of Yucatan. If you find anything of value, it will go into the hands of the Mexican government and adorn the museum at the national capital. Antiquities of no value can be taken to New York or elsewhere after paying certain duties upon them for exportation. Frank and Fred thought the advice excellent and thanked Mr. Burbank for it. They confined their investigations to making sketches and photographs of their sculptures and measuring the buildings and the apartments in them. They did not undertake any digging operations and listened calmly to the stories of the natives concerning the vast amount of treasure supposed to be concealed in the ruins of the buildings. It may be remarked here that the natives were very unwilling to remain around the ruins at night, and all of them who could do so hurried to the hacienda of Uxmal immediately after sunset. They believed that the ghosts of the former occupants revisit the ruins at night and treat with great severity anyone whom they find there. In support of their belief, they told several stories of how Indians who had ventured to spend the night in the ruins had disappeared and no trace of them had ever been found. In other cases, their dead bodies were found in some of the rooms of the old buildings, and in each instance the marks on their throats showed that they had been strangled at the hands of the ghosts. A dead Indian was found in a treetop where it was impossible to have climbed or been placed by human hands. The inference was that the ghosts had killed the rash man and then carried his body into the treetop as a warning to future intruders. For cooking and drinking purposes, our friends obtained water from a small pond or aguada, which is supposed to have been the watering place of Uxmal in the days of its glory. It is now partly overgrown with aquatic plants, and is a favorite haunt of the birds, or rather one of their haunts, as there are several ponds in the neighborhood of the ruins. By a skillful use of a shotgun, which formed part of their outfit, the Jews obtained several ornithological specimens, which they carefully skinned and preserved. Like the majority of tropical birds, their plumage was brilliant, that of the crimson flycatcher being especially so. Goods were numerous and formed an agreeable addition to the bill of fare of Uxmal, though our friends were unanimous in their belief that the Coots of Yucatan were far behind their namesakes of the northern states in the matter of edibility. End of chapter 32、Chapter、33 of the Boy Travelers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 33. As before stated, the most interesting of the mind buildings of Usmal are the Dwarf's House, the House of the Nuns, and the Governor's House, and these three we have already described. The ruins of other cities are not far away, and when they had finished with Usmal, our friends proceeded to visit those that were the most convenient. The information obtained in their personal explorations, added to what they gathered from residents of the country, and the books already mentioned, 
was embodied in the following joint work of frank and fred there are not less than sixty ruined cities in yucatan whose location is known who can tell how many more are hidden in the dense forests of the rarely visited country of the rebellious indians and awaiting the efforts of the explorers to describe all these ruins would be a difficult task and besides it would be dreary reading for anybody who is not an eager student of archaeology we will touch only upon some of the most important about thirty miles from merida are the ruins of mayapan which is said to have been the ancient capital of the country they are spread over an extensive plain and though covering a considerable area are less interesting than the ruins of usmal the ground is covered with a dense growth of trees and plants and every explorer who devotes any attention to mayapan is obliged to incur quite an outlay for labor in cutting paths and clearing up the ground we did not go there but gathered our information from a gentleman who has been on the spot several times he told us that the most conspicuous object at mayapan is a pyramid not unlike that on which the dwarf's house at usmal was built it is one hundred feet square at the base and about sixty feet high it is ascended by a stone staircase similar to that of the pyramid of the dwarf's house and about twenty-five feet wide there is no building on the top of the mound only a stone platform and explorers do not agree as to whether there was ever any edifice there or not excavations have been made at several places in the mound and subterranean chambers discovered their use cannot be positively determined of course there are the usual stories about the concealment of treasures within the mounds but nothing has ever been found there it is the general belief that most of the buildings of mayapan were of wood or sun-dried brick instead of stone as most of them have disappeared there is one curious looking edifice still in position a circular structure twenty five feet in diameter and standing on a pyramidal foundation thirty five feet high if you want a detailed description of it look in baldwin's ancient america where there is a picture which shows how it looks today dr le plongeon made an extensive and careful study of mayapan which is supposed to have been founded by the mayas in the fifth century there was a constant warfare for centuries between the rulers of mayapan and usmal and the fortunes of war alternated from one to the other according to the chronicles king kokom of mayapan with all his sons but one was murdered by his nobles in fourteen forty six nearly a hundred years before the spaniards conquered the country and fifty years before america was discovered by columbus when the spaniards came they found mayapan in ruins and the early spanish writers obtained the traditions concerning it from the people in the surrounding country the mayas say that the first man of the human race was made out of earth and grass the former supplying his flesh and bones and the latter his skin at this point frank asked if the greenness of many members of the race was attributable to their grassy origin as given by the mayas fred dismissed the question as trifling and irrelevant and then the history proceeded dr le plongeon was convinced that the mayas had a knowledge of astronomy as he found two stone columns on the platform of the mound with a line marked in the pavement between them these columns or stelae are perfectly oriented according to the points of the compass and by means of them the hour of the day could be told and also the time of the sun's declination the apparatus was similar to that of the ancient egyptians and chaldeans the mayas divided their astronomical year into twelve months of thirty days each and added five days when the sun reached its greatest declination and was said to be at rest the doctor found in the ruins of mayapan a stone slab bearing inscriptions which referred to the god of fire these inscriptions seem to have been identical with those of the ancient egyptians for their sun god and of the assyrians for their corresponding deity certainly it is a very curious circumstance that these people so far apart in time and distance seem to have hit upon the same form of worship and of astronomical calculations
we will leave mayapan now and turn to another ruined city called ake these ruins are about the same distance from merida as those of mayapan the former lying to the east and the latter to the south they are on a hacienda belonging to don alvaro peon who is always ready to facilitate the visit of any one who desires to explore the ruins the ruins include those of several large buildings which are presumed to have been palaces a small pyramid and a large one together with some other structures all grouped around an open space or plaza in the center of this plaza is a stone pillar called a picote and what do you suppose was its use it was a stone of punishment or whipping post it was in use throughout this country both before and after the conquest and in fact it is not unknown today the culprit was stripped and tied to this post and then publicly whipped very much as in some of the united states within the memory of men now living monsieur charnay says there is a picote in use today at the indian village of tumbala near palenque and presumably it can be found in other indian villages the funny part of the business is that the indians believe a sound thrashing at the picote makes a man's conscience clean and to secure such a state of mental affairs they often come forward and ask to be whipped when nobody knows of anything to entitle them to punishment we don't care for any picote just now and so we'll drop it there is at ake a small pyramid about forty feet high and built of large stones that were put together without cement there was once a house on top but it has crumbled away and the sides of the pyramid are a good deal dilapidated then there is a large pyramid with a broad top and on this top are three rows of stone pillars about ten feet apart one way and fifteen feet the other the esplanade on which these pillars stand measures fifty by two hundred feet the pillars are built up of flat stones about three feet square by fifteen inches thick and there are ten stones in each perfect pillar we have said there are thirty-six pillars but only twenty-nine are standing and from several of these some of the stones have been displaced now what was the use of these pillars this is a conundrum that has excited all visitors and nobody has been able to make an explanation that has not been overthrown by someone else some have argued that the pillars and the stones of which they are composed were intended to mark certain epochs of time one writer says the pillars were built up by placing single stones there at intervals so arranged that each pillar would take two hundred years for its construction according to this theory the erection of the thirty-six pillars would cover a period of seventy two hundred years and thus make the foundation of the edifice older than that of the oldest of the pyramids of egypt opposed to this theory is that of the explorers who believe the pillars or columns were the supports of the roof of a temple the roof they say was of perishable material and disappeared ages ago but the stones remain the columns are from fourteen to sixteen feet high and the work of putting the stones in place was by no means small the builders understood architectural principles and that they lived and died long long ago there can be no doubt when it was that they lived no one has yet been able to say positively in some of its features this great pyramid of ake is one of the wonders of yucatan the platform on which the columns are ranged is reached by a stone staircase that seems to have been built for giants it measures one hundred thirty seven feet from one side to the other the steps are more than four feet from front to rear and each step is sixteen inches high when you bear in mind that the steps of a staircase of modern construction are usually about nine inches high you will understand what a getting upstairs it is to ascend this great pyramid a fierce battle was fought here between the spaniards and mayas at the time of the conquest and the remains of a spanish fort or redoubt can be distinctly traced from ake we will turn to kaba which lies a few miles to the south of usmal kaba was a large and very old city how large it was nobody can say exactly as a dense forest covers the site and a great deal of cutting is required to visit any part of it every fresh visitor to kaba 
discover something new whenever and wherever he penetrates the forest some of the recent explorers have found many ruined buildings that escaped the observation of stevens who thought he had examined the entire extent of the city there is a stone-faced mound at kabat nearly two hundred feet square at the base and with a row of ruined apartments all around it a few hundred yards from the mound is a terrace about twenty feet high and measuring one hundred fifty by two hundred feet on the top there is a ruined building on this esplanade which was evidently of great beauty and large proportions when it was built it was beautifully ornamented according to the account of mr stevens who says the cornice running over the doorways tried by the severest rules of art recognized among us would embellish the architecture of any known era he calls attention to the fact that while at usmal the walls were smooth below the cornice those at kaba were covered with decorations from top to bottom in addition to the mound and the terrace mr stevens described three other large buildings which he thought must have been palaces one of them was three stories in height each story being narrower and shorter than the one below it it was one hundred forty seven feet long by one hundred six wide and built in a manner that would be credible to any architect of any age or country another building on a high terrace was one hundred sixty four feet long but quite narrow in proportion and a peculiarity of it was that it had wide doorways with pillars in the center for support one terrace eight hundred feet by one hundred was found with several fine buildings upon it the work of making the terraces alone without considering the buildings must have been something enormous but all trace of the builders has gone and no one can tell today what is their history a few years ago june eighteen eighty one mr ame the american consul at merida visited kaba and made a remarkable discovery he found on one of the walls of a ruined building a rude painting of a man mounted on a horse as the horse was unknown in yucatan until after the arrival of the spaniards monsieur charnay argues from this discovery that the ruins of kaba are not of great antiquity and that the painting was made during or since the conquest by a native artist on the other hand dr le plongeon argues that the work is of a very great age and he refers to some of the hieroglyphics in proof of his belief you can take your choice between two experts one placing the age of the painting at less than four hundred years and the other at two or three thousand years and perhaps more for our part we prefer to believe in the one who maintains that kaba was an old city when the romans built the Colosseum and had begun to decay long before mohammed founded the religion of islam we must not forget to mention a beautiful arch at kaba which is wonderfully suggestive of the triumphal arches of the romans and other european nations it stands apart from the other structures and this fact leads explorers to believe that it was built to commemorate an important event in the history of the people or of one of its rulers the center of the arch has fallen in but the massive columns remain and show that it was firmly built the arch is not the straight-sided one of the mayas but curves like the greek and roman arch what a pity the crown is gone so that we do not know whether it was built with a keystone or not from kaba let us go to chichen itza we will go in imagination rather than reality as the ruins are in the region of the rebellious indians and it isn't safe at all times to venture there let us call the place chichen for short it lies about thirty miles west of valladolid which was once a prosperous city and contained the first cotton mill ever erected in yucatan valladolid was deserted at the time of the rebellion of the indians in eighteen forty six and has never regained its former population the ruins of chichen cover an area of about two square miles and have been explored by stevens norman charnay le plongeon and others and the historians say that the spanish army that conquered yucatan occupied the ruins and found them useful as a fortification against the indians there is a building at chichen which resembles the house of the nuns at usmal and has the same name 
it seems to have been erected at different periods and some of the explorers think a portion of it was altogether destroyed and afterwards rebuilt as the style of architecture is different the ornamentation is more elaborate than that of the house of the nuns at usmal over the door is a medallion representing a priest with a headdress of feathers and there is a row of similar heads running around the whole length of the frieze of the northern façade. The upper story is ornamented with panels cut into the stone and having a raised figure in the center. You can best understand this design if you look at a picture which we have taken from the ancient cities of the New World. Connected with this building is one which the Spaniards call the church. It has only one room and is 26 feet long by 14 wide and 31 high and the outside is covered with carved ornaments. Not a great way from it is a circular building 22 feet in diameter and 60 feet high, and having four doors that are placed exactly towards the cardinal points of the compass. The building is on a mound and is approached by a grand staircase 40 feet wide and having a balustrade formed of bodies of serpents twined together. Serpents have a prominent place in the ornamentation of Chichen, as they appear in one form or another on nearly all the buildings. A very interesting building is the one which Stevens called the gymnasium or tennis court. It consists of two parallel walls, 30 feet thick, 274 feet long, and 120 feet apart. And in each wall there are stone rings or circles, four feet across, with holes one foot seven inches in diameter in the center. These holes are opposite each other and 20 feet from the ground, and it is supposed that a game something like tennis was played in the space between the walls. Baldwin's Ancient America says there were similar courts in other cities of Yucatan and Central America, but no account of the games has come down to us. The Casa Colorada, or Red House, is a building that would be credible to the architects of any country and time, though it is not a large edifice. It measures 43 feet by 23 and appears to have been elaborately ornamented originally, but has been greatly defaced by time, and also by the Indians, who formerly lived in the vicinity. Before the Indian Rebellion, there was a town near Chichen called Peace Day. Its inhabitants used to go to Chichen to practice shooting against the ruined edifices there. Many of the buildings show the marks of bullets, and it is probable that the people of that town caused quite as much destruction as did the Indians. But the most conspicuous of all the buildings of Chichen is El Castillo, or the castle, which stands on an artificial hill and is reached by a wide and long staircase, so overgrown with weeds and brushwood as to make the climbing difficult. It is the building usually occupied by explorers, as it offers a good place of defense against any marauding bands of Indians. Whether it was a castle or not in the olden times is a question, but it has certainly served as one in the day since the rebellion of the Indians. This is a good place to repeat a story given by one of the Spanish historians about an incident at the time of the conquest. Under the command of Motejo, an officer under Cortez, the Spaniards occupied Chichen for two years and were engaged in constant fights with the Indians. Matejo lost 150 of the 400 men whom he took there originally, and finally the Indians laid regular siege to the palace and pressed Motejo so hard that he was forced to retreat. But it was no easy matter to get away, as the Indians would be sure to fall upon the Spaniards in their flight and probably destroy the entire force. So they waited until a moonless and stormy night, and under cover of the darkness managed to get away and be several hours on the road before their absence was discovered. In order to deceive the Indians, Matejo caused the feet of the horses to be muffled with cloths, and lest they might find by the silence that the place was evacuated, he left a dog tied to a pole on which were a bell and a piece of meat. Every time the dog tried to reach the meat, he rang the bell, and thus the Indians supposed all the while that the Spaniards were still behind the walls of Chichen. It was not until the daylight that they discovered their mistake, and then there was no time to overtake the fugitives before they reached the territory 
of a friendly chief. Let us return to the castle of Chichen. The pyramid on which it stands is 175 feet square at the base and 68 feet high. The staircase is 39 feet wide and contains 90 steps. The building is about 40 feet square and 21 feet high, and its internal arrangements show that it was probably a temple, like most of the edifices of similar character throughout Mexico. The walls of the castle are covered with inscriptions and sculptures, and the greater part of them forcibly remind the visitor of the work of the ancient Egyptians. The columns which support the sanctuary present vast reliefs of men supposed to be priests, and these figures are repeated on the walls along with other sculptures. And to make a long story short and avoid the risk of being tedious, we will say that all the buildings of Chichen are elaborately ornamented. Tradition is that when the Spaniards came here, there were many mural paintings in beautiful colors, but the pious invaders thought it their duty to destroy these pagan symbols and so covered them with stucco and whitewash. Had they left them alone, we might have learned much more than we now know about the ancient inhabitants of Yucatan. We have in space to describe all the sculptures, or even a quarter of them, but must refer anybody who is interested in the subject to the books of the explorers, and we must do the same for the other ruined cities of Yucatan and the countries near it. Palenque with its palace, Copan with its great wall and its wonderful idols and other sculptures. Tikal with its temples constructed of large blocks of stone laid in cement. Each merits a separate chapter, but we have no room for it. The same may be said of other places, and it is quite possible that there are dozens of cities buried in the tropical forests of which absolutely nothing is now known. We may hope for a revelation of the mysteries of the ancient cities of the New World whenever the work of discovery is undertaken on an extensive scale. Explorations have hitherto been made by individuals, whose means did not permit the employment of a sufficient number of men for clearing away the dense undergrowth and making the necessary excavations. The natives are not well disposed toward explorers, and, as we have already seen, some of the ruined cities are in the regions where the Indians are in control. There is a large area which is practically unknown and can only be opened up by a force of men sufficiently large to take care of itself against all local opposition. Only by the liberality of wealthy men and societies or aided by the arms of disciplined soldiers can the work be thoroughly accomplished. Here the youths closed their account of the antiquities of Yucatan. Frank carefully read what they had written and as he paused at the end of the narrative, Fred remarked, Perhaps we may have an opportunity some time to make the explorations we have suggested. Let us hope so, replied Frank, with a faraway sigh as he spoke. End of section 33。Chapter 34 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynette Calkins. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 34. After completing their description of the ruined cities of Yucatan, Frank and Fred looked around for something new to occupy their attention. They were not long in finding it. I wish we could extend our journey to Central America, said Fred. So do I, answered his cousin. But I'm afraid Dr. Bronson would not consent. His plans do not include a journey further south than Yucatan, and besides, I don't think he would relish the idea of making a trip through a region where the comforts of travel are as limited as they are between here and Panama. They sounded the doctor on the subject, but did not receive any encouragement. His arrangements were such that he was to be in New York by a date that would make it impossible to accomplish the proposed journey. The youths cheerfully assented to the situation and consoled themselves by collecting a fair stock of information about Central America and entering it in their notebooks. Frank said this was the next best thing to seeing the country for themselves. 
Central America, wrote Frank, is about 900 miles long and varies from 30 to 300 miles in width. It extends south about 11 degrees from the 18th parallel of north latitude and is therefore entirely in the tropics. The geographers give it an area of 175,000 square miles and a population of something less than three millions, the greater portion being native-born Indians. The whites and creoles are nearly all of Spanish descent, as the country was conquered and occupied by the Spaniards soon after the conquest of Mexico. Fred suggested that a census of the snakes, lizards, birds, and beasts of Central America would give a large population, as it was known to abound in these things to a very liberal extent. He declared in advance that he would not accept the office of animal census-taker, as he had understood that the serpents were numerous and dangerous, as is the case in tropical countries generally. "'I was reading this morning,' said he, of a snake of the constrictor species that was killed close to a hacienda where the writer of the narrative was stopping. It was fourteen feet long, and not unusually large of its kind. The people of the hacienda said it was fortunate that the creature had been dispatched, as it would quite likely have killed one of the children, and they related many stories about babies being swallowed by these serpents. The same traveler, Mr. Wells, tells about a ceremony that he witnessed, where a tamagasa, one of the most deadly snakes of Central America, was burned alive in the public square of a village. Two natives had found the snake basking in the sun. One drew his poncho over the reptile, while the other held its head to the ground with a forked stick, till its mouth could be sewed up, so that it could do no harm. The snake was about three feet long. The ceremony took place in the evening, and the village priest pronounced a malediction upon the creature before it was consigned to the flames. No remedy is known for the bite of this serpent, nor for that of the taboba, another venomous product of Central America. To go on with the country, said Frank, when Fred paused at the end of his snake story, we will remark that Central America comprises five republics which are independent of each other, Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, San Salvador, and Nicaragua. Down to 1823, they were colonies of Spain. In that year, they formed themselves into a federal republic of states and declared their independence. They continued thus until 1839, when they dissolved their federation and became independent of each other. Since then, they have united again on two or three occasions, but have not remained so for any length of time. Several attempts at a federation, one of them in 1888, have resulted in nothing. Now and then the republics have wars among themselves, but the rest of the world goes on as if nothing had happened, as the moon did when the dog barked at it. The governments of the states of Central America are republican in form, modified by revolution and assassination. Happily, these modifications are not applied as frequently nowadays as in former times, but they are by no means unknown. To show how revolutions are started, and how they sometimes turn out, let us take a page from the history of Costa Rica. Thereupon Frank read from The Capitals of Spanish America, the account of how the government of that republic was overthrown, and a new one established in 1871. Substantially, it was as follows. The Congress of Costa Rica had caused a railway to be surveyed from ocean to ocean across the state. It was necessary to seek foreign aid for the construction of the line, and the two banking houses at San Jose, the capital city, were rivals for the appointment of government agent to negotiate the loan. The defeated banker was, like his rival, an Englishman, married to a Costa Rican lady, and the capital of his bank was English. In revenge, and with a view to business, he determined to overthrow the government and set up one of his own. To this end, he negotiated with a cowboy named Thomas Guardia, 
who had made a reputation as commander of a small force of cavalry in a war with nicaragua to head a revolution under promise of money and position the army of the republic comprised about two hundred fifty men and they were easily overcome by guardia who assembled half that number of cowboys and rode suddenly into san jose one morning capturing the whole place by surprise it was one of the quote, revolutions before breakfast to which central america is accustomed guardia imprisoned all the government officials who did not run away and appointed himself dictator among the fugitives was the constitutional president and therefore it was necessary to hold an election for a new president guardia being made provisional president until the election could be held the english banker who had started the revolution named his father-in-law as the candidate for president and it was expected that he would be elected without opposition guardia concluded from his experience as dictator that it was not a bad thing to be president and when the election came off he ordered his officers to secure the position for him and leave the banker's father-in-law out in the cold he was unanimously elected two thousand votes were cast in a population of two hundred thousand and guardia received them all he was unable to read or write when he became president but he was a man of decided ability called wise counsellors to aid him did everything he could for the advancement of his country and altogether made an excellent ruler for the little republic the present president of costa rica is don bernardo de soto who was a favorite of guardia and is a man of good education he graduated at the college in san jose and completed his studies in europe and since his elevation to the high office he has shown ability and intelligence in the management of public affairs during their investigation of central america the youths met mr wilson of new york an old friend of dr bronson's who had just returned from a visit to honduras he readily replied to all the questions that were propounded by frank and fred and his answers may be summed up as follows i found honduras very interesting said mr wilson and was sorry that i could not remain longer the country seems to have great promise and it is exceedingly fertile and the mountain regions contain great quantities of gold and silver all tropical fruits grow there in abundance and there might be a large product of coffee and sugar at present the exports consist chiefly of cattle mahogany hides and rubber of a total value of about two millions of dollars annually and the imports are nearly as much the expenses of conducting the government are not far from one million dollars a year sometimes exceeding the revenue and sometimes falling below it honduras has been very unfortunate financially continued the gentleman as it contracted a loan in england for building a railway across the country from ocean to ocean and the greater part of the money went into private hands and not in the most honest way imaginable twenty-seven million dollars worth of bonds were negotiated in london under the guarantee of the government and all that the country has to show for this large amount of money is about sixty miles of poorly built railway since eighteen seventy two the interest on this loan has not been paid and probably it never will be in the negotiations the government and the purchasers of the bonds were deceived and the country never obtained more than a small fraction of the benefit that was promised negotiations are now going on for wiping out the debt by issuing new bonds for a part of it and creating a new loan by which the interoceanic railway can be completed and other railways constructed the president of honduras general bogran is a man of great enterprise and has done much for the country since he took possession of his office his predecessor had built a fine boulevard from the capital part way to the pacific coast but from that point there was only a mule track the same that had been there for three hundred years general bogran made a contract with some american engineers to build a wagon road from the coast to the end of this boulevard 
and another from the capital, Tegucigalpa, to Yuscaran, the center of the principal mining district. Please tell us about the mines of Honduras, said Frank, as Mr. Wilson paused for a moment. Certainly, I'll do so with great pleasure, was the reply. Honduras was the first part of the mainland of North America visited by Columbus and his companions, and as soon as Cortes had completed the conquest of Mexico and established himself firmly on its soil, he proceeded to the subjugation of Honduras. From the time of the conquest down to 1820, the mines of Honduras yielded enormously of gold and silver. The government took as its share 20% of the gross product, and whenever a district proved to be unusually rich, the king acknowledged the good fortune by decorating the place. This was a much more economical proceeding than reducing the taxes or granting a sum in money for public improvements. Perhaps you don't understand me, said Mr. Wilson, as he observed a puzzled expression on the faces of the youths. When I was at Tegucigalpa, I examined some old documents in the government library and came upon one containing the following paragraph. The flourishing state of the mining interests and the large returns they brought the crown influenced the king so that on the 17th day of July, 1768, there was given to the pueblos, villages, of San Miguel, Tegucigalpa, and Heredia the honorable title of Villas, cities. A decree of that sort is exactly like conferring a decoration on an individual, continued the gentleman. It costs nothing to the giver and makes the recipient proud of his distinction, at least that is supposed to be the purpose of a decoration. To show you how rich were the mines of Honduras, let me instance the Guayabilla mine in the Yuscaran district. It is about 50 miles east of Tegucigalpa, and near the line of Nicaragua, at an elevation of 3,250 feet above sea level. In the old days, the ore was so rich that the owners of the mine did not reduce any that yielded less than $60 per ton, and after the mine was deserted, $60,000 was obtained from it by a gentleman who now lives in the country. From 1812 to 1817, the king's fifths from this mine amounted to $400,000, so that in five years the product of the mine was $2,000,000. In 1837, the mine had been worked to a depth of 300 feet when the miners were impeded by water. Accordingly, they prepared to abandon the mine, and did so by removing the pillars for the sake of the ore they contained. Of course, the mine caved in soon after the pillars were removed, and the same was the case with other mines that were similarly maltreated. Frank asked Mr. Wilson how many productive mines there were in Honduras during the time of its occupation by the Spaniards. As to that, I cannot say exactly, was the reply, but at a rough calculation there were not fewer than fifty in the Yuscaran district that were once active and paid royalties to the king. In the Choluteca and Tegucigalpa districts there were fully 100 mines, so that we may safely count 150 in all. Under the enlightened policy of President Bogran, Americans and other foreigners have interested themselves in the mineral wealth of Honduras, and several of the mines are now being operated with modern appliances, which give promise of great results. Some of them are producing ore in such quantities as to fully justify their former reputation. Under the old system, there was no arrangement for getting rid of superfluous water and foul air. Modern pumping and ventilating machinery has been adopted, and the old annoyances that hindered operations or suspended them altogether will be of comparatively little consequence. Please tell us something about Tegucigalpa, the capital city said Frank. It received its name, said Mr. Wilson, from two Indian words signifying mountain of silver. It is about 3,000 feet above sea level and 80 miles from the seaport on the Bay of Fonseca. It has 15,000 inhabitants, its houses are of adobe, and the streets narrow and paved with stone. 
The most interesting structures are the cathedral and an old bridge over the Rio Grande, the latter consisting of several massive arches that appear to be as strong today as when first erected. In the public square there is a bronze equestrian statue of Francisco Morazon, who is honored as the liberator of Central America, as Bolivar is of South America. He was born in Honduras in 1799, was foremost in the War of Independence, became president or general-in-chief of the Republic of Central America in 1835, was exiled in 1840, and assassinated in 1842. His history is not unlike that of the majority of patriots in Spanish America, remarked Frank as Mr. Wilson paused. Frank then asked about the people and their customs. Mr. Wilson said they were not materially different from those of other Spanish-American countries. The dress of the natives is practically the same as that of the natives of Yucatan, while that of the higher classes follows in a general way the fashions of Paris. While I was at Tegucigalpa, said he, I attended a fashionable ball, which was quite a social event, as the president and his ministers were there. The gentlemen were in evening dress, as they would have been at a ball in New York, and the ladies were robed as for an evening reception in Paris or London. Upon entering the salon, each guest was presented with handsomely painted eggshells by servants who carried them about on trays. These shells were filled with gold and silver tinsel. Gentlemen broke them over the heads of ladies whom they wished to favor with their attention, and the ladies did likewise towards the gentlemen. Nearly all the ladies and some of the gentlemen carried atomizers filled with perfumery. When one found an atomizer aimed at his face, it was the proper thing to stand firm, receive the spray without wincing, and then join in the laugh which followed. The effect of the eggshells and atomizers was to make the party very sociable and agreeable and break the ice of formality. Mr. Wilson was called away at this moment, and consequently the talk about Honduras came suddenly to an end. Then the youths turned their attention to Nicaragua, and especially to the proposed ship canal which is to make use of Lake Nicaragua for a part of its route. On the subject they questioned Dr. Bronson, and received the following reply. The idea of an interoceanic canal originated soon after the Spanish conquest. In 1550, Galvo, a Portuguese navigator, presented a plan for such a canal and pointed out four possible routes, those of Darien, Panama, Nicaragua, and Tehuantepec, and it is a singular circumstance that no other routes have been discovered since his time. The world's commerce then, and for more than two hundred years afterwards, was not sufficient to justify the construction of a canal, and the first step towards such a work was taken in 1779, when Lord Nelson seized the mouth of the San Juan River in Nicaragua as a preliminary to the control of the river and lake, and the opening of a waterway across the isthmus. Very soon after Lord Nelson's action, a Spanish exploring expedition arrived at the mouth of the San Juan, and the complications arising between the English and Spanish governments prevented any active operations towards the making of the canal. In 1823, the president of Nicaragua opened negotiations with the government of the United States with that object in view, but nothing was accomplished. In 1826, the government of Mexico made a preliminary survey of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec to ascertain the possibility of a canal across it, and two years later, the government of New Granada permitted a survey of the Isthmus of Panama for the same object. In 1844, Nicaragua gave a concession to a Belgian company, which accomplished nothing and in the same year Louis-Philippe authorized a survey of the Isthmus of Panama. In 1849, an Irish adventurer published a book in England in which he declared that he had crossed and recrossed the Isthmus of Darien several times, and that there would be only three or four miles of deep cutting for the entire distance. 
On the basis of this book, some English capitalists sent an engineer who made an equally rose-colored report that resulted in the formation of an English company with the capital of $75 million. The engineer does not seem to have crossed the isthmus at all and only penetrated a few miles into the interior. The Darien route was explored by Lieutenant Strain of the United States Navy in 1854, who demonstrated that the reports of the English engineer were conspicuously inexact, and a canal would cost very much more than his estimates. In 1849, negotiations between the government of Nicaragua and our minister to that country led to the formation of an American company, of which Commodore Vanderbilt was a stockholder, with the object of making a canal by the Nicaragua route. Colonel O. W. Childs and a staff of assistants surveyed the route, but the enterprise was broken up by the filibustering expedition of Walker, the gray-eyed man of destiny, which caused the Nicaraguan government to revoke the concession. From this time onward, the interest of Americans in the canal project continued active. Several exploring expeditions were sent out by individuals and associations, Mr. Frederick M. Kelly, a wealthy New Yorker, sending out four expeditions and spending $125,000 out of his own pocket. Between 1870 and 1875, the United States government sent out nine expeditions for the survey of canal routes between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and altogether a valuable amount of information was gathered on the subject. In 1876, Lieutenant Bonaparte Weiss obtained a concession from the government of Colombia for a canal at Panama. His concession was transferred to Monsieur de Lesseps, the famous builder of the Suez Canal, and you know all about the history of the Panama Canal as it has been recorded in the daily newspapers and other publications. An impartial consideration of the various reports upon the surveys of all the routes has shown that the most favorable one for a ship canal from ocean to ocean is that across Nicaragua. This was the decision of a commission appointed by President Grant, and consisting of Commodore, since Admiral, Daniel Ammon, Chief of the Bureau of Navigation, General A. A. Humphreys, Chief of the United States Engineer Corps, and Mr. C. P. Patterson, Superintendent of the Coast Survey. Briefly, their report said, The Nicaragua route possesses, both for the construction and maintenance of a canal, greater advantages, and offers fewer difficulties from engineering, commercial, or economical points of view than any one of the other routes shown to be practicable. Careful scientific surveys have been made of the Nicaragua route. The first was in 1872 and 1873, by Commander Hatfield and Commander Lull of the United States Navy, and the second in 1880 by Civil Engineer A. G. Minical, also of the United States Navy. In 1884, the same officer, with several able assistants, made another survey. With all the figures and descriptions of the different surveys, the nature of the work to be accomplished in cutting the canal can be readily understood. For further information, Dr. Bronson referred the youths to the printed reports of Mr. Menacall and Commander Lull, which he had in his possession, and also to articles in Harper's Weekly and Harper's Magazine. Frank and Fred made a careful study of the subject, and the substance of what they learned may be set down as follows. The route of the proposed canal will be entirely through the state of Nicaragua, except for a small part of the eastern division, where it will be on the south bank of the San Juan River, which is the dividing line between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. The latter state has agreed to all the conditions named by Nicaragua in its concession to the American company that is undertaking the work, so that the question of boundary will not interfere with the enterprise. In March 1887, a contract was signed with the Republic of Nicaragua by a representative of the Nicaragua Canal Association of New York, 
securing to the association the exclusive right of way for the construction of a ship canal between the atlantic and pacific oceans the company is allowed two and a half years from the date of the contract for beginning operations it has a grant of one million acres of land and immunity from taxation and all imposts of every kind for a period of ninety-nine years it is believed that the entire work will be completed and the canal made ready for the passage of ships within six years from the commencement of the dredging and digging the length of the canal will be one hundred seventy miles from ocean to ocean of this distance there will be one hundred thirty miles of navigation on lake nicaragua and the san juan river leaving only forty miles for excavation or cutting the surface of Lake Nicaragua is 110 feet above the level of the sea, and to reach or descend from this elevation there will be four locks between each end of the lake and the ocean from which it is separated. The lake is 110 miles long by 35 wide, and it is a beautiful sheet of water in a basin 8,000 square miles in extent. The plans are for locks 650 feet long and 65 feet wide, which will float any ship now in existence. For convenience of description, we will suppose the canal to be in three divisions, eastern, middle, and western. The eastern division begins at Greytown on the Caribbean Sea at the mouth of the San Juan River and extends to the Arroyo de las Cascades a distance of nineteen and one-half miles. This division contains sixty-three per cent of the excavation required for the whole canal. It will include the digging of a channel through the low lands of the coast, and then rising ground and hills, where locks must be made to raise the canal to the level of the lake. At the end of the eastern division, a dam across the San Juan River will fill the channel of that stream to a depth sufficient for the passage of sea-going vessels, and also create a lake, or basin, where ships may pass each other, and also halt for repairs if any are needed. In some places the river must be dredged to reach the requisite depth, but these points are not numerous or difficult. The river is one thousand feet wide, so that ships will have plenty of room for moving either way, and there will be about 83 miles of river navigation from the dam to the lake. On Lake Nicaragua, the distance from the head of the San Juan River to the beginning of the western division is 56 and one-half miles, and here there is abundant depth of water except in one place where some rock blasting and dredging will be needed. Rio Lajas, on the western shore of the lake, will be the end of the middle or navigable portion of the canal, and the beginning of the western division, which extends seventeen and one quarter miles to the Pacific Ocean. On this division, ships coming from the east will descend by four locks, while those from the west will rise by the same means. The last of the locks, the one nearest the Pacific, will have a varying depth to accommodate itself to the rise and fall of the ocean tide, which is about nine feet. The entrance of this lock will be of a funnel shape, and a port will be formed by throwing out jetties on each side of the little bay of Brito and converting it into a secure harbor. At the eastern end of the canal, jetties will be thrown out in the same way to form a harbor at the mouth of the San Juan River close to the old harbor of Greytown, which has been partially filled by the sands brought down by the river and has a depth of only 21 feet at its entrance. The current of the river will be utilized for washing out the entrance of this harbor, just as that of the Mississippi was utilized by Captain Eads for deepening the passes of the great Father of Waters at its mouth. Frank and Fred made careful note of the above and then asked Dr. Bronson, how much it was expected the canal would cost, and how the profits had been calculated. The estimates of the engineers, was the reply, place the cost of the whole work at $60 million in round figures. Some of them make it 10 or 12 millions less, but as estimates nearly always fall short of the actual cost, we will suppose that the figures are $100 million. 
I think it is safe to say the canal can be built for that amount of money. How does that compare with the Suez and the Panama canals? Fred asked. The cost of the Suez Canal was $100 million, and it has been a very profitable enterprise. Double that amount of money has been expended on the Panama Canal, and only one-fourth the work is done. Even if it should ever be completed, the revenues cannot be sufficient to pay a good dividend on the cost after deducting the running expenses. The Nicaragua Canal will have a great advantage over the one at Panama, for the reason that the latter is in the region of equatorial calms, while the former is within the sweep of steady winds. Consequently, the Panama Canal will be of little use for sailing ships, and they would all be attracted to the Nicaragua route. What is the estimate of the amount of business of the Nicaragua Canal and the revenues from it? queried Frank. I can best answer that question, replied the doctor, by quoting from a writer in Harper's Magazine. He says the wheat trade between our Pacific coast and Europe requires a million tons of shipping, and as each ship must pass twice through the canal, this trade alone would be two millions of tons a year. The coasting trade between the Atlantic and Pacific ports of the United States would add another million tons, and the tea trade between Europe and China and Japan, the guano and nitrate trade of South America, the whaling trade of the Pacific, the wool trade between Australia and Europe, would altogether bring the business of the canal up to five or six millions of tons a year. At two dollars a ton, the toll that is charged by the Suez Canal, there would be a revenue of ten or twelve million dollars without considering the growth of the world's commerce from year to year. It is estimated that the running expenses and repairs to the canal would not exceed half a million dollars annually, so that there would be a good profit on the outlay of one hundred million dollars. Fred asked what saving of distances would be affected by the canal. Between the Atlantic and Pacific ports of the United States, was the reply. The saving would be 8,000 or 9,000 miles over the Cape Horn route. From New York to ports in Asia and Australasia, there would be a saving of 500 to 3,000 miles over any route except by Suez. And between Europe and Japan, sailing vessels will save 3,000 miles by taking the Nicaragua route. There can be no reasonable doubt that the world's commerce will be greatly benefited by the opening of the proposed canal, and in a few years we may see it operated to its full capacity of every year passing 11,000 ships from ocean to ocean. Fred was ready with another question, but before it was put, a friend called to tell him that a steamer for Havana and New York had just arrived at Progreso and would leave in a few hours. Nicaraguan canals and all other Central American subjects were dropped, and preparations immediately made for departure. Already their farewell calls had been made on friends and acquaintances at Merida. Baggage was quickly in readiness. They were at the station in ample time for the train, and before sunset were on the deck of the steamer, which speedily put her machinery in motion and steamed away to the eastward. And so ended the tour of the boy travelers in Mexico. The land of the Aztecs and Toltecs disappeared in darkness and distance, and when morning dawned, only sea and sky were visible from the deck of the vessel. "'Wonder what country we will see next,' said Fred. "'Quien sabe?' was the laconic reply. The End End of Chapter 34 End of The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox